President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President, uh, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as shown on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call yes. the clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Exploring Territory Rights Bill 2022 resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brockman. Here, uh, Mr Deputy President, I, I rise today to give a short contribution on this bill. Matters of conscience are always those uh, in this chamber where we do hear uh, very heartfelt contributions, and I certainly, as I have considered whether or not uh, to speak on this bill. Uh, uh, I have read the contributions from colleagues uh, right round the chambers, and there is obviously a, a depth of feeling uh, about this issue that reveals why it is a matter of conscience. Uh, and I think it's important that we do put our positions on the record in matters of conscience. Uh, to me, this very much comes down to a question of the structure of our constitution, the roles and responsibilities of various levels of government, and the way in which this parliament uh, should deal with such matters, particularly in relation to the territories. Uh, it is important when considering matters, particularly matters of life and death, that we do consider the structure of the constitution the Constitution and the responsibilities that that gives to states on the one hand and territories on another. Territories do fall into a different category in our constitutional arrangements. That is for a very particular reason. reason. Uh, and it is something that 
we in this place cannot and should not ignore. Uh, when we are considering legislation that does involve uh, life or death, states obviously have the capacity to make those decisions under our constitution, and no one in this place has, has, has tried to alter the arrangements, say, in my home state of Western Australia or, or, or in other states around Australia on issues such as euthanasia. Uh, however, with the territories, we are in a different category. Territories are smaller jurisdictions. They send different numbers of members to this place, for example. Uh, the arrangements uh, are different and are reflected differently. And the Northern Territory has considered the matter of statehood at, at a point in the past and, and rejected it. Now, there may come a point in the future where statehood is desired by either the Northern Territory or perhaps even um, the Australian Capital Territory, in which case uh, the pathway is opened to a different set of powers and responsibilities. But in that case, and, and with all due respect to my, my friends in Queensland, uh, I would also see a desire that if, if, if statehood was embraced that we would see a much more robust democratic framework. I personally am a believer in two houses of parliament, in a lower house and the checks and balances provided by this place, the Senate, but also upper houses in most of the other states. Uh, and I think in territory jurisdictions we do not see the same level of democracy operating. Now, this is not to take away anything from self-governing rights of territories uh, from uh, the Northern Territory or the ACT. However, what we have here is a piece of legislation already on the books at Commonwealth level. Uh, the, the history of the bill has been gone through uh, a number of times, and I'm not going to traverse that area again. But we now, in all good conscience, have to make a decision on whether we change those current arrangements that are in place. And in all conscience, and looking at the situation around the world and in Australia, where uh, uh, whether you want to call it euthanasia bills or voluntary assisted dying bills have been put in place, we cannot guarantee that mistakes are not made. And so as a parliament and as a chamber, we have to consider that fact in moving to change the current arrangements. That is why I will not be supporting this bill. Senator Chandler. Uh, Mr Deputy President, this bill presents a difficult and a complex mix of issues, principles and considerations. And I've weighed and deeply considered these issues and the competing principles and concerns over the last few months. I do have sympathy for the argument that citizens of our territories should have the same rights as citizens of states in regards to their parliaments being able to make laws in relation to the same issues that state parliaments are able to. I, I do have sympathy for that. However, there is no escaping the fact that under our constitution the territories are not in fact directly equivalent to the states. Self-government is granted to the territories by acts of the federal parliament and that being the case we in this parliament bear a level of responsibility for the governance of those territories. <coughs> this is a responsibility that for the vast majority of matters we effectively delegate to the elected parliaments of the territories but it is a responsibility nonetheless. The responsibility we are asked to discharge in our consideration of this bill, the Territory Rights Bill, is a heavy one. The inevitable impact of this bill before us, should it pass the parliament, is that another parliament will enact laws authorising the practice of euthanasia. I recognise that there are many divergent views on the practice of euthanasia and many legitimate concerns regarding its practice. And one of those concerns which is always forefront of my mind um, in the consideration of this issue is the possibility of the misuse of such a scheme, either by negligence, incompetence, ignorance 
or even worse, deliberate ill intent. We here in this place are in a unique and an invidious position. We are being asked to pass a law when we know that the effect will result in the ending of human lives. Yet, unlike representatives of state parliaments when making the same decision, we here have no ability whatsoever to put in place or have any oversight of the safeguards to protect citizens from the potential misuse of those laws. We would be, in effect, making a decision that will result in the ending of human lives but washing our hands of any responsibility for the consequences. And I do not find myself able to support any such action in good conscience. This is without a doubt one of the more complex and troubling decisions that I have had to make in my time in the Senate to date, and I do not take it lightly. I have considered the principles behind this bill and weighed the consequences closely, and after having done so, I am not able to vote in the affirmative. So I will be voting against this bill. Uh, Sarah, yeah, Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, and like Senator Chandler and Senator Brockman, I respect and appreciate the heavy burden that is on each of us in making this decision of conscience. This bill does present complex issues uh, because in being asked to support this bill, uh, we are being asked to differentiate between the way that the states are constituted and the territories, the Northern Territory and the ACT. This, for me, is a bill that I cannot support. I cannot support this bill uh, because it's deeply offensive to me that one of the principal objectives for this bill is to give the territories the right to pass laws which would end human life. I understand and appreciate that everyone has very deeply felt convictions in relation to this issue. Uh, for me, Deputy President, this is very personal. I lost my mum and my dad, both of whom spent a considerable period of time in palliative care at a young age. I have seen firsthand what families go through as they deal with loved ones reaching their end of life. But for me, this bill, because of its inevitable consequence, is a statement that we in Australia are prepared to kill our most vulnerable, sometimes under circumstances when it becomes too difficult, perhaps too expensive, um, perhaps too inconvenient to allow them to live. I think Senator Chandler in this debate has made a very sound point. We are being asked to pass laws, pass a law or change the current arrangements to essentially give this, the territories the right to pass euthanasia laws under circumstances where all of us in this place can't even be certain as to the safeguards that would be put in place if such laws uh, were passed. I have consistently argued against euthanasia. Uh, for me, this is just inherently wrong. It represents state-sanctioned killing. 
and it is a very poor reflection on a society which cannot look after their most vulnerable, particularly those who have a terminal illness. A number of years ago, Deputy President, I advocated very strongly for a change in the law which currently allows the vile, evil, vile, evil organisations like Exit International to send suicide kits through the mail. I find it abhorrent that Australia Post and other courier mail delivery companies, parcel delivery companies, may be unwittingly facilitating the end of someone's life by reason of allowing these kits to be mailed throughout Australia and facilitating mail going in and out of this country. So for me, I have been a consistent warrior against the notion that any state should permit the deliberate killing of a life. There's been a particular concern raised about Indigenous Australians. There's deeply, deep, deep concerns in Indigenous communities that should these laws be passed, particularly of course in the Northern Territory, uh, that these laws would be used to facilitate the end of the lives of Indigenous Australians. I think this applies across the board to all vulnerable Australians. And while there may be some who are adamant that they want to end their own life, I also believe that the, the prospects of any law, including the laws that have been passed by the states, the prospects of misuse remain high. When Victoria passed its voluntary assisted dying laws, I described that day as a very black day for Victoria. I, I hope that we are able to change the law in Victoria. I, I hope that we are able, as a society, to drive more investment in palliative care, to respect the dignity of life, to reflect the fact that even the most vulnerable deserve the dignity of life until the very end of their life. And one of the reasons that I fought so hard for Adam Cara Hospice, which proudly um, supported by our government to the tune of more than $7 million, is because I wanted to make sure that in the Geelong region there would be a place of dignity where people could go, people who had a terminal illness, who would get the greatest possible care in their darkest days. I'm only going to make a few brief remarks on this bill. Again, I reiterate my deep understanding of the complexity of this bill. I, I respect the fact that there are many who believe that the Northern Territory and the ACT should have complete autonomy when it comes to passing their own laws. But at the end of the day, the Commonwealth is, by reason of our constitutional arrangements, bears a great deal of responsibility. And for that reason, knowing that one of the principal objectives of this bill is to facilitate laws which would lead to voluntary assisted dying or euthanasia being permitted in both the ACT and the Northern Territory, I cannot in all good conscience, from the bottom of my heart, support this bill. Thank you, Deputy President. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Deputy, Deputy President. I oppose this bill because, as the previous speaker has just said, it's about euthanasia, not about states' rights. And I 
oppose the concept of euthanasia because there's nothing more important than the sanctity of life. I also want to thank my party leader, Pauline Hanson, because she's allowing a conscience vote. And that's the way we deal with things in One Nation. We embrace differences. We don't shut uh, people Senator down. Roberts, uh, I understand from the table st staff that you've already spoken on this bill. Not that I recall, but um, I'll like take their word for it. 28th of September, I understand. Are there, are there any other speakers? I note the state of the chamber. Ring the bells. I'm calling a quorum so that the members can come into the chamber. Okay, sorry. Quorum has been achieved. We are currently on the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. Uh, does any other honourable member wish to speak at the second reading? Because I'll, I'll, I intend to put the question. I put the question that the bill now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. No, have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Order. The question before the chair is that the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022 is read a second time. Those for the question for the ayes pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart. I appoint teller for the noes, Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senators, there being 41 ayes and 25 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Order. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the legislative powers of territories and for related purposes. No amendment. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? A senator has indicated they wish a committee stage. We will now move into committee. The chamber, if they so choose. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Does any honourable member, member wish to make a contribution? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, um, I, I do want to make a contribution. This is a significant um, issue, and uh, I actually wanted to start by uh, commending all senators for the conduct of um, that, or their conduct in this debate. Um, it is so important to so many people on all sides of the debate, and uh, I have not witnessed. Um, anything that could be described as anything other than uh, respectful. Um, I outlined in the second reading of this uh, debate my views on this. And, um, I, I want to also indicate that there were a couple of amendments in the process of being drafted to this bill which haven't been completed. Uh, and if we proceed to conclude the 
uh, debate on this bill today, there will be no opportunity for those amendments to be considered. Um, and so uh, I'm hopeful that if we are able to, and I'm not seeking to delay the completion of this bill beyond the end of this uh, sitting period, I would like just for us to be able to uh, enable the committee of the Senate to consider amendments once completed drafting to be considered as part of the debate on this bill. Um, and that, that is the reason why I've asked for this to come into committee. They're not ready at this stage, but we won't have another opportunity to consider these amendments. Um, no one here uh, has yet been able to contemplate what they are. I don't have my head fully around the technical nature of a couple of the things that would be contemplated by these amendments. And so I'm not seeking to detain this. I'm not seeking to uh, prevent this from progressing to its conclusion and enabling laws to be passed by this parliament. Um, that is not my intention at all. So that is the reason I, I'm seeking to uh, have a committee stage on this bill. Um, I'd also uh, like to probably just seek um, an indication from the proponent of this bill as— is it your bill, I beg your pardon— whether um, that would be an acceptable um, it being a government bill, uh, or at least the bill moved by the, um, uh, the manager of government business, uh, whether that is something that uh, would be acceptable to supporters of the bill, whether we would be able to at some point in this sitting fortnight contemplate those amendments um, when completed. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Yes, and I think uh, I missed the first bit of your question, but your question is whether you can continue the committee stage until the amendments are ready. Um, sorry. I'll clarify. Beg your pardon. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question really is, um, and, and I just outlined uh, for the chamber that the reason I've called a committee is uh, because um, there are amendments that have not yet been drafted. Uh, in this sitting fortnight, it would be great if we were able to contemplate those amendments. If we complete debate today uh, at or before we finish private senators' time, then uh, we won't be able to contemplate those. So I'm, I guess I'm just seeking the um, guidance of the uh, chair. Well, in, it, it, originally it was listed for next week, and that was what we were working towards. And I'm not seeking to derail this at all. I'm not seeking to, and in good faith, this is not an attack on anything or anyone. This is. Uh, an important issue for many, and I was seeking to give voice. I was seeking to give voice to some concerns that have been raised, and I'm not seeking to do anything other than that. And I hear many in this place talk about the importance of debate, and I don't know why Senator Steelejohn thinks this is funny. I'm being serious here, and I'm in good faith making a request of the mover of the bill. So, uh, Minister, I just put that to you and see whether um, that is acceptable. Senator Gallagher, order. Well, Senator Gallagher has. Can the I just say, um, in response to what has just happened, this is a historic moment um, for the territories. Um, this has been something that I've been fighting for for over a decade, including when I was Chief Minister of the ACT. And the Senate has just expressed its will with a vote of 41 to 25 in favour of the territories. Uh, having rights restored that were uh, taken away from them in 1997. So I want to mark this moment and I want to thank everybody uh, for the way that we've conducted this, but also for the support uh, for the rights of the territories. I think, I mean, we are in the hands of the Senate. There is a committee process. We are in committee. Um, I think it's the preference that we would be able to move through the committee stage quickly and resolve this matter uh, today if, if that was um, able to be done. Um, you know, the Senate does move quickly at times, and we have to be nimble and ready for it. So the preference would be to, to get it done, to get the final vote today. Um, I think the second reading vote indicates the overwhelming support of the Senate to deal with this bill and to reach its conclusion after a long period of time. Um, but you know, the, the committee process is there for, for senators to utilise. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, I have some questions in relation to the uh, compliance of Australia's obligations with the conventions dealing the, with the rights of people with disability. And in the context of my second reading contribution to this debate, 
I made reference to the fact that the special report or um, with respect to the convention, the UN special report has raised concern with respect to Canadian legislation and in particular the fact that medically assisted dying can be used in situations in a Canadian context. And if I can quote the, the provision so you'll understand the, the concern I'm raising. Uh, first, where a person has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, and that is defined as including a person having a serious and incurable illness, disease or disability. Now, the concern which the United Nations Special Reporter has raised is that there are material concerns with respect to the Canadian regime actually complying with the United Nations, uh, with the Convention of Rights of People with Disability. And I seek um, advice from the minister with respect to what steps the Australian government has in place to make sure uh, when the Territory does adopt legislation that Australia does comply with its treaty obligations with respect to uh, the rights of people with disabilities. Senator Gallagher. I uh, thank you, and I uh, thank Senator for the question. That's not, it's a question not related to this bill. This bill is about restoring the rights of territories to be able to debate bills that will deal with the issues that you have raised um, as they have been dealt with in the states who have passed legislation uh, to this effect. But I think in terms of questions about this bill, it's a straightforward repeal bill of the constraint that was placed on the territories uh, that didn't allow them to debate or pass bills. In terms of the controls on the territories, they are democratically elected and uh, the people will judge the territories in how they manage laws, should they proceed with laws that this uh, bill facilitates. Senator Scar. Uh, so with respect, I understand your political position and your, your legislative and your legislative argument with respect to this basis, uh, with respect to it. The, the fact of the matter is there are those uh, who have concerns with respect to the fact that this bill doesn't contain any safeguards whatsoever. It simply, as you put it, restores the rights of the territories to implement legislation. There are those of us who have a concern that that, that, that does represent a blank cheque, albeit it's got to go through the Northern Territory legislative process. So again, I seek um, your view with respect to um, what processes does the government have in place generally with respect to ensuring that legislation in this space actually complies with Australia's obligations regarding the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I'd expect that the government has some sort of mechanism in place um, in terms of ensuring that, um, that legislation be it by states or territories in fact complies with our international obligations. And that is something which is fairly and squarely with the, in the domain of this parliament under the foreign affairs power. Senator Gallagher. I would point out that the Territory uh, Parliament has um, uh, quite clear human rights legislation that are, is in place and was passed when I was a member of that parliament. Uh, but as I said, that's not a matter related to this bill. Um, the Commonwealth works with states and territories around a whole range of matters, but this bill is a simple repeal bill. Should the Territory go down any path that they choose, and I imagine um, they will, they've foreshadowed they will, um, then that's a matter for the Territory Parliament and the people that elect them. Senator Hanson. There was a request by Senator Durham to actually have amend amendments put before the Parliament. They're not drafted at the moment. One Nation has no objection to that whatsoever. In light of this bill and the implications it's going to have on the Northern Territory and the people who, for the, for the sheer fact that they live in a territory, they don't have the same rights as people who live in the states, and they are being dictated to by the federal government, I understand that it's not their fault because they tend to live in a territory, the same as the ACT. But I know that it was a vote, it was a conscience vote. I voted for the bill and my colleague, Senator Roberts, voted against it because it is a personal decision to be made, listening to the constituents and people, not just in our own state, but across the country, of how important this bill is. We must, uh, therefore, get it right. And I know it was a resounding 41 to 25. But surely, on such an important matter, is it really going to put an impost on this parliament and the people here representing all Australians to make sure that we get it right? Is it really going to cause a lot of problems to this parliament to keep it open in committee so that we can see what the amendments are, then make a final decision on that based on what we think is right? I, I 
I agree. I have no problem with keeping in committee. Let's see what amendments are drafted. Let's make sure we get it right in such an important matter like this. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, thanks, Chair. Just to put the position of the Australian Greens on the record, this is a crucial bill that has been 20 odd years in the making. We were very pleased to see the vote just now um, allowing territories to make decisions about their own issues. That is a crucial point of democracy. But we're now in a highly unusual situation where we're in a committee stage with no amendment before the chair. And it's not like we didn't know this bill was listed and it was coming on. So uh, we feel that it's highly procedurally unusual to now be asked for the stage to be talked out whilst amendments get drafted. If you're not well organised to deal with something that was scheduled on the program, I don't think you should really be getting any favours. So we are ready to vote and pass this bill. It's been 20 years in the making uh, and we'll now sit down and not make further contributions with the idea of getting it done. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, look, uh, I think as some colleagues have already indicated, originally under the hours motion that was considered by the Senate, it was scheduled for scheduled Order. for uh, completion next Friday, and that was the basis on which work was being undertaken. Unfortunately, and this is not uh, in any way to detract from the result of the vote that just occurred. It was, as Senator Hanson said, a comprehensive. Uh, um, decision made by this Senate on behalf of the communities that senators represent. I'm not seeking to take away from that. I voted one way, others voted another, and I respect that. And I'm sorry, but please don't characterise this. I heard someone say the homework's not done, uh, and we're not seeking to just talk it out. The reality is I've just asked whether uh, there was a willingness on the part of uh, the proponent of the bill to allow us time to consider this. I know it's inconvenient and I'm sorry uh, that I am now asking for that, but uh, I have um, uh, got to get this done on behalf of others that have um, sought this, uh, volunteer and community groups that have reached out in relation to these issues, and I don't think that's an unreasonable thing. So I just wanted to make sure that the Leader of the Greens understood that this is not some um, exercise to detract from the decision that is going to be made by this parliament. Uh, it's clear that the numbers mean that this will be legislated, that the territory's rights will be restored. Um, and uh, I understand it's frustrating, uh, but um, there are important considerations. While this bill, I, I accept what Senator um, Gallagher has said, this is a straightforward repeal of uh, legislation that's already in existence. But the flow-on implications for that in relation to so many other areas, and in her contribution she referenced um, the Territory's own human rights protections, which I gather are enshrined in legislation. I mean, th there will be other um, flow-on implications for those sorts of uh, protections in the community uh, in each of the Territories um, once a repeal is made. So just having the capacity to uh, consider amendments around that. Um, I think would be uh, helpful, and I'm not seeking to frustrate debate. I'm not seeking to uh, take up time uh, to um, change people's minds. Minds have been made up, and it has been uh, 20 years in the making. Um, and as uh, Senator uh, Waters said, that um, uh, these are important issues, and I just want to make sure that we do have the time to be able to get these amendments completed and uh, put before the committee. Senator Henderson. Um, look, I too rise to raise the question in relation to providing this Senate with the opportunity to bring forward these amendments. Uh, we were all expecting this bill to come on for a vote next Friday. Uh, we all obviously scrambled um, with very little notice into the chamber this morning when this came on unexpectedly. Uh, like Senator Dunham, I absolutely respect the will of this Senate. I am not seeking in any way to alter or amend or delay what is an obvious will of the Senate. But I do particularly pay tribute to Senator Hanson, um, who, whilst voting yes and supporting the repeal of, of the enacting legislation, uh, recognises that there are proper and legitimate bases for bringing forward amendments 
Um, just imagine what would transpire if this bill was passed today and sound and proper amendments that perhaps hadn't been properly considered um, were not brought before the chamber. Um, I think that would be an absolute travesty. So again, to um, Senator Gallagher and to the government, uh, this is a really genuine plea. There may well be things that all senators or some senators, irrespective of how they voted today, they might actually see some good cause to support or at least consider these amendments. I know the Senate Procedure Office is absolutely flat out at the moment as well. I sent something to the Senate Procedure Office yesterday and uh, they are literally working around the clock. I think I received back something back from uh, the office last night. So also to support the Senate Procedure Office, which is really under the pump. <laughs> Uh, I think it would be the right thing to do. I think it would be the respectful thing to do and it would also validate, assuming um, the yes, um, the, the, the will of the Senate is to support this bill, which evidently is the case now. I, I don't frankly see that changing, but it would validate the decision of the Senate if all senators are given a proper opportunity to consider any amendments. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Senator Gallagher. And, and so I don't mean to jump in front of Senator Pocock because he'll make a contribution, but just briefly to respond to uh, Senator Henderson, Senator Dunian, we're in the hands of the Senate. Like I can see what's going on here. You know, you've got to get to ten past ten. Um, you know, we we are not in a position to stop. The committee stage, um, nor would we try to s stop the committee stage. Um, I think it would be interesting, and perhaps the best use of the next 20 minutes, is, if this is going to kick over, is for the amendments that are being drafted to be foreshadowed as to what they are. Um, so, if someone could stand up and perhaps elaborate on what the amendments are to this bill, because it is a straightforward repeal bill, so I'm, I'm struggling to understand what amendments actually would relate to this bill. So, yes or no, should the bill be repealed, There's, there, it would be unusual, unless you were going to stray into trying to legislate some other kind of uh, protections or you're creating another bill because this bill just gets rid of a bill. You know, <laughs> like That's the point of it. Um, so I'm happy to hear what the amendments might be, uh, but I also acknowledge and I would like to put on the record the fact that we have two ACT senators voting for the fir first time in favour of territory rights. I think that's a very significant moment for the Territory, and I acknowledge the work uh, and commitment of Senator Pocock in that regard. Senator Henderson. Uh, uh, look, I just wanted to uh, put on the record when you said I can see what's going on here. Um, I have had no discussion with any other colleague in the Senate. There's no strategy, there's, no, there's nothing other than a genuine a genuine proposal to ask with the greatest of sincerity that I don't have any amendments to bring forward. But if any senator has amendments to bring forward, then it's right and proper that they be considered. So I just want to really strongly put on the record that there's nothing going on here. There's no plan or in fact I I actually I will say that um, Senator Pocock and I had a discussion earlier on, and he asked me whether I was happy for the vote to occur today, and I said yes. Uh, so, uh, but now that I know that there are senators in this place, and, and Senator Pocock can vouch for me on that, but now that I know that there are senators in this place that want to bring forward amendments, in, in absolute sincerity, Senator Gallagher. I just want to put on the record that I think it's the right and proper thing to do is to allow those amendments to be brought forward. Senator Pocock. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Senator Gallagher for her work on this for, for well over a decade now, the leadership that she's shown uh, at, at the Assembly and, and in this, this place. And I want to 
acknowledge and recognise that people have been working on this for a very long time. I also want to thank the, the dozens and dozens of people and groups that I have met with on all sides of this debate. I acknowledge that this uh, is something uh, that is deeply personal to many. I fully respect the, the views of uh, Senator Dunham and others when it comes to th this bill, and uh, I do not begrudge you voting the way you vote. Um, I, I would like to point out that we've known that this bill is coming for, for quite some time now, and I'm really concerned about process here that if on other bills we're able to enter Committee of the Whole and then Senators request that a vote be delayed while we draft amendments for <laughs> yeah I, I have concerns about that as to what the amendments could be as Senator Gallagher pointed out this is the simplest of bills this is about restoring territory rights <laughs> I would remind Senator Henderson that the people she represents have had the right in their, their state to debate and ultimately legislate on this. I, I would really uh, plead with the Senate. Uh, I think people have been able to put their position on record. I understand that not everyone is comfortable with this, but this is about territory rights. This is about recognising that the territories are mature enough to debate and legislate on issues as sensitive as voluntary assisted dying. I, I would really urge the Senate to, to deal with this matter. There's a huge amount of other legislation uh, before us. This is, this is incredibly important, uh, but in the scheme of things, quite a, quite a simple yes or no. Uh, Senator Dunham. Yeah, just um, to give a bit of information about the proposed amendments that are being um, drafted, uh, in, are in the process of being drafted, there are three that uh, were requested. Um, the first one relates to the scope of um, schemes enabling voluntary assisted dying in all states and territories. Um, no, and I take the interjection. From Senator Green, I understand and very clearly what Senator Gallagher has said. The bill um, is a straight-out repeal of existing legislation. But as I said before, and I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, point to make, there are consequences to any bill that is passed, and uh, this enables, as Senator Pocock has said, the territories to legislate in respect of this particular the issue that has sort of, even though it's not the subject of the bill, um, it is the uh, issue in contemplation in the territories. Uh, and I'm not seeking to prevent that from becoming law, despite having voted a, a certain way based on the principles I outlined in my speech. But to Senator Green's interjection, um, you know, yes, I know what the bill is about, but there are consequences to everything we pass. And this one, uh, the First Amendment, relates to the schemes in all states and territories, as it would be um, post the passage of this legislation, and the scope, in particular, uh, of access to voluntary assisted dying to people under the age of 18. Um, so there are, there's an amendment uh, proposed around what scope there would be for provision of v uh, VAD uh, in all states and territories relating um, to VAD being administered to children. Um, there was also a proposed amendment um, relating to um, the TGA review of the uh, medications utilised in the administration of VAD um, relating, yeah, relating to the approval process and exemptions that are granted under the regulations that um, exist in relation to this particular uh, medication, um, and that is a relatively straightforward amendment. There was also a third am amendment relating to um, the imports of the medications um, that are utilised in the administration of VAD in all states and territories. So it's just in relation to what will inevitably be consequences to the passage of this legislation. It isn't about overturning the effect of the bill. It is in relation to uh, the scope 
and some of the other technical issues that have been raised. And so, uh, I'm, uh, this is, these are issues that have been raised. It's not about de you know, trying to deviate from what has been or will be achieved by this parliament. Uh, and um, I, I think, as I've just outlined to um, the Senate, you know, they're not spurious um, nothings. They are significant issues um, that. Uh, I wanted to uh, foreshadow now, and I think um, it, it was a very fair request by Senator Gallagher, who uh, uh, sought this extra information um, around what they might be, and uh, I have put that on record. So I hope that gives some clarity about what was being proposed. They're not uh, extraneous, they're not unrelated. They do relate to the consequences of uh, the legislation and how its passage might, um, uh, in, in effect, be administered on the ground in all states and territories that will have the capacity to legislate on this issue into the future. Senator Pocock. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunham. As I said, I, I fully respect uh, your, your position on this. Given how much time uh, we have had, I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be now put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Okay. Senator Gallagher. Can I just um, explain um, why we just voted no to that procedural uh, vote? Um, that is that under the rules in the Labor Party, conscience what? votes um, cannot be guillotined or, or cut short, that we allow everybody to have their say, uh, and that's, um, that is how the conscience vote system operates. So it um, shouldn't be a reflection on my individual view that we should deal with this vote today, but it is representative of the rules and the collective um, decision making that we've taken under our party processes. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Waters. I ask that the Australian Greens' position of supporting uh, Senator Pocock's motion just then be on the record. Indeed. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Brockman. Just briefly, and in response to some of Senator Pocock's remark, and obviously as a Territorian senator, I can understand um, your very strong views on this issue. However, and I say this with all genuineness, um, I was fully expecting to speak on this bill next Thursday. I was fully expecting to speak on this bill. When I got up to speak on this bill this morning, I had no notes prepared. I had done very little thinking about it, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, thought about the gen I thought about the general issue, obviously, but in terms of this particular bill, I was fully thinking that as the government put time aside in the program next Thursday, in fact, an open-ended debate next Thursday, and I think it is important those listening to this debate understand this that next Thursday is an open-ended sitting to deal with this bill. Uh, so clearly the government, in putting its program together, and all of those in the chamber were expecting this bill to be dealt with next Thursday and not this morning. Now, you know, the, the accusation has been made that people weren't adequately prepared, um, but the fact is that up until last night I was expecting this bill to be considered, debated, if there were amendments to be proposed, that they would be proposed next Thursday. And I think that was the genuine case for many in this place. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Chair. I just wanted to uh, um, express support for the sentiments made by Senator Gallagher in relation to the attempt to close debate. Uh, whilst I too have been a very strong and public supporter of this bill, and its predecessor bills for a uh, long period of time. Uh, it is the convention in relation to these sensitive uh, conscience and free vote matters uh, that in this place uh, we do enable time for them to be fully debated. Uh, and uh, I understand fully the position expressed by Senator Gallagher and it's one shared by uh, the coalition parties. I hope to see the matter resolved as quickly as possible. I do understand the sentiment of colleagues who, uh, who have a different opinion, who had been expecting the debate uh, to occur next week, uh, and so uh, I hope and trust that uh, we will see amendments prepared as quickly as possible. Uh, I want to make it very, very clear uh, that it is the full expectation and will have my full support 
for this bill to be concluded in these sittings uh, and, that, uh, and that there is no intent to see uh, any dragging out of that. And I think in good faith Senator Dunningham has made clear that's not his intent either in terms of wanting to have these amendments dealt with. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thank you, Chair. And look, if I can just absolutely uh, make that crystal clear in case it has been um, misunderstood, uh, my intention is for however these are to be drafted, it to be completed, the drafting process, and uh, these amendments to be back for dealing with ASAP. Um, and indeed for this bill to be dealt with in finality by this chamber ASAP as well, as soon as possible next week. Um, so uh, I do not seek to frustrate or delay this for any reason other than I want to give these a shot. Um, and I uh, understand Senator Pocock's frustration with that in particular. And, uh, uh, but it was a good faith belief that I had that we would be dealing with this in an open-ended debate at the end of next week. Um, that being said, I've put all of that on record. I've outlined in brief the uh, terms of the amendments that uh, I seek to have put before this committee, and uh, I think I've made the case that they are not extraneous, they're not unrelated, they're very straightforward. Um, and uh, but look, I just wanted to express support for what has been said about getting this bill done and making sure that um, these issues are dealt with as well. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I just want to briefly uh, acknowledge and appreciate uh, Senator Gallagher's recent statement uh, and, and not trying to guillotine the debate. It's uh, a mark of respect and I thank her for that. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Yes, I um, certainly do uh, support uh, what Senator Dunham is, is seeking to, to do to, to allow some time for the uh, procedure office to be able to come back to us with the, uh, the, the requested amendments so that we can properly consider them in a, in a, in a fulsome way. And, uh, uh, in Western Australia, the uh, euthanasia laws were, were passed, uh, voluntary assisted dying laws uh, went through the Senate, and it was quite a, a marathon uh, exercise uh, that, uh, that that parliament there uh, went through to, to, be able to, uh, to be able to get to that position that they did, to, to pass the laws that, that they have. And uh, one of the things that was uh, one of the outcomes of that debate, and you know, I, I voted uh, in the, on the second reading uh, in, uh, no against uh, against this. But one of the one of the things that was uh, put in place as a result of the the debate and the consideration in detail of the legislation that went through in West Australia were, were necessary protections uh, to ensure that uh, you don't have. Uh, you know, the very worst examples that we do actually see around the world of where euthanasia uh, is used uh, in other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, that there are uh, two, for example, um, in, in I think it's in the, the Netherlands, they, they allow for uh, people to uh, seek out uh, to, to um, have euthanasia for uh, psychological uh, conditions, uh, not just physiological uh, health issues. Uh, and, and of course, I don't think uh, anyone in Australia would be would be contemplating that. But but we can't know. We're, we're making a decision here about uh, about legislation that we don't uh, about an end outcome that we don't actually fully know what what the the makeup of it would be. And and so because of the the process that the West Australian Parliament went through, they you know, very clearly laid out what the uh, what the limitations of of their bill would be. And uh, the, the you know the protections that were there in place, and so uh, some of the the amendments that uh, uh, Senator Dunham have foreshadowed would go some of the way, and I appreciate that this is just a, a repeal bill, but it would go some of the way to actually ensure that uh, that that some protections could be in place uh, to make sure that we can't we don't find ourselves in a situation where we go down the path of, of other jurisdictions. In fact, there's uh, some jurisdictions around the world that uh, allow for children to be able to uh, engage with euthanasia. And I don't think that's something that Australians would want to see contemplated, but, uh, uh, but, we, but we can't know, because we're the ones that are ultimately making a decision here about, uh, about, um, uh, about, about a law that, uh, or that have been an ultimate outcome that, 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 uh, that will be there. Uh, in, in the territories when 
uh, we, we can't be sure what they will actually be legislating and what protections they'll be putting in place. So some of the amendments that Senator Dunham was foreshadowing go to uh, go go to just ensuring that there are at least some protections. And um, and I certainly ask that the Senate consider um, that and, and allowing that time. And I don't think it would take very long uh, to just go through those um, very simple proposals uh, and uh, and maybe put in place some protections in this bill uh, to ensure that, uh, that we can't have the unintended consequences. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Nambajupa-Price. Thank you. Um, as a senator for the Northern Territory, um, it is very uh, important to understand that we have the Northern Territory as, as well as, obviously, the ACT. But the Northern Territory is a very unique place in comparison to places like the ACT. While I can respect the way in which this parliament um, is likely to vote on this particular issue, there has been very little in the way of safeguards with regard to some of our most vulnerable members of this country who reside in the Northern Territory, where I'm from. This is a matter of uh, it's not just a matter of repealing a bill to allow for territories to make decisions, but being a representative of the Northern Territory, I also recognise some of the very dire decisions that the current Territory government have made with regard to the lives of some of our most vulnerable. And I think um, my colleague, the member for Lingiari in, in, the, in the House of Reps, has also expressed some of her deep concerns with regard to some of those decisions that the current Territory uh, government have made. In the Northern Territory, uh, death is something that occurs on a regular basis. It's certainly featured heavily in my life from when I can remember as a child. So I see it as my responsibility as the Senator for the Northern Territory to do everything that I can to save lives. Um, I think it's very important not to regard my colleagues' requests in terms of taking into consideration these amendments going forward. It's not, it's not a flippant um, last-minute decision um, to try to delay uh, the decision on this um, particular bill. It is actually about considering what those safeguards might look like, particularly for vulnerable uh, Australians who are often unheard who are often disregarded because they're largely out of sight and out of mind, certainly to this place here in Canberra um, and certainly to other parts of the nation. We hear platitudes of acknowledgement and respect for vulnerable, vulnerable Aboriginal Australians all the time. We hear it constantly. But we never actually, I feel, having spent only a short time in these chambers, actually really deeply take consideration for those very vulnerable people in those communities. And that is why I am here. And I hope you can understand this, Senator Pocock, that our circumstances are very different from your territory to my territory. And I hope that my colleagues in these chambers can, can understand what I am trying to convey, and not just with this particular issue, but other issues that are going to have consequences for some of our most vulnerable people in this nation. I cannot stop the outcome of the vote on this bill, but what I can do is I can support that this chamber considers the amendments that have been foreshadowed by my colleague in order that we might have some level of safeguard going forward. Because I do recognise that in the Northern Territory we have a government who is not listening, who is allowed for the destruction of vulnerable people. And I heed calls every single day about violence, alcohol fueled violence, because they respect the rights of drinkers and perpetrators who act out violently 
as opposed to the rights of vulnerable victims in those communities who are fleeing the communities, children who are being taken out of school right now. So I do not trust that this current government can make the right decisions for some of our most vulnerable. So we need to consider these amendments so that there might Order, be some level Senator of safeguard. Senator Member Price, as the time for private senators' bills has expired, the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress. We'll now move to government business, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022, in committee. The committee is considering the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022 and amendments 1 to 5 on sheet 1679. Um, as a division was called for on these amendments after 6.30 p.m. yesterday, the vote was deferred until this morning. I will now put that division. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator McKenzie on sheet 1697, sorry, 1679, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Honourable Senators, the committee is considering the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022 and amendments 1 to 5 on sheet 1679. As a division was called for after 6.30 p.m. yesterday, the vote was deferred until this morning. I will now put that division. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Mackenzie be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those against to the left. I appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes, Senator Pratt. There being 27 ayes and 30 noes, it's resolved in the negative. Does any other honourable senator wish to make a further contribution in committee? Otherwise, I'll put the questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I did ask the Assistant Minister this question last night in committee, and I'm still yet to receive a, a clear response. And so I hope um, officials have been beavering away overnight um, to actually respond. The $18 million that is in the budget that this uh, authority will have a financial impact, what projects uh, have actually been cut to offset um, the authority? I, I note $8 million of departmental funding. Um, can I have more detail of where in the department that's come from? That's um, quite a lot of money. And the $10 million out of um, the previous agency's funding. I would uh, like to understand which area of the agency. Was it project money? Was it stationary, staples? Uh, if the minister could give me more clarity around the $18 million. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, as I said yesterday, there has been no funding cut from projects, and I'll just seek some advice around the other two.
So again, there is no projects that have been cut, and my understanding, Senator Mackenzie, is um, there is ten million that is coming from the um, faster rail agency that will um, there uh, will be transferred into High Speed Rail Authority, and the other eight million is out of um, departmental um, funds, and that is. All the information I can give you. There being no other senators wishing to contribute in the committee stage, I will put the question, which is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. The question now is that the bill be read. Oh no, apologies. I have to ask the minister to do that. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish high-speed rail authority and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two, Maritime Legislation Amendment Bill 2022, second reading debate. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting. Deputy President, the coalition takes Australia's international obligations to protecting the marine environment from pollution from ships very seriously. This bill aligns Australia's domestic legislation with Australia's international obligations that will support effective and consistent global regulations to protect the marine environment regarding pollution from ships. The International Maritime Organisation progressively improves marine environment pollution standards for ships, <clears throat> and this bill aligns Australia with recent changes to international regulations. The bill aims to do three things. Firstly, this bill introduces controls for discharges of residues of noxious liquid substances, substances like certain grades of vegetable oil or paraffin-like substances that can form surface slicks. Ships will be required to meet new cargo tank cleaning, pre-wash and discharge procedures for persistent um, surface slicks. The new regulation applies to Northern European waters uh, and came into effect on 1 January 2021, and specifically it applies to northwest European waters, the Baltic Sea, Western European waters and the Norwegian Sea. Secondly, this bill bans the use of heavy fuel oils by ships in Arctic waters from 1 July 2024. A similar ban is already in place in the Antarctic. The ban aims to reduce environmental impacts on sensitive Arctic environments caused by higher emissions of harmful air pollutants from ships burning heavy fuel oil. The heavy fuel oil ban also reduces the risk of oil spills, and we've seen the devastating impact on marine ecosystems uh, of oil spills uh, in recent decades. Thirdly, the bill extends controls on ship harmful and anti-fouling systems to include the chemical biocide cybo hang on, cybutrine. Now, I know it was a long time since I've done Year 11 chemistry, but everyone watching upstairs, children, science, and you'll be able to read speeches in the Senate uh, appropriately too one day. From January 1, 2023, this chemical is chronically toxic for marine organisms. According to the APVMA, which is our own uh, regulator of uh, pesticides and uh, chemicals, the use of Cybertrine as an anti-fouling agent for ships in Australia has never been registered or approved for use for ships in Australia. So just to be very, very sure uh, and um, clear that this toxic chemical uh, is unable to be used within our um, 
our jurisdiction here in Australia. Uh, this is our government, our federal government, are uh, responding obviously to an international regulatory change, uh, which obviously takes effect in the Northern Hemisphere. This bill brings Australian regulations into line with international standard setting body, the International Maritime Organisation, which seeks to improve marine environment pollution standards via the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. That's a very sensible and clear name of a convention, 1973, and the International Convention on the Control of Harmful Anti-Fouling Systems on Ships, 2001. While Australian ships are subject to Australian legislation wherever they are in the world, this legislation is not expected to have any significant impacts on our uh, Australian maritime industry. The Australian shipping industry has been consulted on the legislation and is supportive of the alignment in regulations with the international body. Our own Joint Standing Committee on Treaties has also considered the amendments um, to, to MARPOL relating to the cargo residues and tank washing of persistent floating products and the prohibition on the use and carriage of um, HFOs in Arctic water and to the HAFS Convention relating to the controls uh, of Cybertrine. The committee, our treaty committee supported the amendments and agreed that binding treaty action could be taken. And We are obviously uh, in the opposition as holding the deputy chair of the treaties um, committee, supportive of their advice to the Senate around this piece of legislation. The opposition will be supporting the government's bill. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Cadell. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, Australia is a shipping nation. We are surrounded by water, but we own very few ships. This uh, doesn't take into account what we're doing locally in our shipping water, but what happens up north, what happens in the Arctic, what happens in the North Sea, around a lot of important things. Coming from the Hunter, previously being employed at the port, we know how much this is. The port of Newcastle brings in 4,800 shipping movements a year. Any one of those can go wrong, as we saw in 2007 with the Pasha Bolka parked up on Nobby's Beach. And what we get in Australia is the leftover ships. What have, um, where we're working with bulk is we get things from moving up north, where we have the triple E's of Maersk, where we have the triple E's of 24,000 container ships, where we have the big ships. Australia doesn't have the content to that. So what we are doing here in working out stuff up north will eventually filter through to Australia, and that's why it's important. I also note this talk. Uh, of this government about reinstating a strategic fleet in Australia, and I think I was at the press release, uh, press conference where that was launched in the port of Newcastle in the lead up to the last election. So, what does this do? It protects the environment in case of a shipping accident. It puts a shipping uh, uh, structure in place to make sure we aren't using bad chemicals on the bottom of our ocean, on the bottom of our ships, and anti-fouling. Why is that important? Because I'll give you an example in in our harbour. In the port of Newcastle, has a mean depth of channel at 15.2 metres. Now, 15.2, that's big and deep, but a ship at uh, high tide leaving that will draw 15.1 metres. So we're talking massive ships with a draw of 10 centimetres difference between the bottom of the ship and the, and the bottom of the channel. If something was a scrape, something was there, we can grab that, we can put that in our channel, that can be bad. If we have a ship like we have another Pasha Bolka, we can see bunker oil, probably the, the dirtiest, filthiest fuel oil around. I think still used by the Russian Navy. Some say they track the Mokba by its exhaust plumes, but this thing will be, uh, these things will all be uh, outlawed under this process. The use of better systems to protect our mean environment, the use of better systems to protect our harbour environment up in the north, in the northern states, and us ratifying this treaty is so important because you know, biodiversity protection, what can come in on our ships, and this is all below waterline, but what is above waterline is just as important, and we are seeking to do all those treaties. We saw recently also in the hunt of Varroa mite expected to come in in a ship of some kind, the euthanizing, euthanizing of many hives across the hunter. Uh, still going on. They've uh, got most of the registered hives. They're going after stuff now. So anything we can do to clean up shipping, anything we can do to protect our environment, anything we can do to protect our animals is a good thing. This bill and everything go going through uh, doesn't apply to shipping in Australia 
as it stands, but it will one day. And that is why it is a good thing to support. That is why I'm also proud to be speaking on this uh, to support it. And while we're talking about environment, while we're talking about sea levels, while we're talking about that, you know, we don't want workers. Workers shouldn't be subject to these chemicals and these things, the anti-fouling that can cause such bad things. We see what happens with PFAS on Australia and on land around the world, and these are a slight derivation of those chemicals, and we shouldn't have people down slushing hulls working on that. So this is a step in our international maritime obligations that will benefit Australia in the long term, if not now. It is something that will protect our environment. We're talking about the Arctic. If we lose a bunker oil ship in the Arctic, what that will do to that region is terrible. Bunker oil is just doesn't get clean. We've seen penguins getting clean. We see seabirds getting clean. Every that it is the most horrible thing. In the world. I can't imagine an engine that can run on that stuff. So that is a very, very good thing to do. So, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, as the Shadow Minister said, we'll be supporting the bill, and I look forward to other regulations that support our maritime industry in this place. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and. I rise to make some remarks about this maritime legislation amendment. Uh, I don't profess to have the knowledge of uh, Senator Cadell, of course, who uh, has spent a lot of time in the Hunter and Newcastle region, which of course is a, a great uh, shipping uh, part of uh, New South Wales. But certainly um, I understand the importance of that commercial contribution to our state and of course the country. And I think one of the great attractions we have as a successful jurisdiction is that we are a country that does maintain high standards, uh, that we are a, a serious country when it comes to the, the rule of law, and we do try and make our international obligations come to life through the enactment of domestic legislation and regulations. And in relation to this particular measure, uh, that is what it's doing. It's basically putting into domestic law some of the commitments that our country has made uh, through international, international fora. Uh, so, particularly in my home state of New South Wales, the shipping industry is a very significant employer. And so we do want to make sure that we are keeping pace with our international obligations across the board. Uh, because uh, unless we do that, uh, we are risking our capacity to attract foreign investment in particular. And I believe it's true in all the environmental matters of policy that moving as fast as we can is an important principle because foreign investors will be looking for the cleanest and the greenest opportunities in which to invest. And whether that is in relation to our standards for domestic environmental purposes, um, or whether that is the pace in which we enact various pieces of corporate law which are designed to give investors a complete picture of the environmental footprint. I think that is an important objective for this parliament. And in relation to the, the disclosure uh, of emissions, scope one, two and three emissions, uh, which is the subject of a significant consultation uh, through international uh, accounting bodies and the like, and I, uh, you know, obviously uh, pay homage to my former profession of the uh, accountants, who are some of the most exciting people uh, you'll ever have an opportunity to meet. Uh, they are working on these these standards, and uh, the standards I think should be taken very seriously by our policymakers, because I believe that the countries that move fastest on emissions disclosure are more likely to be able to capture new investment uh, as the global pool of capital looks for honesty in a particular company's emissions profile. Now, we shouldn't be doing these things in a reckless way, but we should be looking to do it in a, in a pace which is ambitious. And I think, regrettably, in the past we have not been an early mover on enacting our international environmental obligations. And um, I accept that this is not directly relevant to this bill, 
but I think it is an important point of reference to make in relation to keeping pace with international obligations. So I look forward to seeing this bill being enacted, and I believe that uh, it will be supported by the opposition. We look forward to voting for the bill uh, when we have the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to start um, by thanking all the senators for their contributions and their expression of support um, for this bill. The Australian government is committed to best practice maritime environmental protection and the Maritime Legislation Amendment Bill will bring Australia's maritime legislation in line with the latest globally agreed amendments to international maritime conventions that Australia is party to. The bill will further strengthen our marine environment protections by introducing provisions to control the discharge of noxious liquid substance, substances known as persistent floaters in certain European waters that came into force on 1 January 2021, extend the current ban on the use of heavy fuel oil by ships in the Antarctic to encompass Arctic waters from 1 July 2024, and ban the use of ship anti-fouling systems containing the toxic chemical biocide citrobutrine from 1 January 2023. By legislating these environmental con controls, Australia will uphold our long-standing international reputation for prom promoting safe and clean shipping operations. And we will be ensuring that international standards to reduce ship pollution and protect the marine environment are being implemented consistently across the globe. The Albanese government remains committed to ensuring Australia's maritime regulatory framework remains up to date and fit for purpose to support, a, to support a healthy ocean, protect coastal communities and promote sustainable trade. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? Um, so I'll put the question is, is that the bill be now read a second time? Those of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against, say no. No, the ayes have it. Right, I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the protection of the sea and for related purposes. And no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? No, if not, I'll call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to protection of the sea and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 3, Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, um, on behalf of the Coalition, I'm pleased to rise to uh, state the Coalition's position relating to the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill. Um, and of course, I'm pleased to say at the outset that the Coalition will be supporting this bill. Uh, the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill is a bill that amends the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Act 2016 to support the Commonwealth's effective recovery of the costs associated with regulating Australia's medical cannabis industry, including the costs of administration, monitoring and assessment of compliance, and to provide greater flexibility for regulations to prescribe the charges imposed on licence holders under the Narcotics Drugs Act 1967. The Narcotics Act was amended in 2021, when the Coalition was in government, to simplify the medicinal cannabis licensing framework by implementing a single licence structure uh, to replace the original and existent three licence structure that existed under the Act. The bill revises the existing licence fees and charges to better align them with the new licence framework that was introduced. 
An independent review of the Narcotic Drugs Act 1967 was commissioned by the Coalition and underta uh, undertaken rather by Professor John Macmillan AO in the year 2019, which was known as the Macmillan Review. That review resulted in 26 recommendations to amend and improve the medicinal cannabis licensing and permits framework in Australia. The Coalition in government agreed in principle to adopt all 26 recommendations of the Macmillan Review. This included recommendations to introduce a single licence model for medicinal cannabis regulation, replacing the previous three licence model to simplify the related permits regime. Amendments under the Coalition Government to the Narcotic Drugs Legislation regime commenced on 24 December, Christmas Eve of the year 2021, to implement recommendations from the Macmillan Review. As a result of the introduction of the simplified licence structure, uh, changes to the fees and charges framework are now necessary to align it with this new structure. As I've already stated, uh, the Coalition supports this bill. These changes were flagged by the Macmillan Review, which stated that the simplified licence structure meant the scale of fees and charges would need to be tailored to the range of activities encompassed by a particular application and licence. The activities relating to the administration of medicinal cannabis regulatory schemes are funded through cost recovery arrangements, which are consistent with the Australian government's charging framework. It is important to have a consistent policy when it comes to safeguards around medicines and the role of regulation. Uh, we do know that in the past there have been votes in this place where safeguards uh, were proposed to be removed. They are worrying signs and it is something we need to guard against. The PBS is vital to our country and uh, deferrals of listings are something that we should seek to avoid. A healthy functioning economy, of course, paves the way to list more medicines, as we know, on the PBS. Um, we've already obviously seen the ending of free rapid antigen tests for concession card holders and, of course, the delayed backflip on the cutting of pandemic leave disaster payments. Um, the impacts on the removal of services through telehealth consultations and similar um, issues relating to cost of living pressures is um, something that uh, we need to be vigilant of. Uh, obviously, though, as uh, the opposition will remain vigilant on um, these issues and ensuring that uh, provisions of these services are um, continued and available for Australians, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Narcotics Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill on behalf of the Greens and indicate at the outset we don't oppose it. Um, the bill makes some relatively minor changes, largely creating a regulation-making power to allow for matters that will be the subject of multiple separate charges for licensing. Um, um, that, that the intent of the bill is to provide greater flexibility for licensing charges for medicinal cannabis um, and, and ultimately the hope is to enable a simpler method for working out the amount of charges prescribed in the industry. Um, this of course applies to medicinal cannabis and the licensing and permit schemes that exist under this Narcotics, uh, Dr Narcotic Drugs Act. Um, we acknowledge the evidence, the, 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 the comprehensive evidence, that medicinal cannabis can be absolutely life-saving. And I know I've spoken to family after family in my state, in New South Wales, uh, who have had their loved ones' lives turned around by the effect of medicinal cannabis. Um, in some cases, they've broken down in tears and described to me how their child had been having convulsive seizures that no traditional medicine could treat. But then um, medicinal cannabis has actually ended those seizures, seizures and, and turned their child's life around. And, and, and the, the hope and the extraordinary benefits that can be achieved in cases like that um, are genuinely inspiring. And so we wanted to make sure when we reviewed this bill that it did no harm to that industry and allowed for medicinal cannabis um, 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 to, to continue to be available. Of course, 
we all know that the cost of medicinal cannabis in this country is far too high. And in fact, in many cases, families that um, would benefit from prescription cannabis because of the extremely high costs of, of, of obtaining cannabis and, and often the delay in the paperwork in obtaining cannabis in the legal market are actually accessing cannabis um, in the, in the, from the, from the non-legal market. And they're doing that because that's the only way they can afford the medicine to help their loved ones, help their kids, help their families. That should not be the case. Um, we had a promise from the government we had a promise from the government that this change in the regulation making power will not see any net increase in the licensing charges for medicinal cannabis. Uh, we will, of course, be keeping an eye on how those changes happen and ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, let's be clear. Medicinal cannabis can have extraordinary positive impacts. And as we know, it's most commonly prescribed for pain and has an extraordinary positive impact for many people who are consuming it. And again, I just want to say from my from the experience I've had speaking with very close friends um, um, who have had otherwise untreatable pain. And, and, and that untreatable pain can happen through injury, it can happen through um, illnesses such as cancer. And um, I have spoken to um, a number of people, some quite close friends, who whose only way of addressing that um, incredible, um, untreatable, otherwise untreatable pain has been to access medicinal cannabis. And it has provided essential relief at a time when all other medication had failed. And we cannot make it harder to get medicinal cannabis. Um, uh, I do note that one of the reasons why I'm, I'm aware of the excessive cost of medicinal cannabis is it is repeatedly communicated to my office through the Sniffoff Facebook page that we run. Um, of course, Sniffoff's primary purpose is to identify where uh, police searches are happening using drug dogs in our public streets, which of course is an affront to civil liberties, but it's, it creates a community where people feel free to talk about the, the impacts of our failing war on drugs. And one of the issues that's repeatedly raised is just the sheer bloody cost of medicinal cannabis, which is making people go and obtain the same product um, from, the, from the black market. And we have to make sure that this licensing arrangement doesn't make it even harder to get medicinal cannabis. According to the Victorian government, the cost of getting access to medicinal cannabis in that state can vary between $50 <coughs> to $1,000 per patient per week. Um, of course, that depends upon the nature of the condition being treated, tr treated and the particular product required, as, as well as the dose. But it, it, it's hard to imagine how any ordinary family could afford $1,000 a week, or even a couple of hundred dollars a week, or, or should be forced to pay anything like that for medication that can be essential to their well-being. The only way of treating their pain, the only way of treating their kids' seizures, it's just plain wrong. And of course. Um, the Greens are on record of saying medicinal cannabis, for that reason, should be put onto the PBS. Uh, if, if a doctor prescribes it, if it can be life-saving or the only available treatment, and, and um, of course it should be covered by the PBS, and we shouldn't see families having to pay that kind of cost for access to medicinal cannabis. And of course, the, the cost of the medicinal cannabis comes on top of going to your local GP, sometimes repeatedly often not bulk billed, to get the prescriptions for medicinal cannabis as well. Um, we do know that cannabis can provide extraordinary benefits. We also know that our current approach to cannabis, uh, of making it an illegal drug, is creating all of these distortions in the market. And um, the answer to those problems doesn't lie in this bill. The answer to those problems lies in actually legalising cannabis for recreational and medicinal purposes in this, in this country. That's the answer. And we need to do that sooner rather than later. And the good news is that this place will have a chance to vote on that next year um, when we bring forward a proposal to finally legalise cannabis um, in this country. I do want to um, uh, foreshadow that um, on behalf of the Greens we have circulated 
a second reading, um, an amendment to the to the second reading, um, which would which would add um, a notation by, on behalf of the Senate that in 2020 the Community Affairs Reference Committee, as part of its inquiry into the current barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia, concluded that the significant costs associated with ac accessing medicinal cannabis legally are causing a large number of Australians to purchase or grow illicit cannabis for, for self-medication. And I pause there to say, well, to, to respect the work of that committee and, and, and that committee's work after hearing the evidence, um, acknowledged and accepted the evidence that we hear repeatedly about the high costs of medicinal cannabis. The second reading amendment would also provide that the committee recommended that the government encourage a review of state and territory criminal legislation in relation to amnesties for the possession and or cultivation of cannabis for genuine personal medicinal use, and b, calls on the government to work with state and territory governments to develop a nationwide amnesty from criminal prosecution for people who have a legitimate medicinal cannabis prescription and a home-growing cannabis for their personal use. And I, can, I commend those second read amendments to the House. And just to be clear, they don't take it as far as the Greens think we should go, which is to fully legalise cannabis. Let's have that debate next year. Let's do it thoroughly. Let's do it properly with all the evidence in front of us. But what these second read amendments say is this. If you need to access medicinal cannabis for your health, you've got a prescription for it, but you can't afford it, and therefore you're forced to get cannabis on the black market, that you should not face criminal prosecution for that. You should not face criminal prosecution for getting the drug your doctor says you need in the only way you can afford it. And that's why we press those second reading amendments. Um, but I otherwise indicate, Acting Deputy President, we're not opposing the bill, and primarily for the reason the government has given us that assurance that there will be no net increase. And I'd like to hear that um, 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 confirmed by, um, by the government in their response confirmed on the record there will be no net increase in those licensing fees for medicinal cannabis. Thank you. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make some brief remarks about the Narcotics uh, Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill. Um, um, as a member of this chamber, I have not sought to uh, engage too widely on these matters uh, because uh, largely I have seen them as matters that have been uh, the preserve of the state. So I note Senator Shoebridge uh, has, has a proposal here which is based on advice from the Senate um, and we we'll look forward to engaging in that process next year. Uh, but certainly uh, it's not been something that I have sought to focus on in the limited time I've had in the Senate. But uh, what I would say is that uh, I believe the intention of the former Health Minister Greg Hunt was to make it easier for people to get access to medicinal cannabis, uh, to lower the regulatory burden uh, and to reduce costs and complexity so that that access is there for people. Uh, and I, I note that these are sensitive issues, but I think there is a strong body of medical evidence that there are cases where the only relief that is available to people for extreme pain uh, is going to be medicinal cannabis. So we would have a major, I think we do have a problem, uh, if people cannot get access to that particular drug when they are needing it. And so the, the object of this bill is to build on the changes that were commissioned by the former coalition government to ensure that uh, licence fees and charges are better aligned with the new uh, licensing framework uh, of course, we accepted all the recommendations of the Macmillan Review uh, into these matters, and I think this is another uh, down payment on that front. But of course, the, the guiding principle here is that we want people to get access to medicinal cannabis. That is the key point. Uh, we don't want people to be pushed uh, into the black markets. We want people to be able to access it uh, through and above the counter type approach uh, as much as possible. So that will be the test for this bill. Uh, we'll be supporting it and uh, the proof will be in the eating and no doubt we'll, we will have further opportunities to debate these matters. But I again note my understanding, which could be flawed, I mean we do make mistakes from time to time, uh, is that uh, most of these matters uh, in relation to 
the regulation of uh, these particular arrangements is largely in the preserve of the states. So, uh, but I thank the Senate for the opportunity to make some brief remarks this morning. Thank you. I think we'll go to Senator McCarthy. Oh. Not you. <laughs> Thank you, right. Madam Acting Deputy President. I think I was waiting for you to speak, but there you go. Um, okay. The bill. Okay, can I firstly thank senators for their contribution uh, to this bill? Uh, the bill amends the Narcotic Drugs Licences Charges Act to clarify that the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Regulation may prescribe matters that will be the subject of multiple separate charges, which may be incurred by a licence holder during a particular charging period, and to enable a simpler method for working out the amount of charge prescribed. The amendments in the bill are intended to provide sufficient flexibility for the regulations to appropriately prescribe charges supporting the effective recovery of the costs associated with administering the Narcotic Drugs Act. I thank members for their contributions to debate on this bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Shibich. I just draw the chair's attention to the state of the house. Yeah. Call for a quorum. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I believe that we're core eight. Thank you, Senators. Yeah. So we're now going to move to the um, second reading amendment, which was moved by Senator Shoebridge. So the question is order. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
And I'll just advise senators that I believe Senator Roberts is also going to move a second reading amendment. Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge to the Narcotic Drugs Licence Change Charges Amendment Bill of 2022 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order, there being 13 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I believe Senator Roberts has also signalled he wishes to move a second reading amendment, which has been circulated. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I move my motion. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. I'm going to put that again. People need to pay attention. I've just put a vote to which I only got one response. I'll put it again. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you.
order, lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 17 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Does any, committee, does any senator require a committee stage? Okay, can I do that? So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. I call the minister. Oh. So, sorry. so the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Are those with that opinion say aye? aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. To call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Act 2016 and for related purposes. Minister. Okay. I thank senators for their contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. I move the third reading speech. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Act 2016 and for related purposes. Thank you. Um, are there any notices to be given for another day? I believe we have some notices to be given for another day. No? Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to Senator White. Thank you. Yes, sorry, it's me. Pursuant to notice given on the 23rd of November 2022 on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 for three sitting days after today, proposing the dis disallowance of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Rules Amendment Instrument 2021 No. 2 and business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 for six sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment Attorney General's Portfolio Measures No. 1, Regulations 2022. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator White. Um, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? 
Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, President. I present the seventh report of the 2022 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the report be adopted. Uh, uh, you can move an amendment, Senator Askew. So, uh, I um, would like to move the amendment that's been circulated in my name in regard, regard to the Selection of Bills Committee report. Thank you, uh, Senator Askew. I believe it's been amended. Uh, yes, we do. Um, I believe that the amendment—Senator Hanson Young. Sorry, what was this? Uh, Senator Gallagher has, a, has, has an amendment as well. Uh, in addition, I thought you yes. withdrew. Okay. Which amendment is before the chair? Uh, we're just trying to. I understand that both amendments deal with the same bill. So. The opposition want to refer it to Sorry, Senator Hanson Young. I have not seen the government's amendment. So. Well, okay. It has been circulated. We'll make sure that you get a copy of that, Sarah, that's Senator Hanson Young. Yeah, so we're dealing with the. That's right. So perhaps if I can just speak to yeah. our amendment, which is a, to the same bill as Senator Askew's, um, but our amendment is that it not be referred to a committee. So it differs from Senator Askew's in that she's re, um, referring it to a committee with a report by the 1st of March. Thank That's you. That's the difference between the amendments. Yeah. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, on that basis, I'll indicate that the Greens will be supporting uh, Senator Askew's uh, amendment. Uh, we believe that this yep. uh, bill does require a short uh, inquiry. Okay. And you were seeking leave. Let's note. So the question is that the um, amendment is moved by. Probably completely out of order, but I'm just asking if uh, by leave. Thank you. If um, we can move our amendment as well, um, yeah. Well, they are contradictory, uh, Senator Gallagher. So, yeah. I mean, if I'd got the call, I would have moved but ours first. We lost. We would have supported yours. That's the only thing. If yours gets put first, we would oppose yours um, and not be able to put ours. So it just looks at you know, a little bit odd. That's all, because if ours goes down, we would support yours. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. So I think, with the indulgence of the chamber, we're going to put the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher first, or the motion that I'll invite her to move, um, which should have now been circulated once again to everybody. Um, so I'll give you the call, Senator Gallagher, to move that motion. And thank you. And I do um, thank the indulgence of the chamber that I move the amendment that's been circulated in my name. And Senator Hanson Young, you've seen that amendment now. Yes, and we won't be supporting it. Okay, thank you. So the question is that the um, amendment, as moved by Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against. I uh, believe the ayes have it. Okay, I'm calling it for the noes. Sorry, the noes have it. Uh, division required? No. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the amendment as uh, moved by Senator Askew, which has been circulated. Um, so the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So I'm now going to move the amended selection of bills committee report. So the question is that the selection of bills committee report as amended by the Askew amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I move that today uh, government business orders of the day as shown on today's order of business be considered from 12.15. That government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1.30 p.m. And general business notice of motion number 93 be considered during general business. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? 
I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Um, President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notice number one postponed to the 30th of November. Um, business of the Senate notice of motion number two postponed to the 28th of November. And committees have lodged extensions as shown at item eight of today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and um, we'll move to government business one to three and ask that that be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that being taken as? Senator Gallagher. Oh, Senator Gallagher, sorry. I was going to say you're doing my job. Yes. Um, thank you. I ask that government business notice of motions number one to three, proposing references to the parliamentary standing committee on public works, be taken together and as formal. Is there any objection to that proposal? There being none, I call Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motions and table statements relating to the works. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 91, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 91, proposing the introduction of a bill relating to banning dirty donations, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this uh, being taken <coughs> as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Uh, so the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Senator Waters. I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Waters. Thank you. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thanks, Senator Waters. Um, we will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 92, standing in the name of Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 92 uh, relating to the Gabba Stadium project compliance with order for production of documents be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Ormond Payne. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Ormond Payne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That our opposition to that motion recorded? Yes, certainly, Senator Gallagher. We'll, we'll just record the government's opposition. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 92, standing in the name of Senator Patterson. I beg your pardon, 94. Senator Patterson. I ask that general business notice of motion 94 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patterson. I move the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Patterson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 95, standing in the way standing in the name of Senator Brockman. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Brockman, I ask that general business notice of motion number 95 be taken as a formal motion. Thank you, Senator Askew. Is there any objection to this being taken as for uh, this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 95, standing in the way, standing in the name of Senator Brockman, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Aye. Uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
must be happy last time. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 95, standing in the name of Senator Brockman and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, I understand there are no that ends general business. I understand there are no committee memberships and no uh, messages from the House. But I'm giving the call to Senator Askew. Thank you Senator very Askew. much. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Babette for the 24th to the 25th of November for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Uh, government business order of the day number four: Treasury Laws Amendment, Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Yeah, I'm asking senators to leave uh, the chamber quietly. Uh, I'm not sure who the next speaker is. I believe it is Senator Smith. Thanks. Thank you very much, President. <laughs> We've uh, returned to the electric vehicles discount bill, and I've just a few more paragraphs of my contribution to add. 
just uh, in conclusion, in government, the Coalition's future fuels and vehicles strategy was part of our plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The Coalition provided a detailed strategy for a technology-led approach to reducing transport emissions that was based on the principles of partnering with the private sector to support uptake and stimulate co-investment in future fuels and focusing on reducing barriers to the rollout of future fuel technologies, not taxes, and expanding consumer choice by enabling informed choices and minimising costs of integration into the grid. Again in government, the coalition committed $2.1 billion to help increase the uptake of low and zero emissions vehicle technologies. With increasing pressure on inflation, ensuring there is a demonstrable benefit to government expenditure is even more important now than before. But this is not what this bill does. As the Coalition Senators have pointed out in the Senate Economics Committee report, most Australians will be unable to benefit from this tax policy change, which is extremely narrow in its application. It will mean that people working in small businesses are less likely to access the proposed tax policy change due to the lower level of usage of salary packaging in small and medium businesses. For these reasons, the opposition will not support the government's bill. And I will move a second reading amendment, which has already been circulated in my name, which outlines the points that I have made today, uh, but also in my previous contribution. Thank you. So I'll take it that you've moved that second reading amendment. Senator Smith, thank you. Senator Rice. President, I'm very pleased to rise today to speak to this um, electric vehicle, um, electric car discount, Treasury Laws Amendment Bill. Um, electric vehicles are an absolutely critical part of decarbonising our economy, decarbonising our society, moving Australia to 100 per cent renewable energy, moving Australia to a zero carbon future. And that's what we need to be doing as urgently as possible, because we are in a climate crisis. We know we're in a climate crisis. We have got the floods around us at the moment. We had the Black Summer fires three years ago. We have around the world you know, two-thirds of Pakistan, which was underwater. This is an emergency. We've just had the State of the Climate report released this week that showed what is in front of us unless we urgently tackle our carbon pollution. And Australia is in the box seat to be able to do that. We have the technology, we have the resources, we have the renewable energy resources. We can shift our energy needs to 100 per cent renewable as quickly as possible, probably more quickly than any other country in the world. And yet we have been such laggards over the last eight years. We now have a new government that is taking some small steps forward. And us as Greens, we know that we need to go much faster, we need to go much further on tackling the climate crisis than this government is, but we will support every small step forward along the way. And that's what this bill is. It's one of those small steps forward. Because Electric vehicles are an incredibly important part of decarbonising our transport system. And we are really pleased to say that we have pushed the government further and faster on electric vehicles in our negotiations on this bill. One in every five tonnes of our carbon pollution in Australia comes from transport—20 per cent. We need to be getting out of dirty, polluting fossil fuel vehicles and into 100 per cent renewable vehicles as quickly as possible. We also need, of course, to be investing in public transport, which also, I mean, most of the public the trams and the trains around the country, most of them already run on electricity, at least within suburban areas. And so if they are being fuelled by, by renewable energy, we have got a zero carbon public transport system. We also need to be investing in walking and cycling, which is a critical part of our transport mix. And in fact, if you look at what our vision for transport is in the future, a rule of thumb that I like to use is that around about a one-third, one-third, one-third mix of our transport, so that you've got one, continuing to have one-third of private vehicle use to account for all of those trips where you really do need that private vehicle to get you from A to B. And if all of those private vehicle trips and all of those road trips and, and the freight trips as well um, and are 
fuelled by renewable energy, well then you've got zero carbon in that part of the sector. Then you have about a one third on public transport, whether that's within cities or connecting people between cities, like we were talking about yesterday in high speed rail. And then you've got about a one third of those trips should be walking and cycling, which are the ultimate zero carbon trips when you just sort of get out there. And then for cycling, whether it's on your um, on on the bike that is, is human powered, which I am a great advocate for, commuter cyclists to get me around everywhere, or whether they are electric bikes which then mean that the benefits of cycling are available to a wider range of people, people for a greater number and a greater length of trips. So that one third, one third, one third, which means that let's focus on how do we rapidly shift our vehicles away from dirty polluting vehicles through to clean electric vehicles. So this bill is going to take some small steps. It's going to be tackling the fact that at the moment, if you are a fleet, owner that it is very expensive to be converting your fleet to electric vehicles. So this is going to actually make it easier and give tax discounts to allow those um, to make it more affordable for fleets to be electric vehicles. And we are really pleased in what we have been able to do with this bill in negotiations with the government of actually saying that we want to be shifting those fleets to electric vehicles. Originally, this bill also included plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which are fake electric vehicles, because we know those plug-in hybrids actually aren't electric vehicles. They are not renewable, and about half of the use of those plug-in hybrid, hybrid vehicles is still running on dirty fossil fuels. So what we have negotiated with the government and understand is that there's going to be an amendment that both the Greens and Senator David Pocock have, have both put forward and, and our negotiations with the government means that those plug-in hybrids will be phased out. There's going to be a sunset clause so that they will only be um, included under these tax discounts for three years. And we think that's a, a reasonable compromise because we know at the moment, yes, there is a shortage of electric vehicles in the country. Because we've been such laggards, the electric vehicle manufacturers haven't wanted to bring their electric vehicles to Australia. And so there is an issue of increasing the availability of electric vehicles. So, OK, we'll allow plug-in hybrids for the next three years, but phase them out, because within the next three years there should be no need for anybody to have plug-in hybrids. Basically, within the next three years, people should be being encouraged, being supported if they're needing to buy a vehicle for it to be an electric vehicle. And we know that other countries in the world, um, in, in Europe, they've got phase-out dates of you know, 2030 for all new cars to be electric vehicles. So actually phasing out um, subsidies and support for plug-in hybrids in three years' time is a pretty reasonable, pretty modest thing to be able to do. Um, and the other, the other key thing that we have um, negotiated with the government with this bill is that a commitment that all of the Commonwealth fleet procurement will be 100 per cent electric, which is pretty amazing and pretty significant, and that there will only be in exceptional circumstances if you've got sort of fleet requirements where currently there isn't an infrastructure there isn't the recharging infrastructure available, that there would be a, exceptional circumstances where those vehicles within the Commonwealth fleet would be um, able to be um, plug-in hybrids. But basically the default, the default is that the Commonwealth procurement and the Commonwealth fleet will become electric as quickly as possible. Not only is that good for all of the transport that the Commonwealth vehicles are doing, that means that they can shift, we can shift all of those kilometres to being 100 per cent renewable you know, as soon as those electric vehicles are in the fleet. But it means that because they will be in the fleet, it's going to be really important for having a greater availability of second-hand electric vehicles into the market, because we know as cars move out of fleets, they've still got a lot of life left in them and are then more affordable for people to then purchase as second-hand vehicles. So this is going to make a really critical difference to be making electric vehicles more affordable for everybody across the country when you've got a good stream of second-hand electric vehicles um, coming onto the market, rather than at the moment most of the second-hand electric vehicles that people uh, are purchasing are actually being imported. Um, so we, yeah, having that steady stream of electric vehicles here um, from the Commonwealth fleet is going to be incredibly significant. So, 
And the other thing about, of course, of excluding the plug-in hybrids um, from the Commonwealth fleet is it's actually going to save the Commonwealth a lot of money because continuing to subsidise the use of plug-in hybrids means that you're continuing to subsidise actually having to fuel them um, with petrol and diesel. So it's going to save the Department of Finance a lot of money. In fact, the estimate is that the amendments that are going to be moved by myself and Senator Pocock will save the government up to $935 million over the decade. So that's almost a billion dollars compared with what the government were first proposing. It means we won't be permanently baking in yet another fossil fuel subsidy on, the, 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 on, on top of the fossil fuel subsidies that we are already seeing continue on, $40 billion and counting on the pile of handouts to the coal and gas and the oil sector. And when, we, when it comes to that and talking about transport, Moving on the, on the diesel fuel rebate is an absolute, such an easy thing to do. At the moment, we are subsidising the use of diesel fuel, which is just crazy. At the same time as we're saying we need to be doing something about the climate crisis, we are still giving massive handouts to subsidise the use of polluting diesel fuel. Imagine if instead of spending those billion dollars in subsidising diesel fuel, that we were having more incentives to encourage the heavy vehicle, the freight um, industry to be shifted shifting their fleet to 100 per cent renewable vehicles, to electric and hydrogen vehicles. And those, you know, the heavy movers, the trucks, the trains that are currently running on diesel in Australia, there are plenty of examples elsewhere in the world and, in fact, beginning here in Australia, where we see those electric heavy movers, where we see hydrogen run trains. So it is possible. It just needs the political will and the incentives rather than incentivising the pollution, incentivising the things that are absolutely turbocharging the climate crisis, that we incentivise the solutions and that we actually are supporting the rapid transition to 100 per cent um, clean energy. And, or you might want to spend that $935 million on charging infrastructure, for example, in the regions, so that it is really easy for people to be able to charge their electric vehicles no matter where, where they are. And we know with charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, it's going to be straightforward, it's going to be viable, it's going to be you know, economic for the private sector to be putting charging infrastructure in the cities. But it's going to be out there in the regions that there's going to be, need to be more government support. And so that's where you know, there is a need for more investment in charging infrastructure and government investment in charging infrastructure in the regions. As I said at the beginning, this is a small step forward that the Greens are happy to support, but it's not a revolutionary one. It's an improvement on the status quo. And it's going to actually benefit, in addition to, um, to the Commonwealth and government fleets, it's going to benefit a very narrow class of employees by creating incentives for companies to buy electric vehicles and, and through our negotiation it creates those incentives for the Commonwealth fleet too. So these measures will increase the supply of affordable second-hand EVs in the market, but for your average person who hasn't got a vehicle through a fleet, they're not doing salary sacrifice. You know, they work for a small business, or they, you know, the, there's no connection between who they work for and the vehicle they drive. We need a whole range of other things to be making electric vehicles more affordable. And the big piece of the puzzle, which is yet to come, which we urge the government to be taking urgent action on, is implementing vehicle emission standards so that we, but frankly, are not able to sell in this country vehicles that are polluting, that are going to continue to fuel the climate crisis. We need to have those vehicle emission standards and CO2 standards and ramping them up over time so that within a pretty short space of time all vehicles have to be 100 per cent non-polluting, zero carbon. So this is what urgently needs to happen, and actually introducing those vehicle emission standards is critical and urgent. It was a policy that the Greens have been championing over the years, and that um, we uh, are going to continue to be bringing that into the parliament. That is what's going to drive the supply of electric vehicles here in Australia, and without it, we know, you know manufacturers are just sending their electric vehicles off elsewhere. There's, they're not seeing anything to support the rapid uptake of electric vehicles here. It's a difficult market, and so in a time of constrained supply, they just say, no, nope, we'll send them off elsewhere where they know that the, the market is stronger. So 
we have got a message to the government that we will support this bill, but, when, but we want to see a really thorough electric vehicle strategy that takes a serious action that is needed, that does not include fake electric vehicles, the plug-in hybrids as part of it, and that really takes seriously the role of transport and transforming our transport and our, our vehicle fleet to renewable um, 100 per cent clean vehicles is going to, is going to take, because that is what is needed. That is what the Greens are going to continue to push for, and we, ne we know that that is where we need to head up, head up as quickly as possible to tackle the role that our transport system is playing in the climate crisis and the role that it can play in effectively tackling our cli the climate crisis. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022. Everyone remember during the 2019 election, uh, federal, uh, federal Labor's attempt to end the weekend. Well, they've uh, only been in office for a, for a little while, and, uh, and here they are at it. And I'm going to explain to you why, because no one so far has given any explanation as to how we're going to solve this issue. Now, Western Australia is known for its wonderful outdoor lifestyle. Whether it's during school holidays or over the long weekend, many West Australians, including myself, hitch up a caravan or a camper trailer and head out to the great outdoors. There's no better way to see and experience Western Australia than on a road trip. Whether that be into the state's beautiful southwest or up the coast to somewhere like Exmouth, both trips that I've uh, undertaken in the last uh, year or so uh, with a caravan in tow. And earlier, this year, earlier this year, the RAC published an article, Can an electric uh, car tow a caravan or boat? So naturally, I took an interest in this. Uh, could this article point to the future of a family weekend travel? The article outlined the virtues and merits of electric vehicles and the advantages and disadvantages of towing with an EV. However, the two lines stood out to me, and it goes, on, goes to the core of the discussion that we're having here today. One quote from the article said, in principle, an EV is well suited to towing, albeit with limitations, and says of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, they may be better suited to occasional towing rather than long-distance adventures themselves. It is one thing for any city members here in this place to preach that everyone should be driving EVs. Now That makes a lot of sense if all you're doing is taking a short drive or possibly just driving a passenger vehicle to somewhere like Byron Bay for the long weekend to visit the beach house. But if, all the, if that's all the driving you do, then yes, it would seem everyone else should be doing that too. But it disregards the everyday practicalities of working families whose only annual luxury might be lugging a camper trailer up the highway for a couple of days away. Now, an EV might be capable of towing a boat to the Coburn boat ramp 15 kilometres away, but what about towing that boat from Perth down to Busselton, more than 200 kilometres away? EV technology, more specifically the capacity of EV batteries and the speed of charging, is simply impractical for anything other than city driving. It's another example of ideology blinding people's sensibility and reason. There was much publicity in California around its ban on the sale of petrol vehicles by the year 2035. Its own clean vehicle in incentive program offers rebates of much of, of $7,000 towards the cost of zero emission vehicles, although cars costing more than $45,000 uh, do not qualify. Ironically, a mere week after the announcement, the California Independent System Operator uh, put out a statewide alert to conserve energy, including a request <laughs> to avoid charging electric vehicles in order to prevent strain on the state's power grid. And here in Australia, we have a government that's wanting to put more stress on an energy grid which is not currently equipped to deal with it. I can, I can only imagine the surge in energy consumption if every Australian was forced to drive an EV and they arrived home at between 5 and 6 p.m. and all plugged in at the same time, at, that, at a time of day when solar power generation is waning, which, incidentally, is why the government needs to be careful when considering subsidies and incentives for home charging. The average consumer does not actually need a fast charger. I know this. I actually own an EV, people, so I'm not against EVs. 
but we, they, the average consumer does not actually need a fast charger. A 10-amp charger will recharge an average EV from 50 to 80 per cent overnight with no problem. Just because you can fast charge, it doesn't mean that you should. It makes no sense for everyone to plug in and charge quickly, when, uh, which would put more demand on the grid, when the vehicle can be plugged in and charged overnight. So we must be careful when we're thinking about the infrastructure that we would be putting in place. For those of us uh, who are camping enthusiasts, and I'm, as I've said, I'm one, the, the gross combined mass of a vehicle is one of the most important specifications that you look for in a tow vehicle. This measurement refers to the maximum weight that a vehicle can tow safely. Uh, staying within your vehicle's towing capacity is particularly important when you're using an electric vehicle. The more energy an EV expends, the sooner it must be recharged. Now, it's the basic law of physics. Knowing your vehicle's towing capacity and range is even more critical when driving in remote areas or heading to a trip to the West Australian Northwest, where towns are few and far between and charging stations become more challenging. What was once a 10-minute exercise to fuel up and grab a coffee at a roadhouse could now turn into an exercise of hours. Some on the other side may well say, well, only 10 per cent of Australians might pick, uh, hook up the a caravan or a heavy load on the weekend. And my response to that is if Labor wants to penalise that 10 per cent and add further pressures to everyday cost of living for simply having the temerity to own to owning a camper trailer, then they need to be upfront with them. I read with interest the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries uh, submission to the inquiry into this bill. Uh, in the study that the FC AI commissioned, it found that if a 100 per cent battery electric mandate were to be put in place by 2030, an entry-level car would go up by $12,500, and Australian drivers after a, after a mid-sized SUV would need to increase their budget by $10,000. Now to some science and facts. You don't need to like these facts, but they are restrained by the laws of physics. There is no development of the laws of physics. They are what they are, and we can try to master them, but you can't defy them. So what disturbs me in the EV and broader climate change debate is that there is a real significant lack of scientific literacy and realistic projections. The current generation of lithium-ion phosphate batteries have a gravimetric energy density of approximately 150 watt-hours per kilogram. Now, diesel and petrol have a gravimetric energy density of 12,700 watt-hours per kilogram, nearly 85 times the weight. Now, granted, EVs use their stored energy more efficiently than an internal combustion engine. You think of the wasted heat that radiates from an internal combustion car. An EV converts about 90 per cent of the energy that's stored in the battery into motion, whereas an ICE vehicle only converts about 20 per cent of that energy into motion and the rest is wasted as heat and through other mechanical losses. But the issue here is the weight and mass of the battery. In order to get the payload capability in an EV equivalent to an ICE vehicle, you need a battery that weighs about 60 times the weight of the fuel that would otherwise be stored in the vehicle's fuel tank. So why is this important? A small to medium battery EV, practically it makes perfect sense. For people that are just commuting around the city, it makes sense. A Tesla, a Model 3 Tesla, has a 60 kilowatt hour battery. This battery weighs 460 kilos. Now, an EVs, EVs uh, bigger than this really start to become impractical and arguably economically irrational. Take, for example, the F-150 Lightning dual cab, which you can currently only buy in the USA. Now, this big American truck it is super impressive. I'd love to drive one. I reckon it'd be really exciting. But the, the big problem is, is that the battery weighs 817 kilos. Now, even with this enormous battery, enormous battery, the standard range F-150 Lightning is only equivalent to 18 litres of fuel. This means that the range is severely limited, especially if you load it up, let alone hook up a trailer, a boat or caravan to it. And now, anyone that has ever towed anything marginally heavy, you'll know that, uh, that, that as soon as you hook it up, your range is more than halved. 
Case studies in the US have demonstrated that the real-world range capability of an F-150 Lightning, when loaded up, is about 100 kilometres. Imagine driving from Perth to Exmouth. You would have to pull over 13 times on the trip for three hours, and that is assuming that you've got a fast charger at the, at the, at the, uh, at the roadhouse. It's just simply not going to be possible. So to get the range capability of a diesel-powered vehicle, you would need a battery nearly four times the size of the one that is currently in the F-150 Lightning. Now this is completely unworkable. It would be ridiculously expensive, would weigh too much, and it simply wouldn't even fit within the form factor of the vehicle itself. Okay? Imagine the extra wear and tear on the road, the safety implications if you had an accident, the extra wear and tear on the tyres and brakes not to mention the insane amount of raw materials that would be required to make these batteries. Now, as I said, a small to medium electric vehicle makes sense. They don't have to carry a big payload, and for the most part, if they're used in and around town, to, their batteries can be topped up overnight. But four-wheel drive SUVs and ute EVs don't make a lot of sense, unless, of course, you don't intend to go on big distances to use their payload capacity. Now, some may say, well, battery and charging technology will improve. Well, I'm disappointed to have to tell you. I've been looking into this. There is nothing, even on the periphery of battery science development, that promises to increase the energy density of a factor that makes them a practical replacement for a larger vehicle. This is why, for now, a hybrid actually makes sense. Let's face it, most owners of dual cabs and four-wheel drives are not loading them up or towing big distances for 365 days of the year. So having a small battery, which will cover the short commutes and recharge daily, backed up by a small internal combustion engine for those occasional longer drives uh, loaded up, makes sense over the short to medium term. Why is this an issue? Well, the latest figures from the Australian Chamber of Automotive Industries show that the biggest selling vehicles are dual cabs and four-wheel drives. These are the vehicles that Australians want, and someone actually needs to be upfront with them if they're expecting Australians to change their buying habits. Now, I note the amendment that uh, is being proposed by others to sunset the plug-in hybrids inclusion in this FBT exemption bill. While the coalition doesn't support the bill, because we don't believe in just providing subsidies to, to the wealthy to enable them to just buy electric vehicles, why you know, poorer people or, or people who are on lower incomes in, in, in particularly the outer suburbs and, and in regional areas won't be able to afford it. Uh, the, the coalition doesn't support this bill. I have to say that this amendment is actually sending the wrong message. I mean, if the purpose of this bill is to actually increase the uptake of EVs and to get uh, uh, high emissions vehicles off the road, then by, by ensuring that electric vehicle, uh, hybrids are off the road, that they're not going to be part of this, is actually sending the wrong message because it doesn't actually deal with the reality, particularly the uniquely Australian reality. The most popular vehicle sold in Europe is, is I can't remember the name of the car, but it's the size of a, a basically a Corolla. Okay? It's a small vehicle. In here in Australia, the most popular vehicle is a Hilux. The second most popular is a Ranger. And then you've got a RAV4 in the, in the mix there, and then you've got down, further down the list you've got the D-MAX. So the, the four of the top ten selling vehicles by a long way are four-wheel drives and dual-cab utes. So you're sending the wrong message to people. A subsidy, and make, make, make no mistake about it, because that's what this is for electric cars, for owners of which then fail to contribute to road maintenance by avoiding taxes. Uh, is emblematic of this modern Labor Party. This is a policy that would achieve no environmental benefit. It gives a tax break to the, to the wealthy. It hurts everyday Australians, and it's widely impractical. In short, it checks all the boxes of the ALB policy handbook. Consideration needs to be given to— there's no doubt that Australians will adopt EVs. We've bought one. Our household's bought one because for my wife, commuting to work makes perfect sense. No longer have to visit a petrol station with that car. She plugs it in every night and it's absolutely fantastic. I had a, I've been driving it and it's, it's an excellent vehicle. It just drives better than any other vehicle I've ever driven. It's great. But the reality is 
for many Australians that, who like to recreate, who like to get out and about in the, out in the regions, towing their caravans, towing their boats. These vehicles might have the capacity to tow. I mean, the F-150 can tow four tonne, or possibly even four and a half tonne. But if you can only tow it for 100 kilometres, it doesn't suit the Australian lifestyle. It doesn't suit the Australian landscape. And we've got to think more seriously about this. And we can't just have policies driven by inner city MPs, inner city elites, who don't think about it. I had someone recently say to me, well, maybe they just need to change what type of vehicle they need to buy. Well, we'll be up front with the Australian people that that's what you're expecting them to do. Don't just create these policies that are going to impose on them without actually being up front. Chris Bowen, uh, the, the, Mr Bowen, the member for McMahon, I think it is, uh, he, he went over to America, took a photo in front of an F-150 Lightning at a, at a Ford dealership, and he said, oh, they're going to ruin, uh, they said we're going to ruin the weekend, but this car can tow big loads. Well, guess what? It can only tow 100 kilometres. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This, uh, I rise to speak on the uh, electric car discount bill, and I'd like to sort of start with a, a framing of, of where we're at. We're, we're facing uh, a climate crisis. You turn on the news, we're seeing the results of that every day, and it's, it's not going to get better. Clearly, Australia has to lift its game when it comes to the transition away from fossil fuels to a clean energy future. Australians are also faced with a cost of living crisis where households across the country are having to make really tough decisions when it comes to their weekly budgets of what they spend money on. Electrification is a huge opportunity, not only for Australia, but at a household level for households to save money. If you look at rooftop solar in Australia, we now have some of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, rooftop solar in the world. Australian households are benefiting from that. They continue to install uh, solar and reap the benefits of lower power bills. That policy started under the Howard government and has had bipartisan support in uh, developing uh, the certification systems, bringing down the, the price of, of installation and putting into practice uh, the work and uh, amazing innovation of some of our very best scientists here in Australia to improve the efficiency of, of solar uh, PV cells. Clearly Australians want electric vehicles. You look at the demand from them far outstrips supply, and it's no, it's no surprise that Australians uh, want electric vehicles. Uh, according to the Australian Automobile Association, households now spend uh, on average more than $100 per week on fuel. That's, that's more than $5,000 a year, every year. And the recent uh, uh, restoration of the full fuel excise charge will ensure that prices remain high for petrol and diesel. That money that Australians spend on fuel it doesn't stay in Australia. Most of the tens of billions of dollars spent on fuel flow back to oil producing countries. It's, it's not only bad for the uh, economy, it's bad for our energy security. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute has reported that our fuel stockpile has been as low as 20 days in recent years, well below the 90-day requirement set by the International Energy Agency. And it's, it's no wonder that Chris Barry, former Chief of the Defence Force, recently said that climate change is the greatest threat to our national security. And yet we continue to power our cars on dirty imported, import, imported fuel from insecure supply chains rather than from clean Australian wind and sunshine. Sunshine that can be captured on your roof at home and put into your electric vehicle. The rest of the developed world 
uh, has seen the writing on the wall and have been shifting to electric vehicles at pace. In Europe, EV sales make up 17 per cent of the market now. Countries like Norway are as high as 86 per cent. Uh, even in the fuel-hungry United States, electric vehicle sales now make up more than 6 per cent of the market. In, here in Australia, electric vehicles uh, make up 2 per cent of the market, uh, at least uh, for the figures we have for last year. Slow adoption of EVs is costing Australians money. Uh, it's costing Australians money every time that they go to the, the, the fuel pump and is causing damage to our climate. We have to look at the, the transition to EVs uh, in the context of climate change. This is something that we have to rapidly uh, speed up. The bulk of um, the 18.6 per cent of Australia's total, total emissions that are due to transport come from light vehicles. Our cars are highly polluting. The, the average Australian car is 45 per cent more emissions intensive than the European equivalent. And if we're to reach net zero by 2050, we clearly have to do better. And we have to move fast. Research by the Grattan Institute shows that to get to net zero, EVs need to make up 100 per cent of light vehicle sales by 2035 at the latest. Australians are ready to make the change. Earlier this month, an NRMA, NRMA survey shows that 57 per cent of respondents would consider purchasing an EV. But as we all know, one significant issue is that there is a shortfall in supply. In the ACT, the wait on uh, Hyundai Kona is now 12 months. Uh, and manufacturers like Hyundai don't want to send greater numbers of affordable electric vehicles to Australia because it's currently not an attractive market. Uh, why is that? Uh, because we continue to see scaremongering and, and still have poor policy settings uh, that make us a dumping ground for a whole range of uh, inefficient uh, clunkers that we see on the road. Uh, leadership and action is needed to move us from the back of the queue when it comes to electric vehicles up to the front of the queue. And by far the biggest issue uh, to, that we need to deal with to change that is to have fuel efficiency standards. Australia is one of only two OECD countries that do not have fuel efficiency standards. The other country is Russia. Uh, in 2014, the Climate Change Authority under the Abbott government recommended in introducing fuel efficiency standards. And modelling shows that the standard would have had a net benefit to the economy of $13.9 billion had that recommendation been implemented by policymakers. We need, to, we need to act now. We have an opportunity to act to start realising this benefit. Uh, it's great to see uh, Minister Bowen and, and the government commit to fuel efficiency standards uh, to drive the change that we need. We need independent, robust and ambitious, ambitious fuel efficiency standards. Uh, we need them to ensure um, that these standards have integrity. Uh, they need to be mandatory uh, to ensure it applies fairly across different manufacturers. And it must be based on real-world driving patterns. Recent research of SUVs in Sydney shows that actual emissions are up to 65 per cent higher than claimed by manufacturers. And indeed, we've seen uh, in the news over recent history uh, uh, vehicle manufacturers being, being caught out for fudging uh, the numbers. Uh, thirdly, the same standard should be implemented for all passenger vehicles without exception. And finally, it should be based on and monitored by independent and publicly accessible data. I'll continue to work to encourage the government to move swiftly to bring on these fuel efficiency standards that have integrity uh, alongside a world-class fuel efficiency standard. The government needs to move quickly to improve EV charging infrastructure across the country. In our cities, many people are renting or in apartment buildings without charging. 
infrastructure in regional and remote Australian range anxiety acts as a barrier to uptake uh, of electric vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. It being 12.15, the time for debate has expired, uh, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number eight, Atomic Energy Amendment, Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022, second reading debate. Senator Nampajimpa Price. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, sorry. Um, uh, Senator Macdonald, in continuance. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, I won't be too long. I was just in continuance from uh, the debate last night, and uh, I would just like to conclude my remarks. So, the coalition supports the development of other industries in the Kakadu, including Jabiru, to supplement the loss of investment caused by the closeout of Ranger and ensuring opportunities for sustainable, tangible economic growth and development in our regions is paramount for our nation's future, as is creating opportunities for Indigenous communities. So, to conclude, the coalition supports the continued rehabilitation of the Ranger site and supports the progress of this bill to ensure that Energy Resources Australia is able to continue their rehabilitation operations and monitoring. To secure future rehabilitation of the Ranger site, it is imperative that this bill pass to allow relevant stakeholders to commence negotiations on the next stages of the overall process. And as referenced by CEO Brad Welsh, ERA therefore urges the, com the committee to consider this bill as a matter of urgency and well in advance of 23 November 2022, so that the bill can preferably be passed by Parliament this calendar year. This will allow ERA and the traditional owners to move forward with their agreement negotiations with the Commonwealth and enable ERA to plan with certainty the world-class rehabilitation of the RPA. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you very much, Senator Macdonald. I'll just advise that I have not been given a speaker's list at this point, and I did see Senator Nabjimpa Price uh, jump earlier, and so I'll go to you, Senator. Thank you, um, Acting President. Um, I, I rise to uh, support the Atomic Energy uh, Amendment, Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022, uh, as it demonstrates that, um, of course, through the coalition, we are certainly responsible and dedicated in balancing economic and environmental management. Uh, I commend this bill to the Senate, knowing that the coalition began the process of engaging with ERA over the rehabilitation of the Ranger Mine under the previous government. Um, I personally have also, uh, in a former um, professional capacity, have worked closely with uh, the Mirar people the traditional owners uh, and their work uh, in terms of their connection with the, the Ranger Mine. The Atomic Energy Amendment um, Bill 2022 supports all mine rehabilitation being completed to high standards. The current framework allows for ERA to undertake remediation work until January 2026. So, um, back in 1999, an agreement was reached between the Commonwealth Government and ERA that upon the completion of mining activities at the Ranger Mine site in the Northern Territory, ERA would take charge of, and re of the rehabilitation of the Ranger Mine site. Mining at Ranger ceased in January 2021, and remediation is, of course, already under underway, and rightly so. More than 20 years ago, it was believed that ERA would only be able to, uh, would only need five years to be able to complete the rehabilitation work on the site. So this bill extends the legislative framework surrounding the rehabilitation, ensuring that ERA can complete um, this very important work uh, and close out the site. To con and continue monitoring and return the land, of course, to the Mira people, the traditional owners. This bill's primary purpose is to enable the long-term remediation and monitoring of the site. Australia has some of the most stringent 
environmental and rehabilitative standards and processes in the world, despite, of course, what um, many environmentalists would argue, um, and, they su and, and supports, of course, ERA fulfilling their obligations to properly remediate the ranger, side, ranger mine site. The Ranger uranium mine has served the country well over its years of operation, creating economic benefits for the country and local community, and providing jobs and employment services to the local population and, of course, uh, within the Northern Territory itself. Traditional owners, the Northern Land Council and other Northern Territory bodies are supportive of this bill and have expressed their support for ERA fulfilling their obligations set out under the Atomic Energy Act to rehabilitate the Ranger Mine site. The coalition began the process of engaging with ERA over the rehabilitation of Ranger Mine under the previous government and supports this bill proceeding in order to guarantee Ranger can be fully rehabilitated by ERA over the coming years. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak to the Atomic Energy Amendment on the Mine Re Mining Re Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022. Ranger Mine sits east of Darwin, uh, smack bang in the middle of Kakadu National Park, a world heritage site for its exceptional nat uh, natural and cultural values. Kakadu has been home to First Nations people for over 50,000 years, and it is full of beautiful rock art, sacred sites, tidal flats, floodplains, and provides a home for a wide range of rare species of animals and plants. It is a precious place unlike any other in the world. Despite this, in 1980, mining operations by the Energy Resource Australia, or ERA as it's commonly referred to, began at Ranger after the uranium deposit was discovered in 1969. Ranger Mine ceased operations in January 2021, and in, that, in just over 40 years, the mine has produced more than 130,000 tonnes of naturally radioactive triuranium uh, octocide, which is known as yellow cake, to be exported. This mine was established against the wishes of the traditional owners. In such a cultural and ecological significant area, ERA were allowed to come in, bring their big machines and dig up dangerous and radioactive materials. In doing so, they changed the landscape and the cultural heritage of this place. What's done is done. But it's important to highlight what we are considering today is the result of colonialism and corporate interests being considered more important than First Nations culture. ERA did not obtain consent from the traditional owners in any sense of the word, let alone in, in the context of free prior and informed consent, which is paramount in respecting the sovereignty of traditional owners and their cultural heritage. This place must pass the Australian Greens Bill to legislate our obligations under the United Nations Declaration on the rights of Indigenous people, which includes the principles of free prior and informed consent. It's frankly embarrassing for the, that this government and previous governments have made zero effort to legislate these commitments. But I think we all know why. And if this government is actually serious about giving First Nations people a voice, like it's claiming to, it has to walk the walk and it has to support our bill. The principles of my colleague's bill are intrinsically linked to what we are considering here in this chamber today. We all know that uranium is radioactive. We have all seen the impacts that exposure to radiation can have. We've seen the de devastating impacts of the nuclear bombs dropped in Japan during World War II and the disasters of Chernobyl and Fukushima. And we've anxiously heard the, threats from, the recent threats from Russia. Whilst Australia has strict regulations around the use of Australian uranium to ensure it's not used in nuclear weapons, and legislation at both federal and state and territory levels prohibit the use of nuclear energy at varying degrees, the fact that we are still mining and still exporting uranium sends a very different message. In fact, it's hypocritical. We do not want it in our country, but we are happy to supply it to other countries. Clearly, our concerns can be ignored if there's a nice paycheck attached to the end of that. 
Now, you might tell yourself that's all fine because we've learnt from the catastrophes and we have appropriate safeguards in place to protect workers and people in the surrounding areas, right? In 2004, the supervising scientists at Ranger found ERA had breached their environmental requirements in an incident where water was contaminated with uranium, leading to 28 workers actually falling ill. In 2013, a 1,400 cubic metre tank of uranium oxide, slurry and acid actually collapsed. And in June this year, low-level radioactive waste was found in an excavator at Winili some 275 kilometres away from the mine, after being transported through, through Kakadu National Park. This was considered a significant breach of the environmental plan due to, due to the risk to both the people and also to the environment. And this was just in Ranger. There are two other uranium mines in Australia, at Olympic Dam and Four Mile, both being in South Australia. And I don't even want to get started on the nuclear waste dump in Kimber, which has seen significant opposition from the uh, locals and also the traditional owners. Indeed, traditional owners are biting uranium mining all over this country. In Western Australia, the Upuli, Upuli people are facing the threat of mining of uranium at Mulga Rock, which will be WA's first uranium mine. The company involved in this mining proposal Deep Yellow have connections with both Rio Tinto at the time of the Jukun Caves uh, explosion and Paladin, who are, have a very concerning past. In fact, they include spills from uranium mines into nearby lakes, workers dying and getting sick, and striking over pay and work conditions. And just yesterday morning, we heard the British Prime Minister announce that. Australian nuclear test veterans and scientists involved in the British nuclear testings at Maralinga, Emu Field and the Montebello Islands will receive a newly introduced service medal to mark 70 years since the first nuclear test across the Commonwealth. These tests devastated First Nations communities in, in the area, and most of whom were displaced by these tests. This is the legacy of nuclear and uranium mining that has been left behind destruction, death and displacement. People working in uranium mines have a higher rate of lung cancer and other respiratory diseases such as tuberculosis, emphysema due to the dust that they may in inhale, as well as radioactive inert gas, radon, which is all released when the, when the ore is actually mined and crushed. Through the mining of uranium, not only are we damaging the environment, eroding cultural heritage at the same time, we are putting health, the health of workers and the health of inhabitants in the area at risk. Now, in particular at Mulga Rock, there are concerns that I have heard from the traditional owners that this dust will fall onto the plants that kangaroos and other animals eat, and that are eaten, in fact, by the traditional owners in that area. Now, if this wasn't bad enough, some of the shareholders from ERA we're pushing for the company to reopen more uranium mines, and particularly the one at Ranger. This again is against the wishes of traditional owners who are opposed to Ranger mine way back then, 40 years ago, and they're opposed to any further mining right now. One of these shareholders was quoted saying, it is in the best interest of all shareholders to give the Mirror and the Northern Territory Land Council about 10 per cent of ERA and give them a seat on the board. What is truly in the best interest of the Mirror is an ERA respecting their opposition to the destruction of their land and simply go off into the sunset. Cultural heritage is not something that you can put a price tag on. The sheer arrogance of whitefellas telling First Nations people what is best for us will never cease to amaze me. And I've been very pleased to see these proposals shut down. And of course, the Greens want Ranger to be rehabilitated, and we acknowledge that the unique legislative frame, framework that Ranger sits under has some of the best rehabilitation standards in the country. They are arguably better than the EPBC Act, although this does more than, than show how inadequate our current Environmental Act is, rather than show how good those standards are. We acknowledge that the unique legislative framework currently allows ERA access to the site until 2026, 
and that these changes are necessary to allow them more time to the land to complete rehabilitation beyond that time. This bill was referred to the Economics Committee, and I want to acknowledge the work of the acting uh, Deputy President today as her role as a chair. And a hearing was held in November, which I participated on, where we heard from various stakeholders, most notably ERA and the Gunja, uh, Gunjapmi Aboriginal Corporation, who represent the traditional owners. I, along with others, were pleased to hear about the level of involvement of traditional owners in the rehabilitation, including consultation for this bill, committee memberships relating to the rehabilitation, but also extending to the procurement of contracts and ensuring the rehabilitation will support the post-closure land use requirements, allowing traditional owners to reconnect to their country. A connection that has been disrupted because of this mine. It is paramount that traditional owners are deeply involved at every process of the rehabilitation of our own land, because we know the land. We know where things should be, trees, water holes, grasses. We hold this knowledge and it is passed down from our ancestors. It is our land after all. This land will need to be managed for a long time due to the potential radiation risks. This management will likely continue long after the companies have left because these communities are the ones that will remain. It is these families who have lived there throughout the lifespan of the mine and will continue to be there long after. These are the people who need to be deeply entrenched in the rehabilitation process and are, should be benefiting from it also economically. There have been issues raised about the cost of the rehabilitation, which is more than double of what was originally estimated. Rehabilitation costs are currently sitting between $1.6 and $2.2 billion. This price tag could make Ranger the biggest rehabilitation exercise in the history of Australian mining. Ranger not being rehabilitated is in fact not an option. We cannot afford to have this mine abandoned or for ERA to pass this debt onto the government after profiting from this mine for 40 years. The rehabilitation of a mine is equally, if not more important, than mining itself, and it must be treated as such. It is, should be a, the first part of an approval process of all mining licences in this country. Rio Tinto owns 86 per cent of ERA. Rio Tinto's annual profit in 2021 was $53.538 billion. So the price tag for $2.2 billion of rehabilitation is just a drop in the ocean for them. They have stated that they are committed to funding the rehabilitation of Ranger should ERA fail to do so, although we heard at the inquiry into this bill that there is no binding agreement between ERA and Rio Tinto that will require Rio to step in should that need arise. The Greens support this bill, which will ultimately give the MIRA their land back, but we hold some serious concerns about the funding of this rehabilitation. And I look forward to working with the government to ensure that companies are held responsible to clean up the mess they created. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll start by thanking uh, senators for their contribution and for their support of the Atomic Energy Amendment Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022. And contain, which contains important amendments to the Atomic Energy Act 1953. These amendments put in place a number of measures important for securing the rehabilitation and eventual closure of the range of uranium mine in the Northern Territory. This is a goal shared by government, the mine operator and the traditional owners. Amendment, amendments will ensure energy resources of Australia ERA Ranger's long-standing operator remains authorised to conduct approved re rehabilitation and monitoring activities at Ranger for as long as, as it is needed and for ERA to demonstrate it has achieved the high standards in, of the environmental rehabilitation that is long applied to the site. I am glad that the bill enjoys bipartisan support and, and was recommended by the Economics Legislation Committee to pass. I know all those in the chamber recognise Ranger's rehabilitation as a priority and look forward to seeing Ranger become a world-class example of mine rehabilitation. 
In concluding, I wish to thank the RA, the Northern Land Council and the MIRA people for their close engagement on this bill, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Atomic Energy Act 1953 and for related purposes. Uh, no amendments have been circulated, uh, and I don't believe that any senator requires a committee stage as I look around the chamber. Uh, so I'll call the minister to move the third reading. The minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Atomic Energy Act 1953 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 9, Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Budget Measures Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Our veterans are important. Their service was important, and parliamentarians in both houses in this place and on both sides recognise the contribution they have made. That is why this bill is important, and that is why the opposition will be supporting this bill. This bill provides an increase to the totally and permanently incapacitated payment that is given to our veterans by $38.46, um, which will increase it to $1,595.66 per fortnight. That provides an annual increase of around $1,000, which is not much in the scheme of things and not much when you consider the service our veterans have provided. The bill achieves this by amending the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 to increase the rate of pension payable to um, TPI veterans. It will bring the payment comparable to the national minimum wage and make it only just greater than the after-tax payment of the minimum wage that an earner would receive. As we know, the TPI is a payment that is provided to veterans for life, unless their circumstances are deemed to have changed. It is not taxable and it is not included in a means test for other income support payments. It is formally called the disability compensation payment at the special rate and is offered when a veteran's injuries from war or service are assessed under the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act as preventing them from having a normal work life. And it is the least we can afford these people who have put their hand up to serve our nation, to serve in the defence of our nation and our way of life. And uh, it is paid for those who have been injured through that service, and as I said, it's the least we could do. When you consider, you know, thousand dollars a year, given the current cost of living increases and the pressures that people are facing, the rises in grocery bills, rent, mortgages, and as we've all seen, the increasing power prices, and the absolute disbandment of the new government to deliver on their $275 uh, decrease to those power bills. They've run away from that you know, as fast as Usain Bolt, really. As soon as they got into government, they disbanded that, that promise and walked away from it. So this $1,000 increase to the TPI payments will barely touch the sides. Hopefully, it will help our veterans 
meet the rising daily living costs. TPI veterans also received the Veteran Gold Card, which provides cover for all their clinically required treatment of medical conditions. And, uh, this increase in the TPI payments will not impact on that at all. And while we know that the wheels of government can turn slowly, I thank the government for bringing this bill in to this place in time such that the legislation can be enacted in time to start the payments from 1 January 2023. It is an important process. There are around 27,000 TPI recipients across Australia. And while we're, doing, uh, we're <coughs> moving this bill today, we know there is so much more we can and need to do to assist our whole veteran community. Over the years, there have been many inquiries and reports, and most recently we have the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, and they recently delivered an interim report which had gone through all of those past inquiries. And they noted the considerable number of reports and the multiple recommendations that have been made across you know, multiple, several governments from both sides. The commissioners identified over 50 reports with more than 750 recommendations. Um, and while they acknowledged that many of the reports and inquiries were about discrete topics, they were dismayed to, uh, um, to learn the limited ways that governments from all sides have responded to the recommendations of these inquiries. So we know we have to do better, and we know when the Veterans uh, Royal Commission currently underway reports, I hope that all sides look at those recommendations very seriously to consider how best uh, to implement the recommendations to ensure we do better by our veterans. We know that our veterans, um, when they transition out of the Defence Force, they often feel isolated. They often feel that they've lost their purpose. And there are uh, bodies and agencies out there for support, the Return Services League, uh, Soldier On, amongst others. And, and I met the other day with another organisation, quite a young organisation in the scheme of things, um, uh, founded in 2016, Disaster Relief Australia. And, um, it's very topical at this point in time as we're seeing such devastating flood crises across the eastern seaboard and particularly in New South Wales. Disaster Relief Australia works with veterans who volunteer their time to be deployed, to use the military term, deployed into a disaster hit area where they use their skills that they learnt through the Defence Force uh, and they help coordinate uh, relief and response, um, working with communities, bringing everyone together, managing logistics. And what Disaster Relief Australia have found is that for many of the veterans they work with, this is giving them back that sense of purpose. It is having a really good outcome amongst the, the veteran population that they work with, not because they're going out saying to veterans, how can we help you? They're going to veterans saying, how can you help others? And uh, that is what our Defence Force personnel are so good at doing. They sign up not to get something for themselves, but they sign up to do something for others. And that is why it is such uh, an important thing and we need to look at other ways we can support our veterans to give them back that sense of purpose, to give them back that sense of community that we provide. And we know that the veterans, people who've been medically discharged, people who've been found to be um, totally and permanently incapacitated, you know, they struggle some of the most. 
because they entered the Defence Force fit and healthy and robust, as they have to do. You've got to pass a medical to, to enter the Defence Force. And they come out the other side with a TPI label. And for many of them, it's devastating. And for many of them, they depend on these payments to ensure that they can put food on the table and they can meet their daily costs and daily living. So we do need to ensure that those payments keep up with the cost of living. We need to ensure that our TPI veterans are not left behind and that they, are, that they know that we value them, that we in this parliament value the service they've provided um, and that we in this chamber value the service they've provided. On average, one Australian veteran commits suicide once every two weeks. And that is a statistic that should not be happening in a country that claims to value the contribution and sacrifice made by defence members and veterans in their service and the sacrifice their families have made. So, as I've said, this bill to deliver an annual $1,000 extra payment to our TPI recipients is but a tiny recognition to those veterans that they are valued and that they will not be forgotten. The opposition supported this bill through the other chamber, through the House of Representatives, and we support it in this chamber. And I thank the government for ensuring this bill is passed in time to start these payments from January 2023 to give our TPI veterans um, recognition but also some financial security and certainty moving forward. Thank you, thank you. Senator Davey. Senator Shoebridge. Th thanks, De Deputy President. I, I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate that we'll be supporting the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Budget Measures Bill 2022. Um, but we do so with significant reservations. Um, this bill will introduce amendments to the Veterans Entitlement Act um, to implement what the government said that they would um, do with disability compensation payments. The government, in its election um, uh, uh, commitments, made a, made a commitment for a modest increase in TPIs. And I'd have to say that this is fulfilling largely the modest nature of that commitment. Um, this, is, th this bill will increase the rate of the disability compensation payment at the special rate, often referred to as the TPI, or Total and Permanently Incapacitated Payment, payable under the Veterans Entitlement Act. Um, because those payments are legislatively linked, the amendments to the Veterans Entitlement Act provisions will also increase the temporary special rate under that Act and the special rate disability pension payable under the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act. Now, what is that increase going to be? Well, the increase that the government has committed to is a total payment of $1,000 over the year, which equates to $38.46 a fortnight. Or, or to really understand how modest this payment is, it equates to $2.00. 75, a bit less than $2.75 a day, not, not a cup of coffee. Um, it's, that's, the, that's the commitment that the government has brought to this chamber. Um, we know that there are approximately 27,000 veterans who are struggling on the TPI payment. And, and when you look at the entire TPI payment, plus all the very modest additional payments for energy supplements and the like, Veterans who have been totally and permanently incapacitated um, because of injuries received during their service, during their service for the country, are being asked to survive on less than $1,600 a fortnight, less than $800 a week. And with this payment, it'll just touch $800 a week. Um, for most veterans, given the cost of living in Australia, that is a a, a, a lifetime, a lifetime 
of, of effective poverty in a country like this. That's what veterans get under the TPI, a lifetime of effective poverty. And in fact, when the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade looked into this in 2019, they got submission after submission after submission from veterans saying, hang on, we serve for the country. We, we put ourselves out to serve for the country, sometimes for decades, and then we're literally being thrown on the scrap heap on a TPI payment that, that barely keeps the roof above their heads, let alone keeps the power on or allows them to have access to the internet. And, and so, although the, the, the quantum wasn't agreed, in 2019 the recommendation was that the government consider increase in the TPI payment. And there, couldn't be, there wasn't agreement on the committee about how much that should be. But I think if we went back and looked at the submissions and saw the evidence and, 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 and have spoken to veterans since, I'm pretty sure we could all agree in this chamber that $2.75 a day is not enough, that committing veterans to a, a lifetime of poverty is the wrong policy call from this government. And I know that there are competing uh, priorities for government's expenditure. But this total package is probably $20 million or less this year, maybe a little bit more next year. We're talking tiny amounts of money in the government's budget. And, and, and if we want to see how veterans are valued in the priorities of this government and the priorities of the previous government, and, and, and I, want to, I want to make this clear, we're six months into this government and at least we're getting an increase in the TPI. You know, not much of an increase, sort of embarrassingly small, but at least it's happening. So I'm going to give the minister and his office credit for achieving that. Because if you actually have a look at what's happened to veterans on TPI, they are pretty much the only recipient of benefits um, that's gone backwards over the last seven years. They've fallen below the cost of living over the last seven years. Um, they've gone backwards under the coalition government. So often you see the coalition wanting to wrap themselves in khaki and say how much they care about the military and how much they love the defence forces. Well, let's have a look at what they delivered. They delivered veterans falling real TPI benefits, less at the end of the coalition's uh, term than they had at the beginning of the coalition's term. So, yeah, let's, let's have a look at all of those pictures of Dutton and others wrapped in car key, standing beside the ADF. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, um, if you're going to refer to someone yeah. from the other Sorry. chamber, please use their appropriate yeah. title. Let's have a look at the former coalition leadership team wrapped in car key, sitting on tanks, hanging around with defence force personnel, saying how much they care about the military, and then let's look what they provided for veterans. Falling payments, endemic poverty. That's what's delivered. So at least we've got some movement from this government, and I'm going to give the minister in the office credit for that some movement. But you couldn't have a better definition of modest than $2.75 a day. You, you couldn't. That, that is like the, the Oxford Dictionary definition of bugger all. Um, that's what this, this bill delivers. Um, and so the, the inquiry said increase the payment. Um, and, and the problem with this, of course, is that inquiry was in 2019. So we've now had another three years of veterans struggling to get by on a payment that this pretty much entire committee unanimously recognised was inadequate in 2019. And now the only increase is $2.75 a day. Um, and that's been generous. That's rounding it up, by the way. Um, that's the increase we get from the government. Well, I can understand why veterans are, are saying, you know, what about us? When is our turn really going to come? Because We've seen the federal government, under the coalition's watch, spend $4 billion not getting French submarines. So in the military space, in the ADF space, the former coalition government spent $4,000 million to not get French submarines, and then 27,000 veterans on TPI got nothing, not one red cent. Now, I think that really shows the priorities of the former coalition government. And and what, what veterans get under the new Albanese Labor government is nothing like $4 billion, maybe $20 million a year for the next four years. They get $2.75 a day. And they know, because they've seen it, they know that the same Commonwealth government has dropped $4 billion not getting French submarines. And they say, hang on, where's the priorities? Do we matter? 
Well, we think veterans should matter, and we think they should get a payment substantially more. And I, I want to credit the many the, 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 the veterans who have contacted my office and pointed out how they deserve better. And the TPI Federation of Australia in particular, their communications with the office, they've, they've, made, they've, they've shown us clearly how there's been that real decline, that real decline in veterans' payments over, over, over decades, in fact. And as they say, and I'll just quote from the, the correspondence our office got, um, recent increases of 30 per cent for petrol, 30 per cent for food, 38 per cent for insurance, house and car will be greatly addressed with the 2 per cent this bill offers to TPIs. Um, there are many TPIs who must now decide whether to buy their medication or food. If they choose their medication, they need to approach community food pantries to obtain their meagre food supplies. That's what we're saying to veterans. Choose food or medication. And this bill is not going to fix that choice. Uh, I know that veterans wanted us to move amendments to double it, and we were close to doing that, to moving amendments to double it. But we were advised by the government that if we'd done that, it would have basically killed the bill, and veterans would have got nothing. Well, veterans should get at least double. Um, the reason we're going to support this bill is so that they end this year knowing they're going to get a tiny, modest increase start 1 January, and we want that to happen, and we're not going to delay that. But let's collectively commit to come back next year and start by doubling it and then have a really serious look at the level of payment that veterans deserve and need not to have that lifetime of poverty, because they serve the country, and it's about time we return that service with respect. Senator Cadell. It's not often in this chamber you get up and uh, a National Party member will endorse virtually everything a Greens member says, but I was ticking off my talking points with Senator Stubridge and shortening my speech. <laughs> There's 27,000 Australians that are roughly on the TPI, as you said, and they have given their all. They have given their health as well as given their service. And they have always deserved better and they always will deserve better. And the reasons for not moving that amendment are understandable. We saw in this place when there was a previous vote on, uh, I think, seniors coming in and doubling the allowance of work without penalty. What happened that it got referred to the other place and came back and to pass it, that had to be walked back on. So this is a good thing that it gets through now. It gives them something. It is not enough. And we saw last, uh, last government a National Party minister had to effectively grandstand to try and help veterans for 94 million to try and start processing. One thing that this government has done is resource quite well uh, to try and reduce that backlog. I know Senator Shoebridge and myself were talking with DVA and um, Liz Cox and AM, the secretary of that department, about the process, and we were looking about backlogs and all these sorts of things and the re reducing to zero the over, over dates. And there are massive, massive claim of veterans uh, going back, and we have to do more. And why have these people not gotten what they deserve? It's because they are the quiet people. They have served this country with pride. They are used to a chain of command. They don't want to be upset uh, what's going on. So they effectively suffer in silence. This is a good thing this uh, money is here. I note the, uh, the tune report that was referred to by Senator Shoebridge put four options forward. Option one, no change to the TPI level and classification. Great, that wasn't taken. That's gone. Option two, and I think this one is, a one-off increase in the TPI payment while maintaining non-economic loss status. That is one of those, but there were more. There are other options. There are bigger options. And I am a small fry on our side. I am not in government, but I think I heartily endorse Senator Shoebridge that when we come back, let's look at what we can give these people to go on. Because Senator Davey said in her speech, Every two weeks, a veteran commits suicide. These are a, a group, a cohort of people that work together as a team. They feel a great sense of loyalty to each other. They trust their lives in other people's hands. They go through their entire career. We pick them up. We move them on postings. They do this without concern. They lose family. They lose contact. They lose friends. They lose everything if they lose their health and qualify for a TPI pension. And if we aren't giving them the basics to survive, then as a country we need to look at ourselves. So what happens when a person gets to the end? I've got a constituent that has contacted me over some time, and uh, it's not a fault of the minister or the previous minister because they've processed. They're now at these administrative appeals, 
Administrative Appeals Tribunal on a claim that was initially approved and taken back. And when you talk to the people at DVA, they care, they get it, they want to do the right thing, but this person's medical bills are such that they've had to hire someone at $100,000 a year to perform their role in their business. So it's not only costing their health, they're not only getting their health care fixed, but they're now paying someone to do the job that they could do. So we stand here, we look at this $2.70, I think, rounding up, $2.75, I think you, you calculated. And why is it important to the Nats so much? Because so many of these people, the military is overrepresented by people who come from the regions, just like there were in, in the call-ups of wars. People from the regions effectively come and over, are overrepresented in the military. They are willing to do their work, they are happy to do their work, and what we've found is that in the analysis of the June report, show that TPI veterans within the broader TPI veteran cohort may have less financial security uh, because of individual circumstances than the other changes of TPI payment would be beneficial. And so we need to look after these people that finish their career, have no health, honestly have, have no future career prospects, have sacrificed so much during their prospect and are left with very little. We need to give them hope, if nothing else. $2.75, $1,000 is something. Thank you to the government. We'll be supporting this as going forward. But let's always think of these people in everything we do. We celebrate so many people in this country, but not this quiet cohort of people who get on, do the right thing, stay quiet, don't protest. Don't, we don't get clicktivism from them. We don't get noise from them. They're not out the front of Parliament House, but they are there and they are deserving of this, and I wholly support this bill. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I also rise to associate my comments in relation to the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. This bill sees the government, uh, as others have mentioned in this chamber, uh, to hear today the election commitment to increase the TPI veterans pension or the TPI payment and responds to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee report re recommending the increase in this payment. And you know, in fact, the TPI is paid to severely disabled veterans who are unable to work and support themselves because of permanent injury result resulting, as other senators have mentioned in this place, because of their selfless service for this country and its financial support that we provide to severely incapacitate, incapacitated veterans, a minimum that we should absolutely do as a minimum in this place. The modest increase that my colleague Senator Shoebridge referred to, and, and Senator Cadell as well, the $2.75 a day, that's what it works out to be. For veterans um, to have that increase in this pension, who have been long struggling, who are feeling the cost of living pressures here in Australia, like everybody else right now, and to give them that modest increase of $2.75, we congratulate the government on behalf of the Australian Greens, as, as Senator Schubert already said. But it's not enough, and we should be doing more. My electorate office in Western Australia is contacted by West Australian veterans all the time. They call my office, they send me emails, and that includes some First Nations veterans as well. And they tell me in their emails and in their phone calls about their struggles, the rising energy costs, the expensive medical bills, the lack of accessibility to mental health services, and just having enough money, as Senator Shoebridge already said, between the choice between medication and food. And this is their story, feeding their families, paying their rent, getting from A to B to perpetual in a tank. Also during my time within WA Police, I heard from ex-ADF personnel who I worked beside who then join the local police forces stories about the compounding trauma that they experienced during their time serving this country and the compounding trauma that stays with them still. And I also watch and, and observe the Soldiers and Sirens Facebook pages and others where I still see these stories and I still see the lack of accessibility the frontline support that we provide to our veterans. Our veterans have been reaching out 
in this country to politicians for years, talking about this suffering that's happened to them and their mates, and how nothing ever changes, no one ever listens, and how this culture of turning a blind eye results in poorer mental health outcomes, and as uh, Senator Davey already mentioned, results, unfortunately, in suicides. This bill provides that additional modest additional financial support TPI for veterans and their families who already received this payment and for other potential el eligible veterans in the future. The increase to this payment means it will be comparable with the national minimum wage and more than the after-tax national minimum wage and a wage earner would receive. So do the Greens support this? Yes, we do. Do the Greens think it's enough? No, we don't. And I'd like to see the representatives in this place who have no military experience, live off a modest pension such as this and make some of those choices that our veterans are making today. The sacrifices these veterans have made for us during the Defence Force Service is worth more than minimum wage in this country. These veterans and their families live with their sacrifices every single day. And we can do more in this place. We can start by sharing the dark stories of war, sad and hor horrifying realities that veterans face in the battles on our foreign shores. The truth telling, if you will, about the torment of these experiences that veterans live with every single day. Now, my people are also part of this story and they served in wars in this country and they were denied some of the fundamental human rights and basic decency and respect in relation to their identity. They served in the Boer Wars, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, all before they were actually recognised as citizens in this country. So let's not forget that they also, there are also the, the lives that were lost in the frontier wars in this country that raged across this country as well. And that's not the definition of veterans, unfortunately, in this country, because um, we, we barely acknowledge that. And I've spoken directly to Assistant Minister Keogh from the other place, and I want to congratulate him for some of the recent commitments, his work in relation to this bill, and making sure that the, that the wrongs of the past are righted, but we have a long way to go. We have a lot of work. And I want to say for the ageing veterans that you are not forgotten and we are not going to forget that you deserve the recognition, you deserve the support that we as politicians have the power to change. For our current servicemen and women, we must show them that we can do better when it comes to veterans' issues and we must give them the platform for their voices to be heard. Thank you, President. Senator Farrell, please sum up the debate. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, President. And, uh, can I say the Australian community has a clear expectation that defence personnel, <coughs> veterans and their families are well looked after. This is an important task and responsibility of government, a solemn commitment. Um, and summing up the debate on this bill, I'd like to thank uh, the opposition and uh, all of the others in this place for their support for it. The legislation demonstrates the Albanese Labor government's commitment uh, to delivering a better future for our veterans and families and addressing the uh, adequacy of support for totally and permanently incapacitated veterans. Often <coughs> referred to as TPI veterans and their families, providing them uh, greater financial support to ultimately deliver a better future uh, for them. Um, in April, the uh, federal Labor team announced that Labor, the Labor government, if elected, would act on the recommendations of the Senate inquiry to increase the TPI payment by $1,000 a year. This bill uh, today implements that commitment uh, by Labor by increasing the special rate of disability compensation payments for veterans. We're very glad uh, that today we're receiving uh, the support of uh, senators to ensure that the TPI veterans are better off. This $1,000 a year increase uh, to the special rate of disability pension, an increase of uh, $38.46 per fortnight, is to ensure veterans and their families are better supported financially, helping keep up with the cost of living pressures. 
Uh, it forms part of the recent federal uh, budget, which is delivering on the Albanese Labor government's commitment to deliver responsible cost of living release, relief. The increase uh, to uh, the TPI payment means it will be comparable to the national minimum wage and, crucially, greater than the after-tax national minimum wage uh, a wage earner would uh, receive. This initiative recognises the importance of supporting veterans who have been severely impacted by their experiences in the Australian Defence Force. The bill will achieve uh, this by amending the Veterans Entitlement Act 1986 to increase the rate of pension payable to TPI veterans. Uh, this government is committed to implementing practical support measures to better support defence personnel, veterans and their families. We are committed to ensuring that they get the support uh, that they not only need but more particularly deserve. I commend the bill to the uh, Senate. I put the question that the bill now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I so move. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Clark. Government Business Order for Day No. 10, Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Amendment Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. It's um, good to be able to make a contribution in this time for debate, uh, this time in relation to uh, the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, I can state at the outset that the Coalition strongly supports the government's commitment to expand uh, the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme. Um, the amendments uh, to the bill are an additional incentive for recruitment in, the expanding, uh, in expanding the ADF and meeting existing recruitment targets. Uh, as we all know and would expect, initiatives like this can directly contribute to retaining skills and talent within the ADF, which is as everyone would agree, um, critical in the current geopolitical climate. And the coalition supports measures that will reduce the cost of living for current serving and former ADF members. Uh, indeed, also one other benefit is, of course, the fact that measures like this can improve the health and well-being of ADF members, both past and present. Going to the details of the bill and what it will actually do, the bill will amend the eligibility criteria for the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme which will improve access to home ownership for Australian uh, Defence Force members um, earlier in their defence careers and allow veterans to access the scheme any time after completion. In particular, it would reduce uh, the qualifying service period for initial access to the DHOAS and uh, minimum service periods for each subsidy tier so that eligible members and veterans are entitled to receive higher levels of subsidy payments sooner and, of course, also remove the existing five-year post-separation timeframe for veterans to access the scheme. The bill would also make other minor amendments to the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Act 2008. Firstly, to create a power for the Secretary of Defence to declare that a subsidy ceasing event did not occur if they are satisfied uh, that all outstanding amounts due under a subsidised loan are paid due to a genuine error, a mistake or indeed an accident. And secondly, insert a recoverable payments mechanism to address the risk of breaches of section 83 of the Constitution arising from payments purportedly made under the Act in good faith in the bona fide administration of the Act, but that are not in fact supported by the Act. Turning to the scheme, uh, its background and its history, the scheme was established in 2008. And it provides eligible ADF members and their veterans and veterans with a monthly subsidy payment on the interest portion of their mortgage payments for those who choose to purchase a home of their own to live in. The assistance is provided in response to the additional difficulties that ADF members, veterans and their families have in purchasing a home as a result of military service. DHOAS 
sits within the portfolio responsibilities of the Department of Defence and is in, uh, actually administered, though, by the Department of Veterans Affairs on behalf of the Department of Defence. Uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs was consulted extensively on the development of this bill um, based on information provided by the government. It's a retention initiative aimed at encouraging members to continue serving in the ADF. The scheme provides, as I've stated, an incentive for members to stay in the ADF. The longer you serve, the more entitlement you accrue and the longer you can receive assistance. To be able to access uh, DHOAS, you need to have served in the ADF within the last five years completed a qualifying period of service and accrued a service credit. For permanent members, the qualifying period is four consecutive years of service. For reservists, however, it is eight consecutive years of effective reserve service out of at least 20 paid days, uh, sorry, of at least 20 paid days per financial year. For all members, um, if there is a break in service, uh, there needs to be a uh, commencement once again. Uh, continuous full-time service can fast-track reservist qualifying periods. Uh, the assistance provided by the scheme is not tied to a home loan with a specific value, and eligible banks are the Australian Military Bank, Defence Bank and the NAB. Changes to the, scheme, the Act that administers the scheme came into effect from the 22nd of June 2020. The amendments extended the time frame for ADF members leaving the ADF to access their final uh, scheme subsidy certificate from two to five years. Those changes also ensure that members who leave the ADF and rejoin within five years will retain all service credit accrued prior to their break in service. So I've already stated that the Coalition strongly supports the government's commitment to expand uh, this scheme, the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme. The Coalition believes that if young Australians are prepared to defend Australia, we should help them buy and establish a home. The amendments to this bill are an additional incentive for recruitment in expanding the ATF, ADF and meeting existing recruitment targets. Initiatives like this can directly contribute to retaining skills and talent within the ADF. Uh, Defence annual reports mention the conduct of surveys that identify DHOAS as a key factor in ADF retention, which is why these changes and this legislation and uh, its commitment from the government is so vitally important. Uh, the coalition, of course, as you would expect, all parliamentarians in this place, supports measures that will reduce the cost of living for current serving and former ADF members. Measures like this, as I've already said, as well have an impact on the health and wellbeing of uh, past and present ADF members. The ADF is currently facing significant challenges to recruit and to retain its numbers and uh, therefore struggling to grow its workforce. And so this bill, it's hoped, will improve the ADF's ability to recruit and retain. Housing and home ownership are critical factors that influence ADF members and veterans' health and welfare. Um, just in terms of some areas that were of concern to the coalition, um, there was at least perceived to be considerable risk that amendments to this bill may not achieve the intended outcomes being proposed. There's no statistical data that supports some of the presuppositions about the changes, but indeed uh, we will be watching quite closely the rollout of this scheme and the impact that it has. Um, with regard to increased separation rates, reducing the minimum service period for eligibility may well or could impact negatively on retention, uh, with members separating once they reach the minimum eligibility criteria. Current minimum per periods of service for eligibility align with the initial minimum periods of service and members' return of service obligations following their fully funded courses for recruitment, training and university education. Again, another matter we will uh, be watching quite closely through the estimates process. Uh, in terms of financial risk, there's a growing exponential cost associated with funding these amendments that runs into forward estimates. Given the growth rate expected from amending and reducing the eligibility criteria, uh, we have also expressed concern around uh, the limited number of providers, um, <clears throat> and of course it would be great to see that broadened out. But in broad uh, terms, I think it's quite clear that this is a good piece of legislation. It is one that the coalition um, absolutely supports. Uh, any measure that helps our defence force, its serving members, past and present, to continue to make the contribution that they do uh, with these added incentives uh, to a degree, a peace of mind, 
around home ownership and the costs associated with it, particularly at a time when we are seeing mortgage uh, interest rates increase to the extent that they are. This will be welcome relief to current and, uh, current and um, past uh, members of our ADF. So, on that basis, uh, I've stated the coalition's position and I commend the bill. Does any other honourable senator wish to make a contribution before I call the minister to sum up the debate? No senator has indicated wish to speak. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President, and I thank uh, um, Senator Rodunium for his uh, contribution and uh, uh, to this uh, particular bill, the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Amendment Bill 2022. The bill demonstrates the commitment of the Albanese Labor government made to boost uh, home ownership for defence members and veterans and to assist veterans transitioning from military to civilian uh, life. Uh, as part of the government's election commitment, the bill will amend the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme to expand access to the scheme by providing defence members with access uh, to benefits earlier in their careers. The qualifying period uh, will be uh, reduced from two years for serving ADF personnel and to four years for reservists. The bill uh, will also allow veterans to apply for their final subsidy certificate at any time after they have separated from the Australian Defence Force by removing the current five-year limitation. This will ensure veterans can access the scheme at a time that suits them without feeling uh, pressured to do so in a set period. These amendments will mean uh, better outcomes for defence members, veterans and their families, and reinforcing the uh, government's commitment to retention in the Australian Defence Force to home ownership for members and veterans, as well as members, uh, veterans' uh, wellbeing. The bill also helps our defence personnel and veterans with the cost of living pressures that all Australians uh, are feeling uh, with regard to housing, which are making it increasingly difficult to achieve that great Australian dream of home uh, ownership. Labor created the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme, and now the, Labor, uh, the uh, Albanese Labor government is expanding it. I commend the bill to the Senate. The question before the chair is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Act 2008 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. No senator has indicated they wish a committee. Minister. Uh, I move uh, um, the bill. Be read a third time. For a third time. Thank you, minister. I put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Act 2008 and for related purposes. Government Business Orders of the Day number 4, Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Card Discount Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate and the second reading amendment moved by Senator Dean Smith. Uh, just uh, for a moment before I give you the call, Senator Davey, uh, on the whipping list I have Mr Pocock in continuance. Is that, can I just confer with the clerk or has he completed his? Call Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. As with so many policy issues that we are seeing since the change of government, Regional and rural Australians are once again the forgotten people in this legislation. They've been thrown to the curb. While the virtue signallers on the other side of the chamber clamber to make expensive cars cheaper so they can demonstrate their climate credentials, we have hundreds, possibly more, families in rural areas at the present time with no car, no truck no means of transport and their roads being absolutely shredded to pieces. And even when these floods go, the opportunity to be able to buy any car will be a challenge for these people who have to face the clean-up costs, the repair bills, 
and um, just you know struggle to get back to some semblance of normal life. So how do you think those families in our flood affected areas trying to save their homes and furnitures are going to feel when they hear the Albanese govern government is pushing hard to get legislation through doing secret deals with the Greens to get legislation through that gives people who can probably already afford it access to a discounted imported electric car. How do you think our local governments in those areas are going to feel when they realise the Albanese government is pushing hard to legislate to get more vehicles on our roads that contribute nothing to road maintenance. Because electric vehicles don't pay the fuel excise. This is a tax relief for electric vehicles, which will undermine our general revenue. How are we going to repair our roads when the whole of Australia is driving around in electric vehicles? even though we don't have the infrastructure to support them yet. Once again, this is a government that has no idea what happens in the engine room of Australia. And as this budget, their budget has demonstrated over and over again, they have no interest in supporting the regions which are the engine room of our economy. It's just another example of disregard. For the city dweller, Electric cars are an easy way to get to the shops. If the car battery is running low, you can just plug it in. There's numerous recharging stations very close by. Or, as we've seen in the Daily Telegraph and, and other news, you just run an extension cord out your window and to the curb. Of course, the irony is that, especially here in the ACT, and I know Senator Pocock is very passionate about this bill as well, the ACT government boasts that they are 100 per cent renewable powered, but the reality is that overnight when the lights go out, they connect back to the grid and all those people plugging their cars in overnight are actually plugging in to coal-fired power. But we won't let detail get in the way of good virtue signalling. In our regional communities, however, there aren't endless recharging stations. And a trip to the local shops isn't just a kilometre away. It's often many kilometres. If I want to go and get a bottle of milk from my house, I've got a 36 kilometre one-way trip. And there's no charging stations nearby. There will, hopefully one day, be such infrastructure in regional Australia, but it's not today. So this discount car buying opportunity is of zero use to regional Australians. Not now, not yet. And before those opposites start to accuse me and others on this side of not supporting net zero strategies or of being climate Luddites, let me remind you of the Coalition's Future Fuels and Vehicle Strategy. That plan recognised that progress must take all Australians along with it. All Australians need to be on the journey to net zero, not just the inner city dwellers. It must be embraced in step with advances in technology to underpin the changes. And there must be investment in the infrastructure across the nation to keep up with those advances. Our plan was well researched, well consulted and was intended to bring long-term benefits for all Australians. The strategy detailed a technology-led approach to reducing transport emissions while ensuring Australians could drive their preferred type of vehicle, be it petrol, diesel, hydrogen, hybrid, which are now being demonised, or electric-powered. The principles that underpinned our policy were partnering with the private sector to support uptake 
and stimulate co-investment into future fuels. Focusing on reducing barriers to the rollout of future fuel technologies. And that also was a focus on uh, where infrastructure investment needed to be. And expanding consumer choice by enabling informed choice and minimising costs of integration into the grid. Senator Davey, I apologise, I must interrupt you now because we've reached a hard marker. You will be in continuance. Senator Shikoni. Deputy President, uh, by leave, I seek leave to move a motion to um, leave of absence for Senator Dodson. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the leave of absence be granted for uh, Senator Dodson for the 25th of November on account of parliamentary business. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Askew. I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senators Hughes and Molan for the 25th of November for personal reasons, and Senator Rustin for the 25th of November for a parliamentary delegation. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. We will now move to two-minute statements. Senator Askew. Thank you. Not much else in this world is more chilling to hear than a cancer diagnosis. Cancer can feel like, and may well be, a death sentence. It can mean that the creature comforts of everyday life are ripped away instantly. That's despite the incredible advancements in modern medicines and treatment options ensuring more and more people are survivors. However, the reality is that most people who receive a cancer diagnosis spend a lot of time in clinical settings such as hospitals, surgeries and emergency departments. Remember the last time you were in one of those settings? The white walls and the incessant beeping of medical equipment? They may be necessary for medical treatment but are not conducive to rest. The comforts of home can help relieve the stresses of treatment following a cancer diagnosis and it's the comfort of home that the Cancer Council of Tasmania replicated at its Northern Cancer Support Centre, the first of its kind in Australia which this year celebrates 10 years of operation. A remarkable milestone that des deserves recognition, as do the many hundreds of volunteers that have been volunteering throughout that time. The centre provides around 1,500 sessions of support to its clients every year and was designed to be a homely space. It brings the comforts of home into a non-judgmental space where clients and their families can rest and take stock of what they are enduring and what is to come next. The Northern Cancer Support Centre offers a range of evidence-based resources and also has access to a wig library for those who are struggling emotionally with the loss of their head during treatment. There are many reasons why the Northern Cancer Support Centre should be celebrated, but the most important reason is this. If you live in Northern Tasmania and you are going through your own cancer journey, you are always welcome at this Launceston-based centre. It's more than a building, it's a community. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, um, and uh, thank you, Senator Askew, for that contribution. I know it's um, shared with um, senators on this side as well. We appreciate you addressing the Senate on that today. Um, the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill is designed to ensure that female-dominated professions like healthcare, aged care, disability support, the early childhood education sector get the pay rise and support that they so desperately deserve. But it's these changes that those opposite in question time yesterday deemed radical and in the other place referred to as extreme. So it's very important for us to understand what is in this bill and how it will improve gender equality. Those opposite call these changes radical, including gender equality and job security as objects of the Act. I don't see anything extreme or radical about that. Limiting the use of fixed-term contracts to give genuine fixed-term arrangements. Again, I don't see how this is incredibly radical, but that is the proposition being put by those opposite. This bill includes inclu introducing a statutory equal remuneration principle. That's right. Equal pay. Equal pay to close the gender pay gap. How crazy and extreme. The bill also includes prohibiting pay secrecy clauses, something that we know has contributed to the gender pay gap for many, many years. The bill includes providing stronger access to flexible working arrangements desperately needed by women returning to work. 
And the bill makes sure that we're providing stronger protections against workplace discrimination for the protected attributes of gender identity, intersex status and breastfeeding. And the bill also does this very important thing that those opposite don't want to talk about. It implements Recommendation 28 of the Respect at Work report, a report they let sit on a table to prohibit sexual harassment at work. Well, if this is radical and extreme, it's for those on the Thank opposite you, side Senator to explain Green. why. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'm delighted to have been asked to read out the speeches of several intelligent, passionate and articulate young people from Queensland as part of the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign. Today I'm reading out a speech from Ella Sheehan. Ella says, Hi, my name is Ella Sheehan. I'm 15 years old and a Year 10 student at Earnshaw State College in the Lilly Electorate in Brisbane. Put yourself in the shoes, or rather the feathers, of a migratory shorebird where you've just battled gale force winds and rain flying 12,000 gruelling kilometres in search of a safe resting place and habitat, only to return and find something horrific—a townhouse development. This is the sad reality for many critically endangered birds, and we are watching the mass extinction unfold right in front of us, just one site being the much-loved Toonda Harbour wetlands in Cleveland. Why are we letting this happen to our ancient rainforests, bush and wetlands? Please answer the calls and crows of our wildlife and future generations. Australia's ecosystems are disappearing from the face of our earth. Why don't we pull the parachute? There is no safety net below. In the time it has taken for me to read Ella's speech, 50 football fields worth of precious forests have been flattened, destroyed. 20 hectares of uniquely biodiverse ecosystems destroyed. 17,000 tonnes of carbon stores destroyed. We need to get to the root of the problem. You have all the power. You can be the Lorax who speaks for the trees and my generation. You can stop us all from toppling over the edge. It will take time, but together we can use our intellect to resurrect and redirect our future. Thanks, Ella. Thank you. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to bring to the attention of the Senate a national disgrace in how our young people in Western Australia are being treated. Imagine if you were a parent of a 12-year-old boy and you saw footage of your son being sat on by three custodial officers with another five watching on. He is silently screaming because he is struggling to breathe. This is not 200 years ago. This was last month in Western Australia. This barbaric practice of course, called folding up is a restraint position that is banned, I understand, by law enforcement globally because it risks suffocation and death. And unbelievably, it has taken uh, it to be revealed through footage that the McGowan Labor government in Western Australia is allowing this practice and so many other inappropriate and, quite frankly, barbaric practices to be occurring on children in our, in our uh, detention system. But what is almost as shocking as the revelation of this practice is the cold and callous response of our Premier, saying the system was actually working well. Now, there is no doubt that these children are incredibly challenging to manage, but it is not only barbaric, it is counterproductive to treat any child in this way. It is no way to treat them and it is certainly no way to rehabilitate them. Even former Labor Premier Carmen Lawrence has said that Mark McGowan's response was tone deaf and it was insubstantial. There is another way. There are far more humane and far more effective ways to manage these destructive behaviours through behaviour support. These practices done well largely eliminate the need for physical and chemical restraint practices. They are humane and they work, and we must treat our children differently Thank in Western Australia. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Billick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I was, pleased this, I was pleased to meet this week with the Ambassador of Ukraine, His Excellency Vassil Moroshnichenko, to receive an update about the situation in Ukraine. As chair and former deputy chair of the Ukraine-Australian Parliamentary Friendship Group, I've had many um, con contacts with the ambassador since his appointment. Uh, 
I will just say my husband has family in Ukraine, so this, the situation with the war in Ukraine is particularly personal to me. The recent liberation of Kherson, as reported in the media, is a major setback for Russia's efforts to illegally invade and occupy Ukraine. While Ukraine has now recaptured around 50 per cent of the territory previously held by Russia, Kherson is of particular strategic importance as a Black Sea port and the gateway to Crimea. And I'm proud that Australia has contributed to this effort. On the 27th of October, Prime Minister Albanese announced that, in addition to the support Australia has already provided, we will send 70 ADF personnel to the United Kingdom as part of the UK's efforts to train Ukraine's armed forces. Australia has also committed a further 30 Bushmaster protected mobility mobility vehicles to Ukraine, bringing the total number of gifted bushmasters to 90. In financial terms, this brings Australia's total assistance to $655 million, including $475 million in military assistance. We are the largest non-NATO contributor to Ukraine since the invasion. Our contribution to Ukraine's self-defence is vital to upholding the global rules-based order. It sends a strong signal that we will not tolerate the invasion of a democratic sovereign nation. The combination of targeted sanctions against Russia and Belarus, global military assistance to Ukraine and the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people have all been key to making Russia's invasion a monumental failure. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you. We've seen this horror stories, brown sludge on a plate, meals you wouldn't even feed your dog. It's the food being fed to our elderly and vulnerable in aged care facilities, to our parents and our grandparents. There's no way they're getting the nutritional value they need from those meals. The Royal Commission into Aged Care said that up to 50 per cent of residents are suffering malnutrition. For our elderly population, malnutrition can lead to more falls and higher risk of infections and disease. To put it in a nutshell, for some people, malnutrition can be a death sentence. Since the Royal Commission, a lot of residential facilities have upped their game. They're preparing better meals. But a lot of them haven't. There are still residents being fed on less than $10 a day. Aged care homes were given extra money to fix this. Some of them pocketed it and kept on feeding the residents sludge. That's not good enough. It's time to have someone independent to take a look at this. We could send a dietitian in to look at what food the home is feeding people. The dietitian would make sure residents are getting all the nutri nutrients and good stuff they need from the meals. A dietitian could also assess residents at least once a year for malnutrition, just like a checkup from the doctor. They'd make sure the residents are healthy. If they're not healthy, they can refer them to someone to get help. We've made a lot of progress in aged care since the Royal Commission, but we still have a long way to go. The residents at these homes have worked hard all their lives just to end up in a facility that doesn't even feed them properly. I hope that if I'm in a home one day, I'm in a facility that will give me the decency and the respect to feed me a proper meal. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Rennick. Oh, I rise to speak on behalf of Harrison Mather, a 17-year-old school senior and proud resident of Moncrief uh, in Queensland. What is democracy without integrity? Integrity is the core foundation of trust between the elected and the electors. A lack of integrity erodes the trust in our democratic institutions and in the very principles our great nation was founded upon. Public trust in our government is at an all-time low and falling. 85 per cent of Australians believe federal politics is plagued with corruption. Whether or not this is the case, the level of public distrust is a critical issue which directly threatens our democracy and which must be resolved. Parliamentary integrity should not be an oxymoron, but an insur insurance to the country. Australia needs an anti-corruption watchdog. We're fortunate enough that the vast majority of our public servants are sincere and hard-working politicians who have dedicated their lives to serving this country. Nonetheless, a federal ICAC would serve to protect integrity, preserve public trust and to weed out the small number of corrupt politicians. I speak for myself, my friends and not if not all young Australians, when I say we want to have faith in our governments, we want to have faith in our politicians, we want integrity to be reflected in the actions of our nation's leaders, not merely their words. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Smith. I rise today to read a speech written for the Raise Our Voice campaign by Gabrielle Koloff. 
young retail worker and proud member of her union and my union, the SDA. Thank you, Gabrielle, for writing this important speech about what our new parliament should accomplish and for your work supporting your colleagues as a union delegate. Here are Gabrielle's words. Retail workers are essential workers. The fact is retail workers are the backbone of our economy. Australia must step up and protect the people who are our front line, the workers who keep the nation running before it's too late. Too many retail and fast food workers are being abused at work, verbally and or physically. Enough is enough. Everyone has the right to a safe work environment. As challenges to continue to unravel after the pandemic, now is the time for our society and economy, as well as our government and businesses, to show retail workers that they are a valued part of our nation. In order to rebuild our society, the government must invest in maintaining and nurturing our workers, thus creating a safe work environment free from abuse. Unions are only a small step towards achieving this, so it is vital for the government to continue supporting its workers. We must give them the respect they deserve. Retail workers have always been essential, but now it is impossible to ignore. Time after time, retail workers are not being considered. Instead, they are taken for granted. Doesn't the health and well-being of 1.5 million retail workers deserve attention, Australia? Retail workers consistently face job insecurity, staff shortages and customer abuse. It's time, Australia, to stop saying retail workers are essential and start treating them as essential. Thank you for your words, Gabrielle, and your advocacy. It's been an absolute privilege to read your voice and bring your voice into the Senate today. Thank you. Senator Shrewbridge. Deputy President, uh, today I'll be sharing a speech written by 15-year-old Angelina as part of the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign, a campaign that gives young female and non-binary people from all backgrounds the opportunity to have their stories heard on the national stage. And this is what Angelina writes. Many of you in this room are connected to a young person in your life, whether it would be a niece or nephew, son or daughter, perhaps grandson or granddaughter, if you're lucky. Regardless, we were all once narrow-visioned in this fathomless world. In other words, we're all young. And I'm forever grateful that our politicians have believed that our youth could grant insight on what we should achieve as our nation's future leaders. With that said, there's an ongoing issue plaguing our younger demographic, the growth in incarceration rates and criminal behaviour. Like the faith you've had for me and millions of other youngsters, I implore you to also share this with incarcerated youth. By throwing them into prisons, we, further, we push further the untrue narrative that they can never improve, especially at the ages where the brain is still in development. We must take the initiative to correct this behaviour before it merges with their temperament. We must not punish them and abandon what may fester into resentment. Instead, with a positive attitude, we must reinforce proper behaviour and build rapport with them. This approach will reduce the current rate of recidivism, currently 54 per cent within 12 months, just as we would not disown our child for, for misbehaving. Our, our nation must not leave any person who is a part of our future behind. Thanks so much, Angelina. Deputy President, the answer to war is not more war. The answer to escalating militarism is not nuclear bombers stationed here. The stationing of B-52 nuclear-capable bombers in the Northern Territory is a dangerous es escalation, and it must be opposed. No one needs nuclear-capable bombers, least of all this country. It makes Australia an even bigger part of the global nuclear weapons threat to all of humanity, our very existence. They should have no place no safe harbour in our country. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. During the pandemic, many of us used this opportunity to explore our own backyards, to get out bush or go up the coast. Some people may or may not know um, just how many of our tourism businesses are owned and operated by First Nations people. It is a relatively small part of the Australian tourism sector, but a vitally important part for our mob. Employment for First Nations people in the tourism sector provides an opportunity for mob to stay on country and earn an income by maintaining and sharing their culture and traditions. First Nation cultural tourism can provide an important source of income, particularly in regional and remote areas where other job opportunities are limited. It has been found that the number of international tourists taking part in First Nations cultural tourism activities is increasing, which is in fact welcomed. Often there's a joke that Australia has no culture, but as First Nations people, we do. We have a very rich he cultural heritage that spans across the whole country with art, song, dance, stories, scientific knowledge, food, traditions and law. 
In most cases, First Nations communities welcome the chance to share this incredible knowledge as it's been passed down for thousands of years. We are, in fact, the oldest continuing culture in the world. As the tourism sector recovers from COVID lockdowns and border closures, First Nations tourism ventures need to be given support as Australian markets itself as a place to come and travel to. The government must genuinely include and promote First Nations owned and operated, operated tourism ventures. Further, I urge travellers to ensure that when you go out bush or onto the coast or anywhere in this country, you know whose land you are actually on and make sure that you make an effort to learn about the community's unique culture and stories. Support First Nations local businesses and participate in First Nations cultural tourism activities. Lastly, the, most, uh, the State of the Environment report said that poorly managed tourism was one of the factors putting cultural heritage at risk. We need to do better and protect our precious places, sacred sites and unique landscapes. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in relation to the government's proposed industrial relations bill, which I think represents a great threat to businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, in particular in my home state of Queensland. Yesterday, yesterday there were questions asked in this place about how, in the regulatory impact statement, the government came to the view that small and medium-sized businesses would be able to get a consultant to help them through this industrial relations maze at $175 an hour. So the government's produced this in regulatory impact statement in terms of the impact of this bill on small businesses and medium-sized businesses, and it has assumed that you can get a consultant to help you go through this maze that you've been compelled to go through for $175 an hour. Now, numerous sources were quoted, but can I tell you, I did something obvious. I did something obvious, Mr Acting Deputy President. I actually rang a small business who provides these services. How astounding. I actually rang someone who provides these services. And do you know what they told me? What their services cost? A junior associate, $350 an hour. Twice as much, twice as much as the assumption contained in the government's regulatory impact statement. $350 an hour. Multiply the cost on small business, medium-sized businesses by a factor of two. And if you want to get someone more senior, if you're up against a Senator Tony Sheldon in his previous life, a Senator Tim Ayres in his previous life, a Senator Rafchikoni in his previous life, you're looking at between $400 and $500 an hour. This bill needs scrutiny. It needs more time. This Senate needs time to do its job. And I call upon the government to get this legislation right. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I've just come from a presentation from uh, Dr Jordan Peterson, and uh, he's done a lot of work uh, exposing the left's uh, infestation of the West education systems, as well as defending free speech and campaign open and honest dialogues about difficult sub subjects. It was wonderful to hear someone, other than myself, that I feel I just talk to blank walls in this place all the time, trying to get the message across about just ordinary people out there. And he's right, because he travels the world and what he's saying. And here we are, trying to deal with climate change, yet we're allowing people in this country and across the world to live in absolute poverty, who are ready just hanging on by their fingernails who are dropping off the edge because the main thing is they cannot afford cheap energy. Cheap energy drives everything. Yet we have governments that have constantly put into place systems that are driving up the cost of power, loss of jobs, and that's the main factor. You're worrying about saving the planet at the expense of people living in poverty and not being able to have a decent life. The whole fact is that you have 20 million people a year that die due to the the air that they breathe in. These people that are living in poverty without electricity are actually dying because of the air, because of what they burn on their fires with the dung. And you're not dealing with that because you couldn't care less about it. You're all worried about saving the planet. And here we have the Labor Party. It's all about the people, the working class people, but you prefer to see them in poverty to head down this path. And all you know what it's all about is people need to start growing up and they need to start taking responsibility 
responsibility for their own actions and can make decisions and not being led by those who will fill their heads with garbage and rubbish that is happening in our educational system, in the indoctrination of children, which I spoke about, and in my bill. So it's basically like get out of telling people how they live their lives. People need to grow up, get a backbone and stand up for themselves. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On Wednesday last week, Deliveroo abruptly shut down its Australian operations, leaving around 15,000 riders out of work with no warning. For the thousands of riders who relied on Deliveroo for income, there was little consolation in the company's announcement that it would compensate them with two weeks' pay, but not actually deliver the payment for at least a month. There's also no guarantee riders will receive what they're already owed, as their claims are ranked low in the hierarchy of the company's administration. Deliveroo's complete abandonment of its workforce is symptomatic of a deeper problem with the gig economy. Gig workers are treated as individual business entities and, as a result, are denied all the basic pay and conditions which Australian workers have fought for generations to achieve. The evasion of employment obligations underpins the business model of many gig pl platforms, not just Deliveroo. Currently, I have an intern in my office from ANU, Kesh Karapia, uh, who has done a, written a wonderful research report about the gig economy and the regulation that Australia desperately needs. His research report highlights the sheer scale of the problem. In 2020, Australia's gig workforce was estimated to be as large as 250,000 workers, outnumbering the workforce in industries like media and communications and mining. On top of that, the gig workforce is overrepresented amongst with young people, migrants and disabled people. Research tells us that these are groups with particularly limited knowledge about their rights and how to defend them, making them very vulnerable to the predatory and ruthless practices of gig platforms. It is essential that gig workers receive the same minimum pay and conditions as other employees. All kinds of workers should be on an equal footing. We look forward to Labor introducing industrial relations legislation to plug this significant regu regulatory gap that is currently thank working you, to entrench Senator an already Pocock. vulnerable Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In uh, March this year, the former government announced that the Australian Defence Force will be grown by 18,500 uniformed personnel by 2040. This investment is an important step in increasing our country's security, particularly considering the changing situation in the Indo-Pacific region and in Eastern Europe. Now, this growth, however, cannot occur without retaining people that, that we currently have. With separation rates climbing, we are approaching a retention crisis in our defence force. Defence uh, workers are expected to carry gaps in staffing, becoming overworked, leading to burnout, frustration and disillusionment in the work being done. Even the smallest of improvements can change a workplace. The Chief of the Air Force recently announced that men would now be able to grow a beard, something that uh, I've done recently. And the collective joy of uh, Air Force personnel was palpable, as was the collective envy of the Army. The ADF Employment Offer Modernisation Program is offering extra incentives and flexibility to entice defence workers, defence members, to extend their service. Now, retention is a complex issue, so it would be so important to listen to those with the boots on the ground to iron out the frustrations that some feel and continue to make our defence personnel feel valued. We need to invest in the people that we have as a first step in growing our defence force to ensure the future safety of our nation. Now, in closing, I would like to acknowledge the assistance with the preparation of these remarks by Senator Jennifer uh, Singleton of the Royal Australian Army. Uh, who has been uh, my privilege to have in my office this week a part of the ADF exchange program. Sergeant Singleton is attached to the Headquarters Special Operations Command you, based Senator here in Canberra. And I thank Senator Senator Gallagher. Gallagher. Here, here. President, as part of Raise Our Voices Youth Voice to Parliament this week, I would like to use my time to amplify the voice of a young woman from Canberra, Grace Everly, and read a speech that she has written. 
My name is Grace. I'm 20 years old. I'd like Australia's new parliament to achieve and focus on equality in the workplace. I chose a career pathway and studied to become an early childhood educator because I am passionate about early childhood education. Knowing I am teaching young children is a stepping stone for children to become whom they want to be, to help their pathway into primary school education and far beyond. Our industry is fraught with challenges. Staff retention is one of the biggest. To put it simply, our pay rate is one of the lowest in the country. Whilst we look after your precious children to give them the best start in life, we barely can afford to live. Rising costs of living are scary as a young independent adult living out of home who wants to make a go at life and living with type 1 diabetes, a serious chronic illness, means very little change at the end of the week. However, I'm forever thankful to the Albanese government and the support from my local MP, Alicia Payne, for supporting JDRF's Australian Ac Australia's Access for All campaign and funding CGM Access for Everybody. This technology is and will be life-changing and life-saving for so Your many. Time has expired. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Senator President. Time. Indeed. Yeah. My, yeah. <laughs> my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. I refer the minister to two statements the department put out on Tuesday night saying they did not actually rely on the website of a modern-day spiritual healer when calculating the cost of a bargaining consultant. Is it just an amazing coincidence that the figure of $175 an hour that his department uses in the report is the figure mentioned on the Modern Day Spiritual oh, Healers uh, website, which the department provides as a reference for in the regulatory impact statement? Will the minister take responsibility for this appalling error? Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, members, senators, I don't want a repeat of the shouting uh, that we had yesterday. The question has been asked. I'm going to call the minister in a moment, and I expect him to be heard in respectful silence. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Dunningham, for the question. Well, another day, and we have the opposition continuing to clutch at straws uh, to find any reason possible to stop workers in this country from getting a pay rise. Um, they will do anything to stop talking about workers getting a pay rise. They will stop anything, do anything to stop small businesses and medium-sized businesses being able to participate in a system that exists under their current legislation uh, to deliver pay rises for their workers, a more simple industrial relations system and a higher productivity for small businesses. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Point of order, uh, President. On relevance, I mean, the question was pretty clear around the source of the information and whether the minister will yep. take responsibility. Thank you, not the... Senator Dunningham. I will draw the minister to the question. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Now, as I say, the, uh, this is a continuation of what we saw yesterday from the opposition, uh, trying to find any possible reason, uh, whether it be websites or, 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 or people, consultants. What this is actually about is one of the false claims that the opposition has been making this week, which is their claim that it will cost small businesses $14,000 to participate in, in uh, multi-employer bargaining and medium-sized employers to pay even more. Now, you'll be surprised to hear that that's actually wrong, uh, because the way the, way the uh, laws are structured uh, allows for small businesses to have access to the cooperative workplaces stream so that if a small business wants to go and engage a consultant, whoever that might be, uh, to assist them with their results, then that's a matter for them. But what I think you will find is that most small businesses are members of chambers of commerce, are members of industry associations, who would actually go and do the negotiations on their behalf, and then a small Order. business and then a small business would have the option of choosing to be part of that or not. Of course, if their workers would like to be a, a part of that, then the majority of those workers have to go through a process to support, that, uh, to support that option. They also have to go to the, the Fair Work Commission to get approval to do so. Uh, so this Minister idea. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Point of order on relevance again, Madam President. Uh, oh. This business around everything Thank other you, than the answer Senator we asked Dunningham. for. Um, I will draw the minister back to the question, and I would ask those on my left to listen in silence. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, um, uh, President. So, as I say, the, what the opposition is saying is just, is just plain wrong, and I'll keep telling uh, you why. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. 
Uh, I'm waiting. You have a senator on his feet, Senator Dunham. Thank you, President. Uh, unbelievable, but uh, Aki, in terms of Chambers, released information yesterday showing the cost of a bargaining consultant is actually closer to $438 oh. rather than $175 the figure uses on its data, making costs for small businesses higher than $20,000. Order. Is the minister going to ask his department to fix the regulatory impact statement, or does the minister stand by the calculation? of the modern-day spiritual healer he references in his report. Uh, I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence, and those interjections are disorderly, Senator Ayres. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. I understand that this has given uh, the opposition a lot of amusement this week, but we don't think it's an amusing situation that for 10 years workers have had to get uh, by Senator without a pay Watt. rise. We Senator don't Watt. think it's an amusing situation. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have asked for silence, and the minute the minister got to his feet, you were shouting louder than the minister who has a microphone on. I will ask again for there to be silence so that we can all hear the minister's answer. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Now, I'm not, I haven't seen that report from Aki, but if they are putting that sort of information out, then they are wrong uh, and they are misleading their members. Because what Aki know, uh, what Aki know, well, what Aki know, and what the opposition Watt. should know, uh, is that small businesses will have Minister access Watt, to the cooperative workplace. Minister Watt, I asked at the start of question time for there not to be a repeat of the disorder that was in the chamber yesterday during question time, and immediately we have the disorder back again. I'm going to ask for about the fourth time for members on my left in particular to listen to the answers in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Aki should know, because they've been involved in these discussions, Minister that small Watt. businesses will have Minister access Watt. to the Cooperative Workplace Please stream. Please resume your seat. And thank you, Senator Cash. You immediately started shouting again after I'd asked for silence. I'd asked for silence and some respect to the rulings of the chair. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. In fact, Aki is one of the organisations that will have every ability under this legislation to prepare a template agreement uh, for all small businesses to opt into under the Cooperative Workplaces stream. So is Aki telling us that not only they oppose a wage rise, or oh, shock horror, Aki have always supported pay rises, haven't they? But are they saying they're not prepared to play their role as an employer group to design a template agreement uh, that small businesses can, uh, can sign up to? That would be a very interesting uh, offer to their members. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Slamming Aki. Great way to go. Will the minister put out uh, a new risk? Sorry, Senator, uh, on a point of order, Senator. That, that's debate. It's not the question. Can, the, can you please call them to the question? Uh, Senator Dunningham, I've called you for your second supplementary. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, President. I uh, refer to the minister's uh, characterisation in the negative of Aki in his last answer. Will the government put out a new risk fixing their calculations? Uh, Senator Dunningham, I've got the, uh, Senator Wong on her feet. I again, uh, point of order. That is commentary. If he wants to give a speech, he can do so later. Uh, you've got a plethora of people, but I'm going to take your uh, point of order, Senator Birmingham. Thank, thank, thank you, President. Uh, On sorry, the... Senator Birmingham, not until your side is quiet. You have your leader on his feet. Minute. Senator Birmingham. Order from the Leader of the Government in the Senate. It would make a mockery of the concept of supplementary questions if a senator were not able to commence a supplementary question by referring directly to what the minister had just uh, said you, in senator the preceding Birmingham. answer. Thank you, so senator, senator Wong's Birmingham. point of order has thank no you. basis. Please present. resume your seat. Order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham. I will note it has been the custom in this place for senators from both sides or well, all over the parliament to make comments uh, leading into their first and second supplementary. So if we're going to call it to order, it's for order for everyone. Senator Dunningham, uh, second supplementary. Thank you for your ruling, uh, President. And, uh, Having made that point twice, will the government put out a new RIS fixing their calculations and referencing errors with the spiritual healer, or does the minister contend the RIS is right? 
Minister Watt. I'll tell you what's right about the RIS, and I'd like to read from the RIS, which Senator says Cash. the significant benefits of being covered by an enterprise agreement and the costs that may be associated with remaining covered by a modern award outweigh the additional cost for businesses to engage with the new multi-enterprise bargaining streams. You forgot Order. to read that bit of the RIS, didn't you? You forgot to read the bit that says that uh, businesses— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Um. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, Senator Dunningham also forgot to read the bit of the RIS that says that businesses are often covered by multiple modern awards, which can be complicated and difficult to interpret. An enterprise agreement enables an employer to have one industrial instrument which applies to a business, which simplifies their workplace relations arrangements. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to have an industrial relations system which provides a simple Order. method for small businesses to participate uh, Watt, in an agreement that is negotiated? Once again, order. Uh, Minister Watt. This is question time. If you wish to make a contribution, uh, there are plenty of other times to make the contribution throughout the week. The question has been asked. I've called the minister to answer it, and I expect him to be heard in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. So it is interesting that the, the opposition chooses to cherry pick from the RIS, but leaves out all the bits that talk about the benefits to business, the benefits to workers, the benefits to the economy of pursuing this. And we make no apologies for uh, doing things you, to give Senator workers White, a pay rise and small has business expired. simplicity. Uh, Senator Billet. Senator Billet. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Ahead of the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women on 25 November and the 16 days of activism that follow, can the minister update the Senate on the importance of addressing gender-based violence? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question and for raising this uh, matter today. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is an important day for us to acknowledge one of the widespread human rights abuses that exist worldwide. This day also commences the 16 days of activism. We mark this day as part of a global call to action to end violence against women. Worldwide, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. This is even higher when including sexual harassment. And this statistic is mirrored by the Australian experience, where one in three women have experienced violence by an intimate partner. One woman dies every 10 days in Australia at the hands of her former or current partner, and one in two women in Australia have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. First Nations women are 11 times more likely to be killed due to experiencing family violence than non-Indigenous women, and are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised as the result of this violence. We know that this violence is compounded for women from some backgrounds who also experience other forms of discrimination like ableism, homophobia and racism, and that it just doesn't have a human cost. It also costs the economy at $26 billion a year, half of which is borne by the victims themselves. This violence against women and children is not inevitable, and we can and must take action to end it. It's why we're working with states and territories on a collective goal to end violence against women and children in a generation through the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022 to 2032 that was released on 17 October this year and agreed by the Commonwealth states and territories. President, together we can take action to achieve an Australia and a world where all women and girls live free from fear and violence. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick. First supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. Can you outline what the Albanese government is doing to address gender-based violence for us? Minister. Thank you, President. Thanks, Senator Billick, for the supplementary. The government is already taking action to support the national plan. Through the national plan, $1.7 billion of investment through the recent budget to support initiatives under the national plan, including funding for consent and respectful relationships education and 500 frontline service and community workers to support women and children experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence. That was a policy designed and advocated for by my colleague Senator McAllister in the previous term of parliament. We've also intro introduced family, uh, paid family and domestic violence leave. We're implementing the recommendations, all of them from Respect at Work report, including legislating a positive duty on employers to provide workplaces free of harassment. 
We're investing $1.6 billion from the returns of the Housing Australia Future Fund, including to support women es escaping DV and, and older women at risk of homelessness. And we're also developing a standalone First Nations national plan for family safety Thank under the Minister, leadership of Minister Burney and Minister Rishworth. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you outline what role we all have to play in achieving an Australia free from gender-based violence? Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Billick. While we are proud to be investing record Commonwealth funding to end, end gender-based violence, we know we cannot end it and do it alone. The National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children provides a blueprint for our collective action and outlines the shared role we all have to play in ending violence against women. It's a joint initiative. Um, the National Plan also highlights that everyone must play a role in ending this violence across government, communities, workplace, sporting organisations, business and the media. If we all pull in the same direction, pull together, change is possible. Can I also just put on the record my uh, support and uh, respect for all of the advocates who have been working year after year, day after day, uh, to uh, end violence against women and children and to make sure that the issue of ending violence against women and children is never off the national agenda. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Minister, the tourism industry directly employed over 666,000 Australians in the June quarter of this year, many of them being small business operators. Under Labor's extreme IR changes, could a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula employing 20 staff be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula due to them being in the same industry and geographical location? Minister Farrell. Oh. Thank you. Senator Wong? Uh, just on a point of order, I, I have not intervened given the political contest here, and I understand it's an, a point of order. I'm making a point uh, of order. Senator Henderson, I've called Senator Wong on a point She's of order. Me. Resume your seat. Excuse me. Senator Henderson, I'm the president. I've called the Senator Wong to her feet. She's making the point of order. And you're interject interjecting, Senator Wong. Thank you. The, the point of order goes to whether the question is in order, given the, where the bill is. Uh, I have not intervened to date because I understand that, you know, that the policy and politics of the issue is in a matter that, uh, uh, that the Senate has historically and uh, continued to question, uh, even when legislation is before the Senate, notwithstanding that the uh, the standing orders. Uh, but I may have misheard Senator Henderson, but I, I thought she direct directly went to the legislation, in which case I would assert it is out of order in the current terms. And I, but, the, but the way I would deal with it, because I understand the issue, Senator Birmingham, is if that is the case, I would invite her to rephrase. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, just, uh, just before you rule on the point of order, uh, I do note that indeed on Tuesday of this week, yes. uh, the government themselves yes. asked a question related to this legislation. Uh, I further note uh, that, uh, that indeed you and previous presidents have ruled broadly in relation uh, to these questions about anticipation of Senate business uh, and would encourage you to uphold your and previous rulings about that breadth of questioning that is available to senators. Uh, I'll just take some advice, Senator Birmingham, because I thought the question was not confined to Senator Farrell's area, but I'll take advice. Uh, in relation to the point of order, I'm advised that um, if the question went generally to policy issues, then it would be uh, reasonable to ask Senator Farrell to answer it. But the, policy, but the question, in my view, did go to details because it sought a comparison uh, under an aspect of the proposed bill that uh, related one type of business to another type of business. So I can invite 
Senator Farrell to uh, answer the broad policy nature of that question. Uh, Senator, uh, sorry, Senator Henderson, I've got Senator Wong on her feet, and then I'll come to you. Yeah, I, I will simply say we would give leave to rephrase. Uh, rather than going to Senator Farrell, if that is convenient to the opposition. Thank you. So the advice from Senator Wong is um, she is perfectly fine if you wish to rephrase the question, um, rather than it go to Senator Farrell, because it does detail. With, it does uh, go to detail. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I thank you, Madam President. Um, Senator Farrell, how would these changes? impact on a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula, employing 20 staff, um, compared with a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula with respect to multi-employer bargaining uh, due to these two businesses being in the same industry and geographical location? And obviously, I'm asking specifically in relation to the tourism industry. Uh, I do believe, Senator, that is, <laughs> Senator Henderson, that is the same a question simply reframed, but I have Senator Wong on her feet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, I would contest that in terms of the way in which rulings on these matters have been held previously, and it has been clear, as I said, and Hodges states, the rule concerning anticipation is not interpreted narrowly, because if it were, it would block questions on a wide variety of subjects, indeed none other than Former Senator John Faulkner has argued previously about the broad interpretation taken in relation to this. Uh, the Senator's question relates to policies and reforms of the government. Uh, she's asking about those policies, reforms and changes. She has not referenced specific legislation either in her first go at the question nor in her rewording of the question. Senator Wong? Uh, in response to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, I think the difficulty here is that the Senator repeated precisely the words to which I responded, which is these changes. It's clearly the case that she is saying these changes, meaning the legislation which is before the chamber, uh, and as such I, I, I would submit, needs to be rephased to be compliant with uh, Standing Order 73. I am uh, going to rule. I we will seek further advice uh, after question time, Senator Birmingham. But I think, uh, Senator Henderson, I'm speaking. Please resume your seat. I, Senator Henderson, I will come to you. Um, I think, as I gave my first answer, I think if it's around the broad policy, it's uh, at the invitation of Senator Farrell to answer. And I'll, I remain with that response, but I am happy to take further advice after question time. Senator Henderson, did you have a point of order? Uh, just, I was just asking uh, if I could be given an opportunity to rephrase in light yes, of your further the, the, clarification. Yes, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Senator Farrell, in light of the government's extreme IR policies, could a cafe on the Mornington Peninsula employing 20 staff be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a large hotel in the Mornington Peninsula due to them being in the same industry and geographical location? Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, President, and I thank uh, uh, Senator Henderson for her question. <coughs> um, Look, I totally reject your uh, description of this legislation as extreme. Uh, the Labor Party went to the last. The, La the Labor Party went to the last election saying Order. we were going to lift the wages uh, of Australians and, in particular, low-paid Australians, and that's what this legislation does. <laughs> now, if I if I was a small business. Um, operating a cafe or, for that matter, a hotel in the, uh, in the Mornington Peninsula, I would be delighted with this legislation because I would know, I would know that for the first time in 10 years, for the first time in 10 years, low-paid workers will have an opportunity to lift their wages. We know, we know, from, we know from what the former leader of the uh, government in the Senate said that low wages, no wages, was a designed feature of the Liberal Party's policy. A design, a designed feature of the Labor Party's policy Order. is uh, lifting Minister the wages. Farrell, please resume your seat, um, Senator Henderson. Um, 
Madam President, a point of order on direct relevance. I was asking the minister uh, to answer the question in relation to the two, two businesses. Uh, could they be compelled into multi-employer yeah. multi bargaining? Thank you. So, could the minister please Thank you, directly uh, address that? Senator Henderson, Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, on the point of order, uh, the uh, question actually put a hypothetical, uh, which also was not in order. But given the um, what we'd already gone through to try and get to a question previously, I didn't take a point of order on that. But it would be unsurprising if the minister answers in slightly broader terms, given you put a hypothetical to it. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I'll remind Minister Farrell of the question, uh, and I note that he uh, started down that path, but uh, probably got distracted by the disorder that was in the chamber. But Minister Farrell, um, please well, direct President, yourself to the question. Now, if I was an operator in the tourism um, industry in the uh, Morning Peninsula, I'm regrettably not, but uh, it would be a lovely place to be uh, operating. Um, I'd, I, would, I, would be saying, I would be saying to all of our community, what's going to help tourism in my community? What's going to help tourism in my community? Uh, that's going to be more people coming out and coming into my cafe and coming into my hotel. Um, and how is that going to occur? How is that going to occur? That is by lifting the wages of all of the people in that community. And as we, as we lift the wages, of those as we lift the wages. Look, I know, Senator Cash, I know you don't accept these fundamental. Uh, thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, I take your answer to mean that these businesses could be compelled to bargain together. And I ask, under Labor's extreme IR policies, could a local winery employing 20 staff on the Ballerine Peninsula be compelled into multi employer bargaining? Alongside a local pub in Port Arlington, Victoria, due to oh, being in the same you. industry and um, geographical location. Senator Henderson, please resume your seat. Minister. Uh, point of order, uh, President. I understand. I remember there is a standing order which prevents hypothetical questions. Uh, these, both of these questions, have been hypothetical questions, as in, would a, would a this or would a that, a hypothetical oh, in order. nature. Order. Order. I know the wage cutters over there don't like being held to standing Order. orders. Uh, but, Senator Watt, you know. please resume your seat. Um, Minister Birmingham, on the same point of order. Same point of order, President. Australian businesses only wish that Labor's policies uh, were Senator hypothetical. Birmingham, that is the sad not a reality point of order. Resume, is resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Uh, on a point of order, Senator Gallagher. Same point of order. Um, President, I think if you look at Standing Order 73-1G uh, around rules for questions, it's very clear that questions that contain hypothetical matter should, are not in order. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senators. Um, 73-1G does go to hypothetical, but the, the question that Senator Henderson asked was around policy, and I'm going to allow the question. Um, Senator Henderson, I'm not quite sure if you finished your question. I think you were midway and you got sat down. So if you can ask the question again, please. And I've asked—thank thank you, Senator Ayres. I'm going to reset the clock. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Madam President. Um, as I say, I take, Minister, um, your answer to mean that these business businesses could be compelled to bargain together. And I ask under Labor's extreme IR policies, uh, could a local winery employing 20 staff on the Ballerine Peninsula, where I live, be compelled into multi-employer bargaining alongside a local pub in Port Arlington, Victoria, due to being in the same industry and geographical location. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, President. And I thank, uh, thank uh, uh, Senator Henderson for her uh, supplementary uh, question. And uh, I, I totally reject you putting words into my mouth. Um, I'm happy if you quote. I'm happy if you quote. I'm happy if you quote what I say. Senator Cash, um, Senator as, McGrath. As my answer, I reject. I reject the words that you're trying to put into my, into my mouth. I also fundamentally reject your suggestion that this 
uh, legislation is extreme. This is not extreme legislation. This is legislation. Legislation. We we told the Australian people at the last election, and that includes all uh, of the Senator tourism Farrell, operators. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Point of order on direct relevance. I asked the minister um, in relation to the compulsion between two businesses uh, whether they are compelled to engage in multi employer bargaining. Could the minister address the uh, question? Senator please? Henderson, you also had a political statement at the front of that uh, before that question, and I do believe that the minister is being uh, relevant. Thank you, Minister. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And, uh, uh, look, look. For, for a government, when you're in government, you totally let down the tourism industry right. in this country. Right. For you now, for you now to be saying, Thank you, for you now, Farrell, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, second supplementary order. Second supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Minister, after two years of COVID impacting Australia's tourism industry, when the former coalition government did so much for the tourism industry. An industry now suffering labour shortages. Why is the Labor government bringing in extreme IR laws, which employers, including tourism operators in Victoria, have said will make it harder Order. for them to employ people? Thank you, Senator Henderson. And Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Henderson, for your uh, second supplementary uh, question. Are you kidding? Are you, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? What, what your government, what your government did, uh, Minister Farrell? Order, 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 order. I have a senator on her feet. Thank Minister Watt. Senator Henderson. Oh, Madam President, I'm not kidding. I'm very serious, but I would ask As that what, the minister direct the, his comments through you the have chair. A point of order. Thank yes, you. thank you. I remind the um, minister of the question. Order, minister, please answer the question. President, <coughs> thank you. Order. It's all about Sarah. Senator Watt. Thank Mr. you, Farrell. thank you, President, and I will direct my comments uh, to the chair. But I will also direct them to all of those people over there who totally let down the tourism industry in this country. We're finally, we're finally starting the rebuild of the tourism industry. Whether it's a cafe on the Bellarine Peninsula, a hotel on the Bellarine Peninsula, we're lifting their wages and we're starting the rebuild. You left this industry for dead. You cut JobKeeper when you should have kept it going. You kicked out. You kicked out. Yep, Minister yep. Farrell. Yes, you were giving it to all your big mates. Order. Thank you. Were, you you were giving Farrell. it to your mates when Minister you should have been Farrell, giving it. Minister Farrell, resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to Senator McAllister, representing the Environment Minister. In recent weeks, Australians were shocked and bloody angry when news broke. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, Senator McAllister is an assistant minister. Do you wish to redirect? Assistant ministers don't take questions. I'm happy to go to Senator I'll, I'll Pratt and come back to you if you want. No, no, you're, uh, you're right. I'll, I'll just make it more, more broad. My question is to the senator representing the Environment Minister. Well, Senator Wish Wilson, I don't know who that is, so you well, need well, to be direct. Well I, well, I don't either, actually. Given, given Senator Farrell was on a, uh, a rare moment of uh, a role and animation, I might direct Order. it to him. Order. I actually don't know, President. Order. Uh, Oh, Senator Wong. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Senator Wong, in, in, in recent weeks, Australians were shocked and bloody angry when news broke that the soft plastics recovery scheme run by Red Cycle had collapsed, with billions of tonnes of plastic packaging being stored in warehouses rather than being recycled. Australians who were doing the right thing taking plastic packaging back to supermarkets where it was purchased, rightly had expectations that big business and government would live up to their end of the bargain and see these plastics, which are so commonly found and dangerous in our oceans, recycled. 
Uh, Minister Plibersek herself expressed frustration at the news, saying it shouldn't be beyond big companies like Coles and Woolworths to come up with a viable solution to soft plastic recycling. Senator, why is it seemingly beyond these big business companies to do this, to sort out their mess, and what is your government now planning to do to hold them to account? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Um President, and thank you, thank you for the question. And I acknowledge there's uh, quite a lot of representing ministers here, so I understand the, the mistake that was made. Um, uh, can I just say first, uh, we we share uh, your and many Austra the frustration of many Australians with uh, what has occurred uh, in the soft plastics recycling sector. Uh, I know. Personally, in our household and in many households, people who did the right thing uh, and made sure that they put their soft plastics together in a big bag and took them down to the local uh, supermarket uh, in the hope that you know, we might actually reduce the amount of soft plastics in the environment, uh, were very, very disappointed uh, by the news that uh, the, the you know, it was, it was, you know, the, the, the financial position the industry was in, but also the, the lack of results. Um, I was asked a question about why is it beyond big business. Well, I, I, I guess you'd have to ask them. Uh, what I can say is uh, it's clear that the regulatory settings uh, that were in place and the incentives which, which were in place, uh, whether they are government or market driven, were insufficient for that sector to work. Uh, we know uh, that there, there is uh, not just environmental but economic benefit uh, in recycling as opposed to landfill. Uh, and I, and knowing uh, Ms Plibersek as I do and her determination uh, as environment minister to take action on this, I've no doubt she will look very carefully at what is the best way forward. Uh, uh, this is an issue where I would say to the um, industry that these Australians are clear in terms of their behaviours, uh, what, what they want to do, uh, and uh, it would be uh, a good thing if the market could respond to the, uh, that incentive, which is people want to do the right thing. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Wishwilson, first supplementary. Uh, the Environment Department has said multiple times in estimates it will likely know by the end of this year whether Australia will meet our 2025 packaging waste reduction and recycling targets facilitated by the big business-led uh, Australian Packaging Covenant. Well, it's the end of the year, Minister, and this is a significant matter of public interest, as you just uh, mentioned. Can the government now provide to the Senate and to the Australian people an update on whether we will meet our 2025 packaging targets? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wong. Uh, well, first, uh, the, the um, senator um, you know, was critical of the targets. Um, what I understand is we're a long way from, me even from meeting them. Uh, the, the note I have in front of me, and I'll confirm this, is that the target of 70 per cent of plastic packaging uh, was set for 2025, and Australia has been stuck at 16 per cent for four years. Now, I don't know if that's going to be worsened by the subsequent industry uh, uh, you know, collapse or challenges that you've described. Uh, clearly, uh, nine years of a coalition government who didn't want to do anything on this uh, uh, has, has meant we're a long way behind. Well, you can, Senator Henderson, I'd like you to explain to us then why, if you set a target for 70 per cent and announced it, why we're still stuck at 16 per cent. I think I mean, the, the problem with the, the coalition is they, they seem to think if you announce something, it magically happens. Well, transitions and, and policy take a bit more work than that. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, second supplementary. Uh, thanks, uh, Senator. It sounds like yet another failed plastic waste reduction and recycling scheme, based on what you've said. Um, so I suppose my question is in what is it going to take for your government to accept that after 25 years of repeated failures to reduce plastic packaging waste, uh, that a voluntary approach that relies on the goodwill of big business to do the right thing doesn't work and that you actually need to now regulate the package industry and give actual consequences for failure. Here, here. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Well, Minister Senator Wong. Wish Wilson, I come from the state of South Australia and you might remember the arguments over, I think it was called container deposit legislation, and we ended up going it alone because uh, and, and frankly it, it, it proved to be the right uh, response. Uh, if I could just go through what I understand that, that we have done in the six months we've been in office. Uh, there's a, a six, $250 million investment in infrastructure to sort, process and remanufacture materials, including $60 million in the recent budget 
for hard to recycle plastics such, such as soft plastics. The minister has added plastics from medical waste, mattress and tyres to the minister's priorities list. L listing these products is a signal to industry signal to industry to act, and if not, then obviously government can. In October, Minister Plibersek led the Environment Minister's agreement to reform the regulation of packaging by 2025. Now, obviously there is more work to do, uh, but we, we understand how important this is, not just for the environment, but actually for Australians. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing and Homelessness, Senator Farrell. Can the minister explain how regional Australia is benefiting from the Albanese government's housing agenda? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pratt for her question. Um, it's a very important question, and it's uh, pleasing to see some sensible policy questions being asked here today. Um, and we know we know that far too many Australians are struggling to buy a home and that Australians living in regional areas have faced some of the largest drops in housing affordability, making it increasingly hard for locals uh, to save a sufficient deposit. After almost a decade of inaction, the Albanese government is finally showing national leadership to help get more regional Australians into their first home. The Albanese government acted to deliver on our commitment to establish the regional first home buyers guarantee um, in, uh, by October, three months earlier than, uh, than promised. 10,000 places will be available each financial year through the regional uh, first home buyer guarantee to support regional first home buyers to purchasing new or existing homes uh, with a deposit of as little as 5%. To be eligible uh, the regional, to, for the uh, regional uh, first home buyer guarantee, applicants must be Australian citizens, uh, must purchase outside a capital city uh, and must demonstrate that they have been living in the region in which they are purchasing the property for at least uh, 12 months. The regional guarantee is part of the uh, Albanese government's ambitious housing reform agenda, Madam uh, President, to support people into home ownership and improve the supply and the quality of social and affordable housing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. Can the minister provide an update on the number of Australians who have accessed the regional first home buyer guarantee to date? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Pratt for her genuine interest uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. Um, the Albanese government has, of course, hit the ground running on housing and is delivering immediate action with the regional first home buyers guarantee. Since being launched early uh, on the 1st of October this year, over 1,000 regional Australians have been assisted into, yes, 1,000 have been assisted into home ownership um, by, this, uh, by this guarantee. I recently saw the story of Abby and Corin and their baby McKinnon, who live in Townsville. Um, and uh, they, of course, uh, had the opportunity to uh, access uh, this, uh, this project or this program uh, and uh, now expect that uh, by Christmas, uh, they will be uh, moving into their you, uh, new Senator home. Time has expired. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister explain how this program supports the Albanese government's broader housing agenda? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can uh, explain uh, that uh, question to you. A very sensible question. Uh, alongside the regional first home buyer guarantee, the Albanese government will deliver the National Housing Accord, will deliver the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. We've unlocked $575 million in funding from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility. 
The, housing, the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council will provide independent advice uh, to the government. Uh, we will have a national housing and homelessness plan uh, and we will implement the Help to Buy scheme. All of our housing policies are targeted to ensure more Australians have a safe place to call home, including regional first you, home Senator buyer Bell, your guarantee. Time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Uh, the government has budgeted national urgent care clinics with three promises to be established in Tasmania. Is the government going to honour that promise? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. President, I thank Senator Tyrrell for her question and her interest in um, health and health services in Tasmania. Um, the urgent care clinics are a new model of care that we committed to in the election, and Senator Tyrrell is correct to say that there were three um, committed to um, in locations in Tasmania as part of that campaign, and the commitments were in Burnie, Launceston and Hobart. I understand the Premier of Tasmania has requested that the Burnie clinic be in Davenport or the Latrobe region, which was agreed to as well. So I think, um, yes, the, the very short answer to your question is yes, they will be delivered. Um, we are working with states and territories on uh, finalising the model, uh, and we'll go through that work. But the money was provided in the budget to deliver on the commitment we made, which was 50 urgent care clinics. Subsequent to making that commitment, New South Wales and Victoria have uh, supplemented um, and provided funding, I think, in the order of $100 million um, for um, clinics in their states. And so we've added in some money on top of the uh, original commitment to work with them to get the model right. But it is an exciting model. Um, I know that um, here in the ACT it's a different model, uh, but we had um, walk nurse led walk in centres which provided a bit of the gap between emergency departments and out of hours care, particularly for those uh, not needing to head to the hospital. They've been very, very popular with the local community here, and we think that model can be built upon, but with obviously with general practice as key participants. Um, so we will deliver it. We're working with states and territories to refine the model, um, and of course, working with general practice across the country as well uh, to make sure it aligns uh, with their priorities as well. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Given the serious shortages of GPs and nursing staff in Tasmania, um, how are we going to ensure that these three clinics will be fully staffed and resourced? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, yes, so working with the, um, the relevant state is a really important part of that, so on workforce more broadly in the area of health care, which is why I think um, the what, what works in New South Wales and Victoria will assist in the rollout of the clinics nationally as well, and how that can uh, complement state workforce with um, and what they're doing with what primary care needs. But you're right; it, it on itself, it, urgent care clinics on their own are not going to solve some of the issues because of the issues um, in remote and rural parts of the country, and that's why it has to be part of the other commitments we've made, which is you know, like the um, investment in strengthening Medicare fund, which we've got the task force in place, um, working with primary care, essentially rebuilding primary care, which is under so much strain, looking at the role delineation within primary care, so nurse practitioners and the work they do, and the announcement around uh, meeting the HECS debts for um, for health practitioners Thank to work Minister, in the region is also part of it. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. All right, serious question now. When? When are we going to get them? Minister. Uh, so we've we've committed to them over the uh, first term. In fact, we've profiled the money in this financial year. Uh, so the intention is to get them up and running as soon as possible, um, um, working with uh, the jurisdictions and with primary care. Um, it, it might be that there's different starts in different jurisdictions as, it, as they get rolled out, but the, we, we completely understand that this support needs to flow, um, but it's not something the federal government can do on its own. So the money's there. It's profiled in that first year. We're going to work in partnership um, with those jurisdictions that want to, um, and those obviously those other investments um, like the one to support um, staff, 
um, that I talked about starting January this year, the Strengthening Medicare Task Force is in place and the grants going to um, GPs, the $220 million worth of grants to help them accommodate the, their workload is also uh, funded in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. The Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office says the suburban rail loop would cost $36.5 billion for Stage 1 and $125 billion for the full project. At Senate estimates on 28 October, infrastructure department officials gave evidence the funding available for the suburban rail loop included, and I quote, $11 billion from the state, $11 billion through some kind of value capture, and $2.2 billion from the Commonwealth. Announced funding adds up to only $25 billion. Order. In the Australian Financial Review today, Premier Andrews is quoted saying the suburban rail loop is fully funded and underway. Minister, what advice, other than the Australian Financial Review, has the Victorian government provided that the suburban rail loop is fully funded? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Wong? Just a point of order on uh, this. I can't remember which. Well, I don't think that that's a point of order, Senator Harris, but uh, I, don't, I, I might have misheard. Uh, but it seemed to me the question does not go to a, a ministerial portfolio. A question about the, set the state government's sources of advice and how the state government came to a position is not a matter for a Commonwealth minister. Um, Senator Birmingham, on the point of order. Pre President, on the, uh, on the point of order, order. Senator Van directly quoted evidence from departmental officials at Senate estimates. The question goes to assurances given to the Commonwealth. This is a government that has decided to give $2.3 billion, $2 billion um, to Birmingham, what's a the, project. What's it's the perfectly point of reasonable order? to ask with this project whether in giving that budget commitment they're aware if it's fully funded or not. Uh, thank you. Order. Senator Wong, on the, is it on the same point of order? Order. Order. It just needs to be rephrased. You can't ask a Order. Thank you. I'm going to respond to the points of order. Senator Watt can answer that question to the extent that it covers his Commonwealth responsibilities, bearing in mind that the question referenced uh, the Victorian Budget Office and the AFR. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, and yes, we, we do mo maybe need Senator Smith to run his eye over some of those questions to make sure they comply with standing orders. Something that we know he takes very seriously. Um, the suburban rail loop is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure project, and we're doing something that the former government never chose to do, which is to honour election commitments. Remember that funny old tradition of honouring your Senator election McKenzie. commitments? I know that it didn't happen under you, Bob, but we actually take these things seriously. We went to the people with uh, an election Senator, commitment uh, to spend— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. I'm asking those, particularly on my left, to listen to the answer in silence. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator President. Ayers. The uh, we went to the election with a very clear commitment to spend $2.2 billion towards early works for the suburban rail loop east. Uh, and that was on the back of the fact that the Victorian government had prepared a detailed business and investment case for the suburban rail loop, uh, which was released last uh, year Senator and McGrath. demonstrated a cost-benefit ratio of up to 1.7, um, meaning a dollar— please resume your seat. Um, Senator McKenzie. A uh, point of order on relevance. Senator Watt is simply reading out the talking points that he's read out uh, all Senator week. McKenzie, that is the not a point of order. Relevant. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Right, well, let's just get straight to the point of order. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. On relevance, the question went to quoting Senate estimates evidence at our Rural and Regional Affairs Transport Committee where departmental officials listed how much 
the government has actually put on the table in their budget for this project, which is directly uh, you, contradicted McKenzie. by the Premier of Victoria. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. The question went to the rail project and estimates, and the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, President. Now, I know that the opposition chooses to ignore this, but repeatedly we have made the point that the business case provided by the Victorian government demonstrates a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7, which means that $1.70 would be returned for every $1 investment. Now, it's interesting that the opposition is so hung up. Uh, on projects and, and involvement with state governments and things like that, because it wasn't that long ago that the former Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, someone I know they all choose to forget and don't pretend was never a member, member of their party, he announced that the Commonwealth would commit $5 billion to the Melbourne Airport Rail Link project without even speaking to the Victorian Premier first. Uh, and in March this year, the in March this year, the coalition announced a $1.6 billion commitment for the direct rail line from Brisbane to the Sunshine Coast, which Order. the Queensland government described as Order. a bit of a surprise, and the money appeared pl plucked out of the sky. So again, if we're seriously going to be relying on the Liberal and the National Order. Party to lecture people about appropriate Senator spending McGrath. of public money, then we're going to be having to wait a fair while for that. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Van, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, has the Victorian government provided any evidence or assurance to the Albanese government that the, de that the Premier Andrews' controversial suburban rail loop is fully funded? Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. I have every confidence in the Victorian government's uh, commitment to build. That's five uh, seconds. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, when there's order on my left, I have a senator on his feet. When, when there is order on my left, Senator Van. Point of order on relevance. We, I didn't ask about your assurances. I asked about evidence. Uh, thank you, Senator Van. The, uh, with respect, the minister was about five seconds into his answer, so we'll listen. I thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Thank you, President. And things have got pretty grave in the Victorian campaign uh, when Senator Van is the person who's being turned to to rescue the Liberal Party in Victoria. Uh, as I say, I have every confidence uh, that the Victorian government um, will. Oh, I know. here we go. Senator Watt. <laughs> Order. 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 Order on my left and right. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Henderson. Madam President, um, that was a really inappropriate reflection on the senator in this place, and I would ask the member to withdraw that comment. Uh, if it, I don't believe it was a personal reflection, but if it assists the Senate, I'm sure Senator Watt will withdraw. Thank you, Senator Watt. I withdraw. Senator Scar. Because I do. <laughs> Look, I know it's hard to hear facts. I know it's hard to hear about governments that actually do things by the book. I, ha I know it's hard to hear about governments that invest uh, based on Watt. business cases. Uh, look at Senator all that. Remember all those business cases that didn't exist? Uh, Senator Watt, that's what, please that's resume what the your seat. Senator Watt. Uh, Senator McGrath, your incessant interjections are incredibly disorderly. And Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. So, as I say, there's a business case that's provided by the Liberal Party and the National uh, Party, Senator and Watt. I don't think it can be a prop because it's a blank piece of paper. I'm not sure that that constitutes a prop, because that's the extent of the business cases that we used to see from the Liberal and the National Party when it came to investing in projects. In contrast, the Victorian government has put forward a business case which demonstrates this is a good project, uh, and uh, we have every intention of getting behind it. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Stirl. Oh, sorry, Senator Van. It's been so long since you've been on your feet. Second supplementary. <laughs> I was on my feet yesterday. So long. Minister, if the Victorian Premier is saying the suburban rail loop project is fully funded, can the minister advise the Senate on how much each government is contributing and will the government provide a commitment that no additional Commonwealth dollars will be provided to the project? Minister Watt. Well, Senator Van knows full well, and I have already said 
that what our McGrath. government has committed is $2.2 billion towards this project. Uh, we, we, know, we know that the Victorian government has committed funding of its own. We know that this is a project that will take some time to complete. And you know why it will take Senator some time McKenzie. to complete? It's because the former government didn't want to invest in public transport infrastructure. So now we're getting on with the job of actually investing this. Uh, it will take till 2035 to complete the project, and that will require Senator, uh, future uh, budget, budget decisions. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, I'm asking you to listen quietly, particularly senators on my left. Minister Watt, please resume. Senator Mackenzie, I've just asked for quiet, and you immediately interject again. Minister Watt. <laughs> Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I say, we know that for 10 years we had a government in Canberra that didn't want to invest in public transport infrastructure. That has changed. We now have an Albanese Labor government that is prepared to get behind big infrastructure projects that will help with public Senator transport con and relieving congestion. Senator McGrath. Minister, please. Oh, Senator Searle, on a point of order. If you're still going, President, I'll wait. I'll wait. Minister Watt. The, uh, the, so, as I say, we're, we're getting behind public transport infrastructure in Melbourne. Remember, it was the last government that pulled out the funding for Cross River Rail in Brisbane as well. They didn't want to see public transport infrastructure there. You were the finance minister. Uh, you minister could have got Watt. behind this and you minister didn't do Watt. it. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Order. Um, I'm misleading the Senate. The Albanese government didn't even fund the Great Ocean Senator, Road Senator Henderson, when they were last in government. As I explained yesterday, there are many opportunities throughout the week in the Senate to debate points. That's a debating point. Please resume your seat. Minister Watt. Not after you want. So. Have you, Minister Watt? Um, so it must hurt the, Victoria, the, the opposition, especially those Victorians who've, who've fought in tooth and nail against Senator this project. McGrath, but seriously. we're going to get this project done because we want to relieve congestion in Melbourne, just like we want to relieve it in Brisbane and Sydney and in even Minister provincial Watt. cities. Minister Senator Watt, McKenzie. Your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Searle. Okay. Thank you, President. Yep. My question Order. is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The Albanese government has committed to getting wages moving with its workplace relations policies, which will provide Australians with job security, gender equity and sustainable wage growth, after a decade of neglect by the Liberals and Nationals. Can the minister please outline the benefits of these policies to both Australian workers and businesses? Why is it important to get wages moving? Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl, another one of our uh, comrades over here who has spent a lot of time working uh, for, for working people right across the country. And we are unapologetic for standing up for working people in this country. Uh, I was hoping Watt. that we'd end the week uh, on, a, on, a, on a question from the government about our industrial relations reforms. Minister Watt. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. I would ask those again on my left to Stop with the shouting out. It is not a football match. It is question time. You are all being incredibly disorderly. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I say, I'm very happy that we're ending the week of question time speaking about the government's important industrial relations policies, uh, which are all about driving, helping people get a decent pay rise. Because if there's one thing that drives this uh, government, Senator McGrath. it's our ambition to deliver a decent pay rise for working Australians. And there are some pretty simple reasons why that is. Not just because Australian Senator workers both McGrath. need and deserve a pay rise, but also because good sustainable wage growth is good for our economy. Our policies provide workers on lower middle incomes facing the pressure of inflation and interest rates with a way to also get pay rises. And the best way to do this is by encouraging more agreements to be made and stop a race to the bottom on wages. But Australia's bargaining system has not worked effectively for a very long time. In fact, I would say for about 10 years. Only 15 per cent of employees are covered by an interim agreement, and we want to make more agreements that benefit both employers and workers rather than continue the conflict that we've seen over the last 10 years. 
Agreements allow trade-offs and provide a more simple and tailored set of conditions than the award, which benefits small Senator business. Grant. To give one example of how this benefits small business, Jane has been an early childhood educator for 40 years. She's now the director of an early childhood education centre in Melbourne. She is incredibly passionate about her job, but it's been a tough industry to dedicate her life to. As the director of her centre, she's faced constant struggles with staffing shortages due to low wages and conditions in the sector. Jane and her sector, along with workers in 70 other sectors in Victoria, now benefit from being part of a multi-employer agreement. And not only have they won wages up to 18 per cent above the award, Thank they've you, also Senator won more White, things like planning and professional development. Senator Stirl, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline how some of the commentary around the government's workplace relations policies is just plain wrong? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Stirl, and I'd love nothing more than to point out how some of the commentary about our policies are just plain wrong. For, ten, for nearly 10 years, wages were kept low as a deliberate design feature of the previous government's management of the economy. And the scare campaigns being run now by those with vested interests are good media fodder but are completely unfounded. Let's fact check some of the claims that have been made over the last couple of weeks by the coalition and some of their supporters. They, first of all, they say there will be coast-to-coast -coast strikes, ignoring the fact that nothing in relation to the system for industrial action at all changes compared to the system that was under the former government, except for the fact there will now be a requirement for conciliation first, an additional requirement before Order. industrial action occurs. There are claims made, being made that we'll see patent bargaining again. There's no changes compared to the legislation that existed under the former government. There's claims that businesses will be roped into industry-wide agreements. Plain wrong, and Senator Brockman got schooled on that yesterday. The fact is that an employer can choose to be part of multi-employer bargaining. Thank you, Minister White. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, President. Can the minister outline to the chamber the safeguards and benefits of the government's policies for small and medium-sized businesses? Uh, Minister Watt. I would love to do that, Senator Stirling. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to the Chamber about that. The Albanese Labor government's reforms and policies make bargaining more accessible for small and medium-sized businesses. It has been designed specifically to support those who are new to enterprise bargaining or are less equipped to navigate it. Small businesses often don't have the benefit of an HR department and can often be shut out of the benefits of enterprise bargaining that many medium and larger-sized businesses enjoy. For those small businesses Order. who do wish to bargain together, the cooperative bargaining stream is an attractive option as it's voluntary and they can opt into the stream at any time. And isn't it ironic that the party of choice and individual choice over there doesn't want to give Senator small McGrath. businesses the choice to opt in to cooperative bargaining? They're all for choice except Minister when it gives Watt, small businesses the choice. Senator McGrath, exercise some self-control, please, along with Senator Henderson. Minister Watt. Uh, and even when a small business uh, has employees who do want to have multi-employer bargaining, before that can occur it needs a majority of employees to agree. It needs the Fair Work Commission to find that there are common interests amongst Thank those you, employers. Minister this Watt, is your good time for workers and it's good for Minister Watt. Thank you. I ask further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of answers given during question time. Uh, I look around and I see an Australia that's getting smarter and smarter, an Australia that's getting tired of getting talked down to and controlled. And why is this? Union membership is hitting an all-time low, according, according to ABS statistics. Just 14 per cent of employees were trade union members, and we're well down on the 40 per cent of employees who were trade union members back in the 1990s. And although those opposite want to take our industrial relations laws back to the Hawke-Keating years, we do not live in the Hawke-Keating years, Senator Ayres. Despite this, the Labor Party is intent on pursuing an industrial relations policy that lives in a fantasy land where everyone's beholden to a union. And that's what opposite want. They want to take Australia backwards. And don't get me wrong, we on this side of the chamber want to change 
want, want change to Australia's industrial relations system. To quote the Leader of the Opposition in Parliament, we all have a genuine desire to improve our industrial relations system. What we don't want is a system of control that those opposite want, a system that wants to control workers, to control where they can work, control what they can earn, control their lives inside and outside the workplace. The industrial relations legislation that the Labor government has been trying to pass is some of the most radical in decades. If this government gets what it wants, or should I say what the union masters want, small business and the economy will suffer. Like most legislation from the Labor Party, it's small business that gets it hit hardest, because under Labor governments, small businesses are on their own. One of the most dangerous parts of Labor's new industrial relations bill is the prospect of multi-employer bargaining. If it goes ahead, small business will face the bargaining costs of $14,638. And don't take my word for it. This is according to the department's regulatory impact statement to the bill. Medium businesses would face costs of $75,148 and large businesses $94,311. Unlike Labor and their union hacks, who have never run a business in their life, I've actually run a business. And businesses know that they're hurting under this government. Didn't you come from a union, Senator Still? While businesses are stealing, uh, dealing with the Labor Party's 56 increase in power prices, those opposite might think that businesses have a spare four, 14 grand lying around. Well, wake up, they don't. Labor's proposed changes will move Australia's industrial relations system from bargaining done at enterprise level, also known as bargaining with the businesses where you work, to bargaining done across multiple workplaces and potentially across a whole industry. This would massively expand the power of trade unions, allowing them to operate in businesses they currently have no connection to. This includes tens of thousands of small businesses right across Australia. Under Labor's legislation, multiple sectors will be able to engage in crippling economy-wide strikes because unless those opposite realise, enterprise-wide bargaining will mean industry-wide strikes and the breakdown of the Australian economy. Don't you worry. If Labor's party, no, don't you, don't you worry, Senator Ayres. It's my time to be on my feet, so you can be quiet. If the Labor Party gets its way, the union thugs that don't protect will be breaking down the doors to small businesses and telling them what to do, because that's what Labor Party is all about, command and control, the attitude that we know how to run your life and run your business better than you do. Well, guess what? You don't. To conclude, Labor's dangerous industrial relations changes will mean more strikes, fewer jobs, giving unions unprecedented access to small businesses, which will lead to the death of hundreds of those small businesses. Senator Storr. President, you know, there's a saying there's only one van comes along in your lifetime, but I, I have to say, seriously, Senator the Van, you want to have a real good look, look at yourself, get a grip. When you start accusing us on this side of ever running businesses and being union thugs and union hacks, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history, Senator the Van, for your information. When I grew up in working class, the son of a truck driver, I'm now the father of a truck driver and I was a long distance truck driver myself. And nothing irks me more when uh, ill informed ignoramuses make stupid statements like this. Don't leave, Senator the Van, don't leave. I oh, please order, keep, give me an opportunity. Yes. Uh, I believe that was a reflection on me, and I also noted another one from Senator Ayres earlier, and I asked that both senators withdraw them. Is this another point of order? Well, I've, 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 let me deal with the first point of order. Well, he doesn't. This is not a debate, Sen Sen Senator Henderson. Uh, Senator Van, who is the second senator that you've taken issue with? Uh, uh, Senator Ayres. I didn't hear what Senator Ayres. Senator Ayres, do you wish to withdraw to the extent that? De 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 Deputy President, uh, if there's so much sensitivity over De there, De De if, don't if you're debate it. Either withdraw, withdraw it. Either I'm very happy to. I'm, I'm very it. happy right, to I withdraw. I want to get back to. Thank you. I'll take the withdrawal, Senator Stirl. I think Senator Stirl was referring generally to Liberals, but 
I'd ask him, just to the extent that it may have inferred directly to Senator Van, I'd ask him to graciously withdraw. Deputy President, if assist in your running of the chamber, I'm more than happy to assist you, you, but I will not resolve from the fact no, I've been accused of— withdrawal. Just please I have proceed. withdrawn. But I will not resolve from the fact that I take umbrage as he walks out the chamber, you weak link, I tell you, to have a crack at me as a union thug and a union union stoolie. You shouldn't reflect on whether a member is leaving the chamber or not. I'd ask you to withdraw that to the extent and then proceed with your contribution. Thank you. Senator Van, that was inappropriate as well. You go back to your chair and withdraw that. I happily withdraw, Deputy President. Right. Okay. Now, we're all ready to go. Senator Stirl, please Deputy, proceed. All good, Deputy President. Thank you very much. But I just want to stress this, Deputy President, through Don't you. Don't disappoint me. Just go with it. No, no. All cool. I'm all cool. I'm having a ball. Deputy President, I actually ran my own business. And this is what irks me through you, Deputy President, when I hear ideology and I hear ridiculous statements from people who have no idea who the background of others in this chamber. I, for one, can talk with authority. I actually left school early. I actually ran my own business. My wife and I put our necks on the line with one month's payment and, and a house to hock everything we had to buy our first truck. Six trucks later, and I'm proud as punch that we did that. I couldn't have done it without my wife. I couldn't have done it without the drive that I had. And to be accused of not knowing business really gets up my nose. So what we can see, and we can clearly see here, Senator the Van had, had, in the opening statement, came out, this is all about ideology. This has got nothing to do with providing an opportunity for lower paid workers to get a decent pay pack and to, get, to negotiate decent contracts. This is what really, really annoys me. And quite clearly, when I speak of this from authority, when we look at the likes of the bedwetters and the ones who are running around this country screaming out the last thing that we should be doing is going and pushing to change industrial relations laws so those that can't bargain collectively can actually have a chance to increase the opportunity to, to increase their pay packet and their working conditions. And who is this charge led by? Mr Deputy President, it is the usual suspects. Aki. Oh, I'd be so sad if Aki was missing because I think something's gone wrong. They've actually got some brains in that outfit. Business Council of Australia. Uh, Amma, Amma, and if Amma didn't start the fight, there's something really going. Guess who started the fight? Amma, and guess who else bought into it? None less than Mr. Alan Joyce and Qantas. Now, Senator Sheldon, you've got a massive pair of shoes to fill, and I can't fill them when you're talking about how bad an employer Qantas has come under Mr. Joyce's tenure. But I'll give it a good shot. Here we have a man that went out there. He's got his footprints etched in the blue carpet in this joint, running to the previous government's ministers, seeking support to give, us, to give him money to give to his employers. Work, uh, what was, oh, did he say work choices? I'm having a real nightmare today. Uh, a job, a job keeper, nearly a billion dollars. And what did it deliver? I tell you what it delivered. It kept Alan, Mr. Alan Joyce and Qantas and ably backed up by Mr Richard Goyer AO with his $560,000 sitting for as the chairman and God knows whatever else, to go out in the middle of the night and sack nearly 2,000 baggage handlers. And then I read in the paper today not only the fine comments from my colleague and my mate over here to my right, Senator Sheldon, that they have to upgrade their profit margin now. We've only been out of COVID, what, eight, seven or eight months or something, but they made a mistake. It's not, it, they have to up it by another $150 million. While Qantas is gouging the travellers of this nation, they're now saying that they're, going to, they're back in the red, anywhere between $1.4 and $1.5 billion. Now, I say to everyone in Australia, who thinks that Mr Alan Joyce has run a magnificent business since he's been in charge? And I can tell you now, and I look at my colleagues around this chamber from all sides, we spend more time on his plans than anyone. And I have no problem. I had no problem for many, many years as a transport workers' union organiser after I sold my truck, after doing two years non-stop at Darwin with two babies at home that I never got to see. I missed my daughter's first walking and talking. And I wasn't going to miss it with my six-year-old son to come off the road because the TWU gave me an opportunity. Because guess what? I actually know things about trucks. 
and I actually can put two words together, and I can actually talk to employers, and I can actually talk to employees, and I want nothing better when employers and employees can work together to deliver magnificent outcomes for both. Because without a successful business, you don't have the opportunity to have a successful wage for your employees, who I was so proud to join up into my union and join me so we could collectively bargain. And I have the greatest respect. I have absolutely no respect for Alan Joyce. And if you fly in this nation and you haven't been gouged, you haven't lost your baggage, you haven't been lied to while you're sitting on the tarmac, and then they're blaming baggage handlers, which I copped this morning, there wasn't even the baggage being put on, this is what really irks me. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of comments today by both Ministers Watt and Farrell. Well, it is very, very clear, colleagues, uh, that the old saying is true, leopards do not change their spots. It has taken very little time, in fact less than six months, for it to become crystal clear to the Australian public why Labor was in opposition for nearly a decade. It is so clear they have not yet learnt. And just as they have done before in government, they are taking our workplace relations system and our economy backwards at both at the same time. They simply cannot be trusted, not only on their word, but on their ability to manage our nation through challenging times. So what have we already seen in less than six months under a Labor government? We have an economy with high inflation, we have high interest rates, we've got a rising cost of living, and Labor has had to admit that electricity prices under their policies will go up 56 per cent and gas 44 per cent, all putting together unsustainable cost of living pressures on everyday Australians. They talk a lot about solutions, but they have done absolutely nothing this year in a policy sense to change any of that. And now the Albanese government's reckless attempts to change industrial relations laws will hit every single sector of our economy, and in particular on every single small business in our nation who are the absolute backbone of our economy. And they are going to be hit the hardest, and shame on Labor for that. So, the cost of bargaining under the Albanese government's radical shake-up of the industrial relations system was revealed at just under $15,000 for a small business and $75,000 for a medium business. How on earth is any small business going to find another $15,000 just to comply with what they are imposing on them? They, most of them will no doubt not be able to afford it. So let's have a look at the impact of this on my own home state of Western Australia. Well, the West Australian has reported that small businesses across WA could, if not will, be pushed to the brink if Labor's one-size-fits-all industrial relations omnibus bill is rammed through the federal parliament this and next week. And that is very, very clear. So now what does our own Premier the Premier of Western Australia, a Labor Premier, say about this. Is he backing small businesses? Is he backing West Australian families? Is he backing employers who are already doing it tough? Nope. Of course he is not backing any one of those groups in Western Australia. In fact, he says what we're saying about all these pressures are just scaremongering. Well, I tell you what, if he was a small businessman and had to put his hand in his pocket, with all of the other cost of living and cost of doing business expenses to find another $15,000 to comply with this, he would not see it as scaremongering because it is the truth. And a poll taken by the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Western Australia is the first in the country to reveal the true sentiment of Australian businesses uh, to these reforms. And it revealed this. More than nine in ten Western Australian businesses fear impending change to industrial relation laws, and only eight per cent said they were unconcerned by the changes. Thirty-four thousand workplaces would employ fewer staff if they were no longer able to set their own work conditions and were replaced by the Fair Work Commission. 
12,000 businesses would employ fewer people if limits on fixed-term contracts were put in place, as is proposed by those opposite. And more than four in ten businesses would scale down operations if forced into multi-employer bargaining or immediate bargaining for a new agreement when the existing one expires. This, more than any of the other destructive elements of their act, is the most duplicitous, because this was not in the Labor Party policy that they took to the election. They had a, a sort of a, a workforce uh, summit, and guess what? Surprise, surprise! This popped out of the union's mouths. The Labor Party said, "Oh, we didn't think of that before the election, but let's implement it and let's destroy our businesses. Shame on new Labor." Senator Sheldon. Now, we just hope we come to a situation here in the Senate where we get a number of speakers from the opposition who get up and talk about industrial relations. In actual fact, they even have the high to talk about being representative of small businesses. Senator Stirl, Stirl set them straight. In actual fact, I have the great pleasure of saying I was the head and elected the head of the largest small business organisation in this country, which is the Transport Workers Union of Australia. Over 15,000 owner drivers. And I know whenever I went into a workplace, I wanted to make sure there was an outcome that that company was successful, the industry was successful, and those workers got a fair deal, whether they're a small business person or whether an employee. What they're really saying is that those big gorillas, the ones that were called out by Steve Knott, all us big gorillas, all those chimpanzees on the other side of this chamber, are saying they're going to make sure that they get told by the big gorillas what they're going to do. Because those big gorillas give them bananas, they just won't share it with the rest of the country. Because the fact is, small business are getting it done in the neck under these laws that, were, uh, that have been stood over by this government when they were in government, the opposition when they were in government. We have to have a law that turns around and makes sure we can lift productivity. Productivity gets lifted when groups of workers come together and collectively bargain with their employer and, heaven forbid, across an industry. Because I've been in industries and I see industries where employers that are in the middle of the, of the supply chain are continually stood over by the top of the supply chain, the big gorillas that they are protecting. The ones that have the hide to come in here and represent Aki and others that have turned around and supported not small business, Big business. Because I can tell you what, if you really talk to small business and you really find out what small business has to say, they say that the employers that engage them, those economic employers, that's their problem. Because they're the ones that don't turn around and make sure their payments are made on time. They're the ones that give them 120 days. They're the ones that turn around and say, I can't train my staff because it's a race to the bottom. I can't turn around and give them a pay increase to give my experienced staff in the business because my competition will go lower and it's a race to the bottom. You only have to go to Alan Joyce to see that. Now that's the big gorilla because that's the people they are supporting. That's the people that they're supporting. And don't just say that. It's not just them. It's not, actually, it's not even just Alan Joyce. It's actually companies like Amazon, these international companies that are actually competing with small and other businesses that are stealing their arrangements. Because what they're doing is they're undercutting. They're undercutting by turning around and having multiple labour hire companies, having very few people on decent wages, refusing to have bargaining arrangements. They sack people because they're pregnant, sack them because they're in a union, sack them when they try to organise. That's the people they're standing up for. They don't want the system changed. No, wait a sec. They do want the system changed. Because what they said only in this last number of days, and again this morning, Angus Taylor said the system's working okay. Wages aren't going up. That's why I say it's working okay. Angus Taylor says the system's working okay. Because small business are getting done over by those big gorillas because they can't keep and train their staff, because they can't get the wages across their markets. And sometimes that's even negotiations across government contracts. They have to have the capacity in the private and government sector to be able to bargain when they want to, when there's an appropriate way to do that. Now, want to means that workers have a right to say that, as business has a right to say that. And parties have a right and obligation to come around and negotiate an agreement. If an employer says, I want to negotiate an agreement across the site, they have a right to do that. 
If an employee, more than 50 per cent plus one, says, I want to negotiate an agreement across the site, they have a right to do that. Heaven forbid. That is where you have equal actual voice. That's where you have equal opportunity. That's where you can turn around and start moving wages up. And when wages go up, people start talking about how to make it more efficient, more effective, better training, better skills, and heaven forbid productivity goes up. You've only got to look at the ACHC um, uh, Association that gave evidence to the inquiry. You only have to look at what was said by the Victorian uh, childhood, um, the, ch uh, the early childhood educators and their, their association, the employer association. They said that's how they actually got better conditions, better arrangements, not just for the workforce, but they all got together, these small multiple employers got together and turned around and said, let's do it together. And the last big myth, this supposed that Rent, uh, Minister Senator Reynolds was talking about this $15,000, it was in place right now without any law change. Thank you. The fact Thank is you, you make Senator a choice Sheldon. whether you want to do it or not. Senator Antic. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy President. I, I, I was loath to stand up and interject there because uh, Senator Sheldon was recounting what appeared to be a game of Donkey Kong country there with his analogies about gorillas and bananas. And I, I, was, I was a bit lost there in the, uh, the theatre of it all. But I'll tell you what I'm not lost on, and that is the radical, dangerous and ill-conceived rushed bill that we're seeing through our parliament coming through uh, as we speak, Mr Deputy President. These are um, changes which represent the most significant change in our industrial relations system in decades. And uh, they, they are ultimately uh, changes which are going to do exactly what we all know. This is, not, this is not a Super Nintendo. This is not a game of Donkey Kong Country. This is a very serious, serious matter. And what it is, is the first stages in handing back the keys uh, to this country, to the militant union movement, uh, which we are already seeing. We are already seeing this in, uh, in South Australia, where the reports already are of the John Setka-led uh, uh, CFMEU uh, have now taken the reins of the South Australian branch and are starting to swing the axe already. And why wouldn't they? Because they've now got Labor governments, both at state and federal level, both of whom are paving the way for what we know is going to be a terrible time for business. This is not an issue of people talking about their personal stories, which are excellent stories, as, uh, as Senator Still um, uh, spoke of, of, uh, of uh, what it was basically a small business story. But these are stories about the imposts that are going to be put on business, and we've heard them. We've heard them from um, the Albanese government's regulatory impact statement, which has said very clearly that the costs associated with this bill are going to be significant. $14,000, $14,638 for small businesses and $75,148 for a medium business. Um, th that ain't small bananas, uh, Mr Deputy President. They are serious, serious imposts, and they're real. They're not made up. They are absolutely real, and they're now, they're now written down. So Labor have made it clear they don't care about small businesses. Small businesses do well for workers when they're profitable, and they don't do well when they're getting hit with sums of money like that. They've made it clear that they're going to hand over all workplaces to the union, whether they be small or large. And industry-wide bargaining is, is simply set now to increase the number of strikes across the economy. That, we, we've seen this before. Uh, we saw it through the, the Hawke-Keating era, and we're going to see it again. This is going to be devastating for the Australian economy. It's going to be devastating for Australian businesses uh, with widespread strike action and uh, potentially sympathy strikes by those unrelated to a potential dispute. We, we saw this in the 1970s, Mr Deputy President. It, it, it has happened before and history is repeating ourselves. Everyone in this room wants higher wages uh, for, every, for every Australian, but there is no evidence that the reforms will ever deliver higher wages. And In fact, um, what we know is that, based on the comments from uh, businesses from employers that the evidence is that it will be quite the opposite. Uh, this is just the fact. Labor's legislation is going to lead to more strikes, more job losses. It's going to allow unions into small businesses, which have, which have really never had to deal with them before. Some of these businesses, like, for example, Crane Services, uh, it was reported uh, last week uh, in the Adelaide Advertiser, a fine publication. As you all know, I'm a great fan of it. Uh, that's me being that's ironic, by any way, in case anyone wants to hear that. But that's not on point. We'll come to that later on. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the boss of an Adelaide crane company told that newspaper that the livelihoods of the workers are at stake as they stand off with the militant CM, CFMEU. 
at, as it neared the end of its fourth day at that stage. This was a family-owned business, just like the story that Senator Searle told about a family-owned business. This is a family-owned business that is now going to be stood over by Mr Setka and his colleagues. We'll use that, that terminology in these terms. Uh, absolutely no, no question about that. We've similarly unreasonable demands for uh, conditions which really uh, 25 per cent wage rise in one year. Businesses can't stomach this sort of uh, knee-jerk uh, reform. Um, these laws are also going to hold up wage rises, of course, because of the complexity of the system. Um, what we're seeing now uh, more imposts put on businesses who are now going to have to get to grips with various different systems. This is going to undermine competition. Australians are going to have few choices and therefore fewer choices and therefore higher costs. It's going to force up prices and increase the cost of living, all, all by the way, Mr Deputy President, at a time where the country uh, cannot afford that. We are living through, uh, thanks, to, uh, uh, thanks to the conditions imposed here, growing inflation, uh, higher costs of living, higher energy costs. We've got lots of batteries and wind farms, though, which is good. Lots of batteries and wind farms. They're, they're doing a great job for the grid, by the way, while we're Thank on the you, subject. Senator. Thank you, Senator Antic. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note to uh, responses to my questions to uh, Senator Wong. I'm very proud to be standing in the Senate today asking on behalf of the Australian Greens the hard questions to this government on an issue that matters to millions of Australians. I know a lot of senators in this chamber have received correspondence in recent weeks around the collapse of Red Cycle a soft plastic recycling facility. People are furious. They are furious and frustrated. After all these years of doing the right thing, collecting their soft plastics, which, by the way, they have no choice about at all, collecting their soft plastics, taking them back to the supermarket and then finding out that they're being stockpiled by a company that actually can't get them recycled. No one's buying the recycled content from the recyclers. And guess what? The big packaging companies that produce this plastic waste, this pollution, and the companies that order it to wrap every item just about in your grocery in plastics, which nobody wants, but you get it anyway. You know why? You know why that this scheme has collapsed? You know why we're about to find out that our 2025 packaging targets have also failed? Because the big companies, and this is the, there's a number of reasons, but the key reason is the big companies that produce this stuff just don't give a rat's ass about what happens to it. They really don't. They have no producer responsibility. They do not care. They put it all back onto the consumer. If you use these products, it's up to you to dispose of them. But what's a consumer to do when there's no options? What's a consumer to do? Well, I asked the question to Senator Wong today, why is it seemingly beyond these companies to actually come up with a scheme to recycle these soft plastics properly? And actually, that was based on a quote from our Environment Minister. Out of frustration on the day this was announced, Minister Plibersek said it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be beyond big companies like Coles and Woolworth to come up with a viable solution to soft plastic packaging recycling. You know why they don't care? Because they know the government doesn't care. Because they have since 1998, under the Australian Packaging Covenant, repeatedly, repeatedly failed to meet even the most basic recycling or packaging waste reduction targets. And they have never once been penalised. Because this scheme is voluntary. It's always been voluntary. There's been no one in this building or even at a state government level through the COAG process who's been willing to take on the big packaging companies, companies like Coca-Cola and the big grocery companies, may I say big donors yes. to the, both the Labor and the Liberal Party, just as a passing comment. But I'll tell you what, it, the Australian people have had enough. Senator Polly, I'll take that interjection, they have had enough of big governments failing to act on this recycling crisis. And we need to ask ourselves, if we find out that the Australian Packaging Covenant, APCO, which is now an accredited voluntary product stewardship scheme under the new Act, if they are not going to meet their 2025 targets, they're three years away, but we were told we would know by the end of this year, if they are not going to, what is the government going to do? Are they going to let this pollution continue? 
Are they going to continue to let down Australians? I hope they do the only thing they can do to fix this crisis. Step up and regulate these companies. Regulate these companies like the Greens tried to force in the Senate debate two years ago when the legislation came here. We had a tied vote on mandating these targets so that these companies had no choice but to meet them. And if they didn't, there would be consequences. And I remind the senators, those of you who were here two years ago, that we had a tied vote and it was Senator Hanson that walked away from what a deal we thought we had with her to actually pass mandatory regulatory targets. And uh, the government cast the deciding vote from the chair and we lost that debate. And surprise, surprise, two years later, it looks like we've had a massive failure of soft plastic recycling and we're about to find out that our entire national targets, run by big business, led by big business, through the packaging covenant, is also going to fail. And I would ask senators to reflect on this as a final point. The Greens aren't going to stop asking the questions on this. We're not going to stop putting up good ideas. We're going to continually needle you till you do something about this. And I say that to both parties. This should be across political lines, because I tell you, this issue cuts across political lines. All sides of politics want to see better recycling. They want to see waste reduction. They do not want to see plastic pollution in our oceans killing our marine life. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, the chair doesn't have a casting vote for your information. I now call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for statements relating to the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Is leave granted? Leave is leave granted. Leave yes. is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that senators may make statements relating to the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and the speaking times be it followed as follows: ten minutes for party leaders and independent senators, and five minutes for any other senator. I intend to put the question. I put the question. Senator Waters, do you wish to speak on this motion? Or yeah, I'm going to speak. Yeah, no, the Senator Waters looked like she wanted the call. I'm sorry. I no. presume I missed that, but well, I presume we're moving to the thing that we all want to speak on. Yes, yeah. correct. So my, my apologies. I've, yeah. I'm going to put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. My apologies. No. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Deputy President. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which also commences the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It's a time when we come together across the world to call for an end to violence against women, and I thank the Senate for the opportunity uh, for all of us to make contributions uh, today. Every year we ask the same thing. Let's end, how do we end violence against women? Well, like most people, I am sick of asking, sick of having to say, let's not hit women, let's not kill women, let's not accept that all too many cases of a woman's partner controlling her movements, her bank accounts, her work, her freedom. Like so many, I'm sick of asking each year for men to stop being violent to women, something we should never have to ask or demand. As Chief Minister, a Senator and now Minister for Women, I've heard from too many women about their trauma, their frustration, their fear, about the loss of their friends, the loss of their loved ones, the impact on their lives, themselves and their children. The violence has to end. Now We have a lot to be proud of in this country, but the rates of violence against women and children that persist in Australia are our national shame and an uncomfortable truth. It's a national shame that one woman is killed every 10 days in Australia by her former or current partner, that one in three women have experienced violence by an intimate partner, that one in two women have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime, that 51 per cent of women in their 20s have experienced sexual violence, women who then are 45 per cent more likely to experience high levels of financial stress. And it's an uncomfortable reality that if you ask the women in this chamber, if we ask them to put their hand up if they had been ex experienced violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment in their lifetime, how many of us would put our hands up? And it's the same as every workplace, every home, every small business, every big business, every educational institution, nightclubs, restaurants, everywhere. You ask the women how many have experienced violence or know someone who has, 
all of our hands would go up. And behind these statistics I just read out are the millions of women in Australia who live with this violence. Um, hundreds of thousands who are living with this violence today, women who carry trauma with them every day, women each year who live with increasingly lower expectations of anything ever changing. So there must be an end to women becoming statistics or names on the front page of newspapers for the temporary outcry and calls for change, and then the next day it still goes on. We must have an end to women being subjected to fear and trauma, often in their own homes, by men that they love and trust, and an end to men choosing to use violence and control and not being held to account or changing their behaviour. I want to acknowledge the statements on this important issue ahead of International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women made yesterday in the other place. Comments by the Minister for Social Services, Amanda Rishworth, who is leading our work to end gender-based violence through the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children, and from the Shadow Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence, Karen Andrews, who spoke so candidly about the devastating impact of this violence on victim survivors and those people around them. These statements reinforce the cross-party party commitment on this issue, an issue that requires action from all of us, men and women in this place. This is why we are working with states and territories through the National Plan to end violence against women and children in a generation, because one death is one death is one too many. The National Plan includes a powerful statement from victim survivors of gender-based violence. It implores us to put their experiences at the core of our policy making and to truly listen to them. And it reminds us that this is a matter of life and death. In that statement, it says, we should not have to die to get your attention. It's confronting, but it's a message that we must hear, that ending this violence will save lives because right now women and their children are dying. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the, that all too many women who have experienced uh, domestic, family and sexual violence, the women who relive this experience and trauma in order to advocate for change, the women who live with enduring emotional, physical and financial impacts of violence, and the women who are not here today, whose lives have been stolen by the deliberate act of another, often someone that they loved. I acknowledge the activists who have spent years and decades calling for action and frontline workers who are on the ground supporting those victim survivors to access help, support and justice. And we know we've made a start with the national plan and the investments to invest in consent and respectful relationship education to provide additional frontline service and community support workers to prevent violence before it begins and to intervene early to support men to change their behaviour to respond to victim survivors' needs and support their healing and recovery, to implement all the recommendations from the respected work report so that women are safe at work. We're also looking at our investments in relation to housing. We know this is a massive issue uh, for women uh, wanting to escape violent situations for, for, with their children and also for older women who we know are such a significant and growing group of, women, of people who are at risk of homelessness in this country. We've passed legislation to provide paid family and domestic violence leave, and also the important work that's been led by Minister Rishworth and Minister Burney on a standalone First Nations action plan to sit under the national plan and the work that's going there and the consultations to date. And we know that it is a national priority to, to finalise those action plans and get them in place. We are targeting a key driver of violence against women through our work to advance gender equality. We know that whilst the statistics remain as they are, the prevalence of violence remains as it is, that we will not be able to achieve a country with gender equality at its core. This includes investments in paid parental leave, early childhood education and our work to develop that national strategy. I know there's a lot of interest in the national strategy and people wanting um, the consultation process to go under, uh, underway. And we welcome all of the input and uh, the support that will be provided there, and we are hoping to finalise that national strategy in the first half of next year. We know that not only is gender inequality a key driver of gender-based violence, it's also a result of it, with long-term impacts on women, their economic participation and the economy, and on their children. 
The cost of violence against women and their children has estimated to be at $26 billion a year, with victim survivors bearing approximately 50 per cent of that cost. We know that we need to take action and we will continue to act and to listen and to consult and talk with local communities, but we can't do it alone. Um, we must work in partnership with a whole range of stakeholders, including all levels of government. Now, I think uh, every year when we have this day, I always am frustrated at the fact that we have to recognise this day each year because this, the prevalence of violence remains at, at this un unacceptable level. But I am also optimistic. I believe in the aspiration of the national plan. I believe in the strength and support of the sector in driving to reach that goal. Which, a goal which imagines a society that is free from gender-based violence. It is ambitious, but if we work together, we can achieve it. And if we don't achieve, we know how the importance of achieving it, because if we don't achieve it, lives will be lost, and lives depend on us um, getting this policy response right. I'm proud that so many people in this place share this vision, determination, and commitment. I acknowledge the work of uh, Senator Waters, who has consistently and often in this place raise this to remind people of what's happening out there in our country. Living from free from violence is a human right. Women have the right to be safe in their homes, at work, in the community and online. So tomorrow, throughout the 16 days of activism and on all, all days, I encourage everyone to unite and consider the role they have to play, the actions that they can take. And let's imagine a society without violence against women and children, and let's commit to achieve an Australia and a world where all women and girls live free from f um, violence and from fear. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Deputy President. Deputy President, I thank uh, the government for providing this time for the chamber. As, uh, as we mark another day, uh, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, uh, being acknowledged around the world tomorrow, we should commence by reflecting that 12 months on since the last day, we should remember and recall those women and children across Australia and around the world who have lost their lives due to unacceptable, unforgivable acts of violence. We should recall and remember those victim survivors who have felt pain, anguish and loss through that period of time, whose lives have been changed forever as a result of the unacceptable actions of others. We should recall those, too, who are brave and who drive and work for change. We have come a long way across the globe, but we have still a very long way to go. The International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women has been observed on 25 November since at least 1981. Activists across the world selected that date to honour the Mirabel sisters, three political activists from the Dominican Republic who were brutally murdered in 1960. It's been recognised uh, by uh, the UN General Assembly uh, since at least 1999 as the official day. Here in Australia, we have continued to recognise, but also, most importantly, continued to do more. I want, early in my remarks, to particularly thank and acknowledge those who have ensured that we all do more, better understand, including men like me. It's important, critical on occasions like this, for men to take responsibility and to speak out too. In contemplating this time for the chamber today, we discussed whether my good friend Senator Hume or I would lead the debate for the coalition. I decided that I should and that it's appropriate to do so and that it's appropriate for all of us to take and accept the responsibility that comes with doing so. But with that I acknowledge that it is people like Senator Hume, Senator Payne, Senator Rustin, others across the chamber, on the crossbench, in the other chamber and even perhaps more so in the community who have helped to educate me as with many other men about the responsibilities that we must take and accept to recognise the problems of violence against women, to understand those problems, to speak out and to call them out, and to support action for prevention and for support. 
Deputy President, I was pleased last night to join the team and supporters of Our Watch for their annual event, thankfully back in person in this parliament after a couple of years of uh, remote attendance. And I was there with Senator Waters and others around the chamber across the parliament, uh, as I and others have been before. The work of Our Watch and so many other organisations is crucial to, as their evidence-based framework to guide the national approach to preventing violence against women says, change the story. Change the story from one of perpetual death, violence and loss, to change the story to one in which future generations can have the type of hope and opportunity that we expect all to enjoy. Most of us lead fortunate lives. Most of us are lucky to avoid the type of violence, but far too many are touched by it. And for those who have been so fortunate, it is a responsibility for us to work and to do more. There are many causes of violence, but they all begin with disrespect against those that the violence is perpetuated against. Disrespect in this case against women, against partners, against family members, against people who are meant to be loved ones. And it is that disrespect uh, that we must work fundamentally to overcome. But one of the fundamental pillars in overcoming that disrespect is to achieve greater equality. Again, Australia and much of the world has made huge steps, but we have many more steps to take. I was proud that during our time in government we were able to see the majority, around 60 per cent, of new jobs created go to women and to see women's workforce participation reach record highs. I was pleased to see the gender pay gap close somewhat, but still remain unacceptably high. I was pleased to be able to be part of government providing funding uh, through significant women's budget statements, particularly in my time as finance minister, some $5.5 billion over the last two women's budget statements. Across different spheres in relation to support for health care, for economic activity and, critically, for women's safety. The most recent budget a further $1.3 billion of support. Of course, the funding itself is inconsequential without great organisations, successful and effective evidence-based programs to help back it up. That's where the work of our watch of Stop It at the Start, of Respectful Relationships. It's where effective education platforms, we're expanding domestic violence alert training, uh, where support in terms of domestic violence payments, emergency accommodation, legal protections and reforms in relation to cross-examination uh, and support for frameworks that ensure perpetrators are held to account, medical programs, whole raft of initiatives that are crucial, that are supported across our country, uh, but no doubt need continued support to help to achieve the type of ambition that we have, which under the national plan is to end violence in a generation. It's ambitious. It will be difficult, but it is absolutely worth pursuing and a goal that we should all, across all parties, remain sincerely and deeply committed to. So, Deputy President, I and I'm sure all others across this chamber join in pledging to do what I can and what we can uh, to help to ensure that we eliminate violence against women, against children in our country, but we also act as an exemplar and a messenger into the rest of the world, recognising that in many other parts of the world the unacceptable grave statistics that we hear about our country are replicated and even worse, and that we have that responsibility in our region, with other partners, in other cultures, to do what we can respectfully, to educate, to support, to effect change, so that be it here, across our broad country and many cultures represented here, or elsewhere and in many different and diverse circumstances, ultimately all women and girls can look to a life of safety and of opportunity and of equality. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President, uh, and I welcome those words from um, the senators who have spoken so far. And I also welcome the fact that we are having this debate in the Senate, as they did in the House yesterday. That's appropriate, and I thank the government for that. <clears throat> Tomorrow marks the International Day for Ending Violence Against Women and Their Children, and it also marks the start of the 16 days of activism to end gendered violence globally. As with all International Days, it is a reason to pause and reflect but it cannot be the sum total of our attention to this issue. Globally, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime. And of those women, only one in ten go to the police for help. And of those who go to the police for help, many never have their complaints taken seriously, not properly investigated or their abusers charged, and even fewer than that manage to secure a prosecution. Now, these statistics are shockingly familiar in Australia. We can't claim to be doing any better than our neighbours. We can't pretend that sexism and disrespect doesn't underlie the culture in many workplaces, many clubs, many homes in our country. In Australia, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence since they were 15. And on average, one woman is killed by a current or former partner every nine days. Now, that, this year, we're up to 40 women who have been killed. When we used to have motions, I used to recognise the names of the women who had been killed and, and since the last motion, but unfortunately we've lost the uh, procedural ability to recognise those women, but we won't forget them. We know the figures of 40 because a volunteer organisation tracks them, not because we have a national toll of women killed, which is something that the Greens have pushed for for years and still think would be a very meritorious idea. But I also want to note that First Nations women experience significantly higher rates of violence throughout their lives and reiterate our support for a standalone national plan to end violence against First Nations women and children, designed, implemented and evaluated by First Nations women and community-controlled organisations. First Nations women know what needs to be done to end violence in their communities, and they need to be empowered to take action. My colleague, Senator Cox, will speak about the importance of that work in her contribution. Um, she's currently at an event to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the establishment, along with my other colleague, Senator Thorpe, uh, of setting up the inquiry into missing and murdered First Nations women um, and the appalling fact that a lot of violence against First Nations women goes unreported. The last few years, in particular, have laid bare the pervasive nature of gendered violence across Australia. Brave young women have come forward and they've forced this conversation onto the national agenda. We've all talked about it many times, but despite this, on a lot of metrics, the first national plan to reduce violence against women and their children failed. Violence against women remains shockingly high. Sexual assault amongst people under 25 has actually increased. Things need to change. Now, I'm very pleased that the second national plan commits to ending gendered violence within a generation. It's an ambitious goal, but it's critical that we all work together to make that happen. We just can't keep coming back and making speeches about how things need to change. Things actually need to change. So many, uh, often survivors themselves, work behind the scenes to support survivors to get justice or just peace and safety to rebuild their lives. We owe it to those women to do everything we can to end gendered violence now. Now, stopping this violence starts with believing and listening to survivors, learning from their experience so that others don't have to suffer the same harm. The victim-survivor statement in the National Plan is a powerful call to action, to listen, to hear, to act. And the new Family Domestic and Sexual Violence Commissioner, Michaela Cronin, has been tasked with ensuring that all actions are grounded in the experience of victim survivors. It is tough and critical work. We need survivor-centred essential services that understand and respect survivor experiences and don't compound trauma when help is sought. This requires specialist services that understand the specific needs of First Nations women, young women, older women, disabled women, LGBTIQ plus women and women from culturally diverse backgrounds. Stopping violence against women will take systemic action to tackle root causes, transform harmful social norms and empower women and girls. Gender inequality and gender stereotypes foster disrespect. All of the evidence confirms a correlation between rigid gender stereotypes and rates of violence. So small things like calling out casual sexism will actually help to drive the cultural change that ultimately um, will stop so many women being killed. 
Individuals must be held to account, but we've got to go beyond individual behaviours and we've got to consider the broader social, political and economic factors that drive violence against women. We must promote the equal distribution of power, resources and opportunities between men and women. We know that you can't be what you can't see and that workplaces like ours should be showing leadership in the representation of women in decision-making roles. Now, we do okay in the Senate, but our friends in the House have a long way to go to reach gender parity. Critically, stopping gendered violence requires properly funding the organisations that do the work on the front lines of this epidemic. In estimates a few weeks ago, we learned that the government doesn't have any data on unmet need. But I hear from services on a re very regular basis that every day they have to turn women away from shelters, from calls to support services, from legal services, um, because they don't have enough funding to help everyone who reaches out for help. The sector has repeatedly said that it will take an investment of $1 billion a year to make sure that they're able to help everyone who reaches out for that help. Now, that's the absolute minimum that women should, be, uh, should expect from their government, and the government delivered less than half of that amount in the recent budget. What a tragic missed opportunity. We need to also fund prevention programs. Respect for relationships curriculum needs to be embedded from early education onwards. Targeted prevention programs, workplace training to make sure employers can identify and act on abusive behaviour. We must effectively engage men and boys in that prevention work. Some positive men's behaviour change programs were funded in the budget, and we welcome that. Men need to take responsibility, and they need to be better. We also need a proper investment in housing, in crisis accommodation, in transitional home, uh, housing and in long-term affordable housing options. No woman should have to choose between violence or homelessness, and yet that is the consistent evidence that we've received from frontline organisations for years now. It's particularly acute for older women. No one should be turned away because a shelter doesn't have enough beds. But unless a woman is confident she's got somewhere to go, too many will stay in dangerous situations. Delays in, accessing, pardon me, delays in accessing crisis or social housing can literally cost women their lives. The recent budget allocation of $100 million for 720 homes for DV survivors is a drop in the ocean of what is required. We also desperately need to lift income support and raise wages so that women have the financial security they need to get free to seek help, to stay safe, to leave if they need to. We know that it can take 140 hours and at least $18,000 on average to escape an abusive relationship. Now that's something that women on low incomes um, or with insecure work simply don't have. We strongly welcome the introduction of paid family and domestic violence leave just a few weeks ago. That's an important safety net, but more needs to be done. The government's escaping violence payments, which are designed to provide emergency funding to help women escape abuse, is oversubscribed, and women are, waiting, uh, are having to wait 28 business days to access funds. Now, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. We need to recognise and understand the insidious forms of violence and abuse, including coercive control and financial abuse. We know that up to 70,000 women were coerced into withdrawing their super early during COVID. And earlier this week, the Centre for Women's Economic Safety shone a light on the role that banks could play in ensuring that financial products like credit cards, mortgage payments and bank transfer descriptions can't be weaponised. And we call on the banking industry to do that voluntarily and, if they won't, for government to work to regulate. We need to address the culture in our policing and legal systems that have let women down time and time again. The review of the culture within the Queensland Police Service released this week is devastating but sadly deeply unsurprising reading. It can't be a mystery to anyone why so many women choose not to report. We need holistic, expert wraparound services and alternative pathways for reporting and addressing violence. We need to understand the experience of victim survivors who say that the legal process was re-traumatising and listen to them about what needs to change. <clears throat> Last night I attended an Our Watch event and I want to acknowledge the work that they do as the premier experts on prevention. They're an incredible resource and I urge everyone in this place to take a look at their resources. And as for workplaces, I look forward to tonight discussing uh, respect at work. But can I conclude by saying ending violence against women and children is a job for all of us. 
We've all got to make this happen within this generation, if not before. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. This day is a global call to action, where we are being asked to unite in activism to end violence against women and against girls. And we know that worldwide, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. These aren't just international statistics, though. These are statistics reflected in the Australian experience. It's one in three here too. And we know that on average, one woman every 10 days in Australia will be killed by an intimate partner. When we include sexual harassment in the picture, it is even bleaker. 53 per cent of women will have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. These are women we know, women we love. This is us. Acting Deputy President, every Australian has the right to live a life free from violence whether at home, whether at school, at work or in their community. And violence is not inevitable. We know this. And that's why we're taking action as a government to end it. And I acknowledge where there has been bipartisan support to do that. And I acknowledge the work of many senators in this place who've made that work part of their core mission and their core business uh, in the Senate and in public life. As a government, we are committed to addressing the underlying factors that drive gender-based violence, as well as rates of violence, and we've backed this up with a record $1.7 billion worth of investment. As senators here know, in October our government released the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children. This is the national policy framework which will guide our efforts and actions over the next decade. And along with the states and territories, our government has committed to a shared goal of ending gendered violence within one generation. It's an ambitious goal, and for it to be achieved, it will require tangible actions. The plan outlines actions to address gender discrimination, implement prevention strategies, and embed effective early intervention approaches. And importantly, it outlines actions that will build the frontline sector workforce to ensure women and children can access tailored and culturally safe support no matter where they live. And as Senator Waters has said so eloquently, we know that whilst this is an issue which affects all women in our community, it does affect certain women in our community more than others, and that includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. And that is why there will also be a standalone plan focused on domestic and family violence against First Nations women and children. Acting Deputy President, the work under this plan is important, but so too are the other policies our government has been working on, including paid family and domestic violence leave, our work and significant and substantial investments on housing, and our work in implementing the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. I'm proud of these policies. I'm proud to be part of a government that recognises the fundamental right of women and children to live safely and without fear. And I'm proud of the bipartisan efforts to come together on this mission and this goal. This isn't an easy fix. It requires all of us across our communities, not just in government, but in all parts of our communities, to work together to drive the systemic changes required to stop this type of violence at its core to stand up loudly and fiercely and say that we will not stand for domestic and family violence anymore. We will not stand for violence against women and children. That we will take action, that we will invest the money required to do so, and that we won't stop fighting until every single woman and child feels safe in their home, in their school, in their workplace, in their community, in this country, in the world. No lesser goal is worthy of our efforts, no lesser goal will do. Senator Hume. President, I rise also to lend my contribution to this International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, held on the November 25th each year. Addressing violence against women remains at the forefront of women's issues right around the world and, of course, in Australia as well. I once went to an event to raise money for an organisation that assists women fleeing from domestic violence. And the MC said to the audience, uh, ladies, look into your partner's eyes. And of course, people all dressed up in their ball gowns looked 
adoringly into their partner's eyes. And then the MC said, this is the man whose hands you are most likely to die in. And of course, there was an uncomfortable titter around the room when people, but when people thought about what that actually meant, it was extraordinarily confronting. More than half the women killed around the world in 2017 died at the hands of an intimate partner or of a relative. That was around 50,000 women. On average, each week in Australia, a woman is killed by a violent or controlling male whom she knows. It's harrowing, it's disturbing, and it is totally unacceptable. The figures and statistics don't end there. One in four Australian women have had experiences of physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner, and in all likely, we know many of these victims' survivors. Indeed, there are likely to be many in here today. Intimate partner violence contributes to more deaths, more disabilities and more illnesses in Australian women aged between 15 to 44 than any other preventable risk factor. That includes smoking, it includes obesity, it includes high blood pressure. Stories of family and domestic violence are distressing and they stay with you. From my home state of Victoria, I think of Poonam Sharma and her six-year-old daughter, Vanessa, stabbed in their home in Mill Park in January this year by her husband. I think of Carly Griffiths, a mother of six, whose husband set fire to their home in Auburn Vale. I think of Shirley Kidd, a grandmother who died of fatal injuries in Bacchus Marsh. And of course, no one can forget the horrific story of Hannah Clark and her three children in Queensland. It doesn't bear repeating. There are unfortunately so many, so many names across Australia, and we hear these stories constantly from police, from nurses, from doctors, from care workers, from family and friends, helpless and grieving. And we hear them also from the victim survivors whose lives will never be the same. And these stories remind us that despite the progress we've made as a society, there is still so much that can and must be done. The dedication of this day gives us opportunity to reflect on uh, and confront and to oppose violence towards women, the blight that has just transcended time and culture and location. And yes, while it is a global issue, that, uh, that is no excuse for inaction. It must be addressed domestically, it must be addressed locally, and it must be addressed culturally as well. All forms of family and domestic violence have their genesis in lack of respect for a partner. We need to change our behaviour, change our thoughts, change our values, and change our levels of tolerance to this behaviour. I was very proud that in government that we, the coalition committed a total of $2 billion since 2013 in family and domestic violence, uh, to, to address family and domestic violence, in programs that focused on prevention, on early intervention, on response and on recovery, funding initiatives like Our Watch, like Stop It at the Start, which was an extraordinarily successful campaign around changing attitudes, and it was recognised by three in five adults, encouraging action toward more respectful relationships. Uh, by expanding uh, DV alert training, the escaping violence payment, which was a new initiative delivered to de delivered, um, which it delivered tailors assistance to victim survivors who were escaping relationships, providing wraparound services to those who wanted to flee a dangerous home. By maintaining protection across, uh, against cross-examination by family violence perpetrators and by increasing legal assistance, including family advocacy support services, children's contact services, and of course the very well-known, in fact, um, part of the vernacular now, the 1800 Respect Service. It's so important that we continue a bipartisan response to this. Women must feel safe, free from violence and free from fear in order to be equal, and the responsibility for this lies with us all. Senator Billy. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for her statement about the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Children. Sadly, many people have become numb to the shocking global statistics on violence against women and children. More than a billion women worldwide, or around one in three, have experienced physical or sexual violence. And some of the most shocking forms of abuse include child sexual abuse, child marriage, human trafficking and slavery, and female genital mutilation. 
Of course, we know that violence around the world isn't exclusively perpetrated against women and girls, but women and girls are overwhelmingly, disproportionately, the victims of it. Many proud Australians would like to think of our country as being the envy of the world and much more enlightened. And in many respects, we are. We are a wealthy, peaceful, democratic country that values freedom and the rule of law. But when it comes to violence against women and children, this is one area where, to our great shame, we have made far less progress, progress than we should. In Australia, one woman is killed by a current or former intimate partner every 10 days. Almost 10 women a day are hospitalised for assault injuries perpetrated by a spouse or domestic partner. Police are called to a domestic or family violence matter every two minutes. One in three women has experienced physical violence and one in five women has experienced sexual violence from the age of 15. A little over half, 53 per cent of women, have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. And we all know the situation is worse for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. For example, in 2018-19, Indigenous women were 29 times as likely as non-Indigenous women to be hospitalised as a result of non-fatal family violence assaults. Violence against women and their children and all children is estimated to cost Australia $26 billion a year, but that dollar figure doesn't account for the enormous physical, emotional and psychological costs that victims experience. As has been said, tomorrow is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and the theme for this year is Unite, Activism to End Violence Against Women and Girls. A global campaign of 16 days of activism starts tomorrow and concludes on the 10th of December or International Human Rights Day. We cannot underestimate the value and the power of awareness of this issue as just a first step, just a first step to eliminating violence. Much of the problem of violence against women happens behind closed doors and so raising awareness helps to bring it out in the open. The Me Too movement has been instrumental in showing the prevalence of sexual assault and sexual harassment. It has empowered victim survivors to speak out and to show others that they are not alone. Now, for many years I worked as an early childhood educator and as one of the co-chairs of Australian Parliamentarians for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect, or APCAN, I want to highlight the impact the culture of violence against women and children actually has on children. It manifests in the violence against girls perpetuated by adult men. It manifests in the sexual harassment experienced by girls in school, in sport, in day-to-day -day living, in boys who have grown up in a culture of toxic masculinity, who have not learnt how to have healthy, respectful relationships. It manifests in the trauma experienced by children, boys and girls, when they witness family violence at home. Protecting children from this violence takes on a particular significance, not just because of the vulnerability of children, but because of the effects it has of them in, on them later in life. If gender-based violence is normalised for children, boys who grow to become men will often learn that it's acceptable to treat women that way, and girls who grow to become women will not be empowered to escape the violence. Protecting children is key to preventing the violence experienced by and perpetuated against women in adulthood. I commend the work that has gone into the Australian Government's 10-year national plan to end violence against women and children released on 17 October this year. This plan is the national policy framework that will guide the Government's actions over the next decade to eliminate violence against women and their children. And I'm proud to be part of a government that has committed $1.7 billion to fighting gender-based violence in our recent budget. We heard Senator Gallagher outline some of those initiatives in question times, but government alone cannot fix this problem. So I encourage everyone in the community to work together to end gender-based violence. We have to do this because, as we've heard, one death is one death too many. Thank you, Senator. Senator Pocock, and to assist gonna... the chamber, I'll go to Liberal next and then the Greens. Sure. Uh, are you going to swap or do you want me no, to No, you have the call, Senator. Okay. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I would like to again congratulate the government on the new national plan to end violence against women and children and acknowledge the work of the former government on this too and thank the, the many uh, members of this um, 
Senate who have worked tirelessly on this. Uh, one in six women in Australia have experienced physical and or sexual violence. The elimination of violence against women and children before 2032 is a bold plan. This work and this cultural change is clearly urgent. The target is very ambitious and the achievement of this target is contingent on a cultural shift, a mindset shift amongst Australians. This shift requires individuals, families and communities across Australia to challenge much of our ingrained patriarchal thinking that normalises male domination and power. It requires us to rethink the normalcy of violent actions which are so prevalent in our modern society. Uh, this is uh, uncomfortable and challenging work, but we, we all stand to gain from this. It's an uncomfortable thing to challenge our ingrained attitudes, things that we learn growing up and we just take as the way things are. Cultural change is hard, but it can be done. Uh, we have heard much about toxic masculinity. I have a concern that this is not uh, often the most helpful way to talk about it to drive change. As uh, the, author, the late author Bell Hooks uh, put it, the crisis facing men is not the crisis of masculinity. It is the crisis of patriarchal masculinity. Until we make this distinction clear, men will continue to fear that any critique of patriarchy represents a threat. Clearly this is something that we need to be able to talk about more as men. Uh, violence against women needs to become a men's issue. We all need to stand up on this issue and we all stand to gain as we are part of this shift in our thinking and our culture. Clearly this is up to all of us not just men, not just women, and we need men to be standing up and speaking out, to be having the difficult conversations with our friends in our peer groups, to call out sexism, to be able to have uncomfortable conversations about the things uh, that we've learnt, uh, about what it means to be a man, uh, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, uh, to seek help and support when we need it, rather than believing that, that to, be met, to be a man is tough and not to show weakness. Uh, this shift needs to come from every person in Australia, uh, regardless of, of gender and age. Uh, we all have a role to play in it. It's, it's a fitting time to be uh, talking about it, uh, ahead of the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women tomorrow. And I'd like to note that to mark this day, the Zonta Club of Canberra will be lighting up Canberra Orange. This is something Zonta do each year as part of their 16 days of activism to keep raising attention to this matter. Uh, the Malcolm Fraser Bridge will glow, so will each of our light rail stops, and so will the uh, National Kurilin. Um Importantly, so will the face of this building, a focal point both in Canberra and the nation in recognition of the decisions that get made in here on behalf of Australians. I hope that this uh, small gesture at Parliament House uh, supporting Zonta and their efforts uh, goes some way to highlighting the support and uh, the work that is being done across uh, Parliament to further this issue. Uh, I invite Senators who will be in Canberra tomorrow night uh, to come and speak with Zonta at 7.30 uh, just after the sun sets out the front of Parliament House. And for those who can't make it, uh, we all have a role to play in this. Start to have those conversations. Uh, start to speak to, to loved ones, to friends, about how we, how we shift this. It's, uh, it is an ambitious plan. It is a, a, worthy, um, a worthy goal, something that is uh, possible. 
and indeed there are so many people who have dedicated their, their lives and are working tirelessly to make this happen. Uh, just to finish, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, some of our local organisations who are working on the front line here in the ACT, dealing with the impacts of domestic and family violence every day. Uh, that includes the YWCA, uh, DVCS, Beryl and Doris Women's Refuge. Uh, thank you so much for all you do for our community. Senator Nujimpa Price. Thank you, um, Mr Acting President. Uh, I would like to express my support um, for the government's um, next action plan, leading the next action plan to end violence against women and their children. And I would also like to begin by recognising the work of my own mother, the first Warpri first language speaking minister in the Northern Territory, in the former country Liberal Party um, government in the Northern Territory, Bess Nungarei Price, who was integral in the establishment of the very first nation, national action plan to reduce domestic violence and worked closely with my now colleague, uh, Senator Michaelia Cash. Uh, and of course, it was very difficult uh, for her, but an, an issue that is very close to our hearts, um, having both my mother and myself been survivors. <sighs> and also seeing the way in which violence has played out within our immediate families over the years and for the challenge of being an Aboriginal woman in a traditional Aboriginal context to bring to light, we talk about culture, but to bring to light the cultural impacts, the traditional cultural impacts that affect immediately our family that when I hear my colleagues speak, speak of the rates of violence against Aboriginal women in this country. They're speaking about the women in my family and the lack of understanding and or want of understanding to understand those, the cultural impacts when young girls are promised to older men and forced to be in outstations where, like my aunt, go missing from for decades when they are forced into those circumstances. And when these circumstances are supported by family members, it makes it even harder for Aboriginal women. It makes it harder when an Aboriginal woman tries to get up and talk about these circumstances and how we're immediately affected by our own traditional culture. And others call you a sellout. Others call you many different names, but don't want to recognise the pressures that we come under as those who live under the confines of traditional Aboriginal culture. But if we were to actually address this correctly, we would see rates of incarceration drop dramatically as well. We would see children be able to live in homes free of violence. We, we would start to see the sort of equality that we want in this country if we could actually recognise those elements that are most destructive, those elements that have taken away the lives of many of my family members, those elements that led to the death of Candy Napulkari, Marian Napurula, her daughter, Kayleen Nungarei, another mother to me, Linda Nangala, who was stabbed in a town camp, my niece, and killed, who left two children behind, Rita Penanga, my aunt, who left my little cousin behind, Rosalind Nungarei, my mother's sister, who was stabbed and killed in a town camp in Catherine. Carolyn Napadjari, my cousin. Stephanie Napadjari, my cousin whose body I had to ID in a morgue. If we are serious in this nation about lowering the rates of domestic violence for Aboriginal women, we have to listen to the voices, the voices of women who are prepared to speak up. One of those voices, Sharon Long, I brought to this parliament last year and her sister Misha, whose sister was found hanged from a boab tree in a territory community. But they believe she was murdered. The investigation didn't find that. 
These are injustices that need to be followed up in this country. These voices, those ones that are rarely heard, they need to be heard in all of this conversation. Otherwise, we'll continue to see the rates of Indigenous women remain at critically high levels in terms of their deaths, deaths that are due to family and domestic violence and the rates of sexual abuse that we experience in places that are out of sight and out of mind to the rest of this country. It must be understood. We talk about culture and toxic masculinity. It occurs in traditional Aboriginal culture as well. I know because my family have been subject to it, and we need to start taking this seriously. Thank you, Senator Napajira Price. Um, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Another day of significance in our calendars where we as First Nations women try desperately to have our stories heard, heard here in this place, heard in the media and heard in the courtroom. A day where a lot of us can only hope that our black lives and our black bodies matter too. I pay my respects and I honour our women and the struggles and the trauma we face every day and I particularly honour those who have lost their lives. First Nations women are the backbone of our communities, strong, staunch and loyal. Our women care and fight for country, keep our families together and keep our communities grounded and strong. First Nations women bear the brunt of colonisation in a way like no other. We face a greater risk of domestic and family violence in this country. The statistics paint a heartbreaking image, that image like a mirror, really. When I see the statistics, I think of the physical violence, the broken teeth and bruised black bodies, the sexual violence and harassment. I think of those calls all black women know too well, of our sister girls wailing down the other end of the phone. I think of the mattress coming into the lounge room for the women who is now homeless. I think of our women being demonised by child protection services. I think of our babies being removed and torn from their mother's arms. I think of the police not viewing us as the right type of domestic violence victim. And I think of our women sitting in intimidating courtrooms seeking safety from the same system that on every other day is violent and unjust towards our black bodies. We know that violence against our women continues after the assault through the systemic racism. Domestic violence is crippling for all victims, survivors, and I acknowledge this. The sad reality is our voices, our pain, our solutions are not heard or taken as seriously as white women. We need a holistic approach that addresses not only the immediate problem we face, but also the historic political and socio-economic factors which we did not cause but which contribute to this violence. We need a self-determined, standalone plan designed and delivered by First Nations women. First Nations women have cared for and sustained this country for thousands of generations. Our leadership will only strengthen this country for all. The Albanese government has said that they support a standalone plan to end violence against First Nations women in this country, but they haven't given us any detail or funding commitment to get this critical work done. This is urgent and overdue. We need to work together to make it happen. Today and every day, I will fight for the lives of black women in this country. I will not allow our pain, our struggle, our survival go by the wayside. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Polly. Senators, today we're at our best when we speak from the heart and we speak about domestic violence. I want to 
So how moved I've been with the contributions thus far, talking about one of the most uncomfortable topics. But it is, in fact, one of the most important topics where we can actually demonstrate to the community that this is a topic that affects each and every one of us in our communities, because there's no discrimination when it comes to domestic violence. And if you've never walked the walk, it's not so easy to talk the truth. We in our society need to educate the men and women, the girls and the boys, about respect and respect of one another. And that's why I'm proud to be in the Senate today, because it does demonstrate as senators that we can be respectful to each other and to listen to one another when we're talking about a topic that has touched too many of us and our families. On average, one Australian a week is murdered by her current or former partner in Australia. One in three Australian women have experienced physical, sexual or violence perpetrated by a man that they know. And one in four Australian women have experienced physical and sexual violence, and too many, before the age of 16. The International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women aims to prevent and eliminate violence against women and girls around the world. But we, in our own communities, should be the leaders. We should speak up. And as many here um, have acknowledged that we have community leaders and we have people in this place and the other place and in state parliaments who have made this one of their main aims as public figures to change the attitude of too many who turn a blind eye to what is happening to their neighbours, in their families and, in fact, in their own homes. We need to be open. We need to be able to show compassion in relation to domestic violence. And too often when a woman is in a violent situation and people ask, why doesn't she just leave? But what we should be asking is, who could she turn to and where will she go? We need to remove the burden from victims and provide an opportunity for them to have a safe place to land. It does take enormous courage for a woman to pack up her children and to leave a violent situation. But I'm proud of the Albanese Labor government. I'm proud because we are acting, and I know from the debate today that we have the support of those who have spoken and those who won't get the opportunity today. Because women who escape this violent, intense situation, they need to have somewhere to go. So they need to, we need to provide that affordable housing for these women and for these children. Because if you're a child and you are raised in a, in a home where there is domestic violence and coercion, then you're more likely to stay in those relationships in adulthood. We must break down the barriers and it has been fantastic to have some of our male uh, senators being able to make a contribution today and to hear that they, in fact, have been educated by not only women in this chamber but the other place, but by the leaders in our community. So we can, it's a huge task and we know it is huge, but we have to start because domestic violence is everyone's business. It's not just those people in this chamber. It's not the police force who have to enforce the law, but it is the responsibility of all of us. And that's what we have to encourage men in the community to step in and tell their mates, that's enough, you're going too far. So whatever circumstances you're in, every young girl, every young boy, every male and every female deserve to be treated with respect and protected from any type of violence in this country, because one death is Thank one you, too many. Polly. Senator Payne. Madam Acting Deputy President, and I acknowledge and thank my colleagues for their indulgence. This is 
a very important day uh, here, but not just here, across Australia and also in our region. And I want to record the strong support of the opposition in this place for the statement uh, and for the uh, initiative of, uh, of this debate. Our focus as a government on women's safety was a strong one, as demonstrated in the budget of 2022-23, where we clearly said we want to create an Australia that is free from violence against women and children, and where women are safe and respected by focusing on the four pillars of prevention, early intervention, response and recovery. And our policies and our funding followed that focus. We had a specific minister for women's safety in our government, my friend and colleague, the Hon. Senator Anne Rustin, who is unable to be here this afternoon, and I want to acknowledge her contribution. I had the extraordinary privilege, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President and colleagues, of hosting, chairing uh, perhaps, a significant number of women's roundtables around Australia in my previous ministerial role. In Australian capital cities and in regional areas across the states and territories, some of them forced online by the invidious uh, nature of COVID, but an extraordinary privilege to hear dozens and dozens of Australian women immensely powerful opportunities for them to share their views and their experiences from vastly different walks of life across our country. More times than I care to remember, disclosures were made at those roundtables of individual and family experiences and, inevitably, sometimes for the first time. Everybody would stop in their tracks and realise that we all know someone who has experienced family and domestic violence in their lives. And for many, that is a confronting fact to accept. Today is also an opportunity for me to thank those people who participated in those roundtables, who were so open and frank with us, who challenged me and those who attended. It's also an opportunity, as Senator Pocock did in his remarks, to thank those who worked to support women and their children across Australia and victim survivors across this country. The many frontline workers and organisations that do everything and anything they can to support and protect women and their children and to prevent violence. Many of us here work with them and support them in our communities. Their work is often not acknowledged. And I want to do that now. Across New South Wales and as a minister, I have met so many people whose lives are committed to this issue. I know Paddy Kinnersley and Moo Bolcher here in Parliament this week, and I want to acknowledge them and the work of uh, our watch and also the previous chair, Natasha Stott de Spoyer, for what they do. I want to acknowledge Anne Rose for their vital research, and I want to acknowledge those refuges that exist across our communities that protect women who have nowhere else to go. In New South Wales, and perhaps elsewhere, I'm not sure how far they have spread, but community shelters, the initiative of Annabelle Daniel and so many others, uh, people like Yvonne Keane in Western Sydney, refuges like the Haven in Penrith, such an important service in our community. And just one member of the board, my very good friend, who's actually the mayor of Penrith, Trisha Hitchin, she has gone from police inspector in Western Sydney to a board member of a refuge. She's gone from pursuing perpetrators to ensure that they paid the price for their attacks on vulnerable women and children to being able to support women and children who have nowhere else to go. Trisha doesn't turn a hair at the thought that she needs to pick up the toilet paper supplies or the cereal or whatever it might be for the haven any day. That is nothing to her because it delivers for those women and children, and I'm immensely proud of what she does in my community. As Human Services Minister, I initiated a program in the Department of Human Services in relation to the prevention of family and domestic violence and support for victims and perpetrators called Enough. I was very proud of that. At the moment, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Parliamentary Standards uh, with my colleagues, uh, Senator Chandler and Nola Marino, uh, and Chair Sharon Clayton and others. 
After we've finished with that parliamentary standards report, I really want to make sure we also take steps to address support for people in this place that experience family and domestic violence, the workers, the staff, the contractors Payne, and others, and provide them with some support. As Senator, Senator Ayres, I'll come to you next. I'm going to go to Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence is an annual international campaign that starts on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Violence against women does not happen in a vacuum. It is most often perpetrated by men, and it is time to seriously reckon with that fact and how we change it. A whole-of-society approach that tackles the root cause of the problem, that is patriarchy, and the power imbalance it creates is really the way forward. This means recognizing the systemic ways that women's inequality is linked to violence and how violence and abuse is sustained through this inequality. Women continue to be underemployed, underpaid, and represent the vast majority of workers in precarious and undervalued work, such as in the care economy. Violence against women is preventable, and greater gender equity is at the heart of the solution. We know that First Nations women, as well as women of color, are far more likely to face domestic and family violence. The fact is that Aboriginal women and women of color also face many extra barriers trying to access services. Systemic racism is part and parcel of our institutions, such as health, law enforcement, and justice. There is a complete and utter lack of investment in Aboriginal community control organizations that specialize in providing culturally safe family violence services. Similarly, there are very few services funded especially for women of color or trans women or women with disability. This is an unacceptable situation. We know that family violence increased during COVID, but let's be frank here. Let's look at the truth Violence against women was at epidemic levels in this country even before the pandemic began. And the lack of support services and women's refuges has meant that women have always been trapped in homes with their abusers because they simply have nowhere to go. Every year we count the numbers and every year they are distressingly high. And politicians in this place on days like today say how shocked they are and how terrible it is, yet governments are still unwilling to take the necessary steps and the large scale of investment needed to tackle violence and abuse. Counting Dead Women Australia, who have taken on the heartbreaking and difficult work of doing just that, counting how many women we lose to violence every year, say that as of this week, we have lost 40 women in Australia this year. A case that really broke my heart is that of Arnima Hayat, a 19-year-old medical student who was found dead in a bathtub full of acid in a North Parramatta home in early February. Her new husband was later charged with murder after handing himself in. A young life cut short. Her family said she aspired to be a surgeon. Arnima was just a teenager. This story and others like this can't be just another story. And then we move on. We know what needs to be done, and we must do it now. We know at the heart of violence against women is control, misogyny, and sexism, and a culture that continues to endorse these. This kind of violence happens repeatedly because there are apologists for toxic masculinity in society. It's plainly and painfully obvious that we need to do much more. Governments need to do more. Society needs to do more. Victim survivors who do reach out rely on a system that is desperately underfunded and overstretched. There is a dangerous shortage of services for survivors of domestic violence all over the country at a time when women, some with children in tow, have taken the brave step to walk away from violence, there is nowhere to go, no safe place to go to. Our goal should be to prevent and end domestic violence, 
To do that, we can't have band-aid solutions. We, it can't be one size fits all or something based on administrative rationalism. It has to be holistic an all-encompassing approach that actually changes culture and systems at the same time as it provides the best possible care and services for victims and survivors. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Ayres. I, I want to use the few minutes that I have um, to speak directly to men and boys who might be listening. Violence against women, violence so regularly perpetrated against women and girls, is an issue for you. It affects women, sure, in small ways uh, and in big ways. Sometimes the immediate trauma, sometimes it reverberates in the months and years to follow. It does affect women, sure, but it is perpetrated by men against women and girls. Of course, it's a human rights issue. It really is, though, I think, a men's issue. It is men who perpetrate the violence after all. Why should women and girls bear the burden of dealing with the violence that is perpetrated against them? Individual women and girls bear that burden, of course, when they speak up about violence that is perpetrated against them, when they speak up about the violence that is perpetrated against them or their friends or their daughters, when they speak to the police or to their parents or they go through the long and difficult, unlikely and often fruitless process of seeking justice or just trying to stop it happening again. Imagine then, consider for a moment, the courage and determination of young women, young women like Chanel Contos or Saxon Mullins. What courage, what determination, what decency to put aside their own interests, to put themselves into the public in the interests of all Australian women and girls. And the hundreds of young women with whom they spoke, who spoke up themselves to policymakers about their experience. That, I think, is real courage. We should celebrate their courage, their resilience and the dignity with which they spoke, and we should listen. I don't know if you know, but so often when women get together, if you overhear, they talk about this violence, violence perpetrated against them at home, at work, at school, at university, at their friends' homes, in so many public and private settings. Mostly what men should do is listen. Listen, reflect, act and lead. Because the burden of acting on violence against women should fall on men, uh, all of us. Because if so many women are the victims of intimate partner violence, of sexual assaults in the home, in social settings or in public, or are subjected to sexual harassment at work, then an awful lot of men are engaged in violence. That means that the problem is wide and deep in Australian culture. From brutal, catastrophic assaults to the accumulation of small, daily physical, verbal assaults and intimidations that leech the joy and confidence away from so many women. It's the boys at high school, the men at the pub or the club or the barbecue, male students, lecturers at uni or TAFE, workmates and supervisors who need to show the same courage, the same decency that all those women, Ms Mullins and Ms Contos, have shown, to stand up, to take the wind out of the sails of men who say things that denigrate women, make light of violence or commit violence. Culture is critical. It doesn't remove individual responsibility or agency, but leadership matters, and so does culture and behaviour at work, school, uni and TAFE. Workplace sexual harassment is violence perpetrated against women in their workplace. Again, it's women who provided leadership here. I saw that the Attorney-General uh, made some appointments today to the Respect at Work Council. Uh, and I want to uh, recognise uh, some of the women who I know who have been appointed to that council. Congratulate everyone who has been appointed to that council. But Emmeline Gask, Julia Fox, Joe Schofield, Mel Donnelly and Abby Kendall are women who in the trade union movement have led the fight against sexual harassment in the workplace. I want to congratulate them uh, in anticipation of all the leadership that they are going to show again. Of course, violence against women and girls happens everywhere, in families, at school, at work, in political parties and parliaments, in the street, in our clubs, our organisations and in our unions. 
When we see it, men must act. Call out thuggishness, misogyny, violence. Misogyny, whether it's deliberate and calculated or careless or reckless. That's my message to men and boys. Stand up with the courage of the women and girls in our lives. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. I think there are a few other issues that unite everyone in this place uh, than this issue. And can I commend uh, Senator Ayres and the other men who have spoken on this uh, issue here today? While the National Day to Prevent Violence Against Women is one day, we have to find in this place a way to make it every single day that we stand up in this place, lead by example and do everything we can to el eliminate violence against women. This unites us as women, this unites us as senators, and this unites us as human beings. All of us in this place know somebody who is either the victim of coercion, the victim of domestic violence, physical violence, sexual violence, and some, uh, as we've just heard so poignantly, have multiple members in the case of Senator Nampajimpa Price whose female relatives and friends have been murdered. One of the things I think we, we all need to stand up and say very clearly, there is no such thing as family violence. There is no such thing as domestic abuse. It is violence, it is murder, and it is a crime. And somehow, by diminishing this as family violence or as things that are acceptable to remain hidden in plain sight behind closed doors, has to end. And I think we are in such a great position to do that because it does unite each and every one of us. I was very, very proud to be a member of the Cabinet Task Force on Women's Safety and Economic Security uh, with my other Cabinet colleagues who, did, who put so much work and passion into the women's budget statements and into the many programs that we initiated with great passion for women's safety and women's economic security, because there cannot be no safety without economic security. But we knew, and I think we all know here today, that no matter how many policies you have and how much money we throw at this issue, as important as they both are, nothing will change if we do not change the attitudes of all Australians. 50 per cent of Australians don't know what to look for. They don't know what it looks like, and they certainly do not know how to call it out. So not only do we have responsibility to set the example here, to make sure we support the best possible budget statements, the best possible policies, and support the government of the day to implement it, we have to do more in our own communities, in our own families, to call it out, to call it out for what it is, and whether you are in an, uh, at an Aboriginal community in Alice Springs or whether you are our neighbours next door, this is happening. I just wanted to quote um, from the United Nations who I think, uh, and the UN Secretary General who said that achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls is the unfinished business of our time and how right he is, because this is not just an issue for women in other nations. It is as much of a problem in our own societies, as much as we try to uh, perhaps not accept that this is the case. Violence against women and girls is one of the most widespread, persistent and devastating breach of human rights in our own nation. And I think until we can all keep saying this clearly, that this is a problem for us as much as it is for anywhere else, whether you are a vulnerable woman anywhere in this nation, where you are vulnerable, whether overseas, whether it's war, whether it's famine, um, whether it's you know, many other factors that make people vulnerable, you can be just as vulnerable in the house next door to us in all of our suburbs all around our nation. So having a look at this and accepting that this is a problem for us and having so many men in this chamber today calling it out, I think is a great, great
great next step. So let's do what we can in this place on a multipartisan basis to make every single day a day where we work together to eliminate violence in all its forms against women and girls. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Violence against women and children is not inevitable. It does not have to be the standard we set for ourselves as a nation. It does not have to take the toll that it does on women and children in our world. Too many women and children experience gender-based violence. I have experienced it as a child and I know the lifelong uh, psychological damage that it can do. We know that one woman dies every 10 days at the hands of her former or current partner. 30 per cent of women have experienced violence by a partner other than a person or a stranger since uh, uh, or another known person or a stranger since the age of 15. We all know it needs to stop. I do know, note that we need to talk deeply about these issues uh, because when people say it is a crime, well yes it is a crime, but not every child will want to send their father to jail, for example. And it's really important that we know how to stop this abuse while supporting families, whether they choose to stay together or separate, through that journey in a way that keeps everybody safe. Every Australian has, should have the right to live a life free from violence. I'm proud of what our government is doing in partnership with state and territory governments. And that is indeed about addressing underlying factors that drive gender-based violence, underlying factors that we can change, that do relate to cultural and gender norms. We know that um, men, of course, experience gender-based violence too. They can experience family and domestic violence, but it doesn't happen at the same rate as it does to women. One in 13 men, according to the data, has. And um, I recognise uh, that there may be more men in, in this context. But it does not detract from the fact that it is often gender norms uh, that underlie the nature of gender-based domestic violence that are part of generating that violence to start with. And so we have, when we have debates in this chamber where we talk about violence against men being under-recognised, but do it in a way that uh, exacerbates restrictive gender norms and continues to uh, um, put people in very, very narrow boxes, we're not going to fix anyone's uh, domestic or gender-based violence issues. So in that context, addressing these issues of family and domestic violence, we can talk about ending violence against women and children, and that is not to make it uh, as if we are deprioritising men. Because when we value people's uh, ability to live freely, express their uh, gender identity, for example, to exhibit feminine characteristics without being seen as weak. Frankly, that creates... Uh, we know, for example, that men don't speak up uh, about violence because it can be seen uh, as a weakness. So when we liberate ourselves from restrictive notions of gender and who's safe and who's not and how and why, we can recognise uh, where gender-based violence comes from. We know, of course, that women and children are more likely to experience domestic violence. 
and that is because the shape of those gender norms that also, as I said, can make men victims too. So in this context, uh, it's really important that we have a strong national plan that unpacks cultural factors as well as practical ones, housing to flee violence, new frontline workers, positive duties on employers. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Senate and um, thank all colleagues for their contributions to this debate today. Um, I especially want to thank those uh, senators who have suffered violence for sharing their very powerful stories. Um, uh, it's been a difficult debate to sit here and listen to as someone who has experienced family violence, uh, but an important debate. And um, sometimes I think senators and MPs, uh, we certainly um, when we bear too much of ourselves um, for the sake of breaking the convention of speeches uh, that are very matter of fact in this place, um, we can often feel like we've said too much. Um, this is a debate where not enough can be said and not enough can be said uh, from personal reflections. It, it supports and helps women uh, in the community to hear these very personal and deeply powerful stories being said here uh, in our most powerful place. Um, there are women on every side of this chamber who can speak from personal experience and that speaks to the prevalence of this issue in our society. Uh, it's a sad state of affairs but it's uh, um, a situation that um, uh, allows us to talk frankly and um, I think quite personally today. I'm very thankful for the work that has been undertaken by senators in this chamber over many years and I just you know I do want to acknowledge that work. Um, there's been calls for funding strategies, uh, efforts to highlight the importance of this issue and perhaps one piece of that puzzle seems insignificant against the huge insurmountable problem we face. Uh, but when you put those things all together, they actually have delivered, I think, um, uh, strategies that can work and a discussion in this country that has changed. Um, so I want to thank Senator Waters for your continued um, uh, support of women um, and uh, for always making sure this is on the agenda. Um, I want to thank um, Senator Payne, who um, worked very, very hard uh, in the previous um, parliament. Um, Senator McAllister, obviously my friend, who always gives me a pat on the back after these speeches, <laughs> um, and Senator Gallagher, our current um, uh, Minister for Women, who, um, when I was um, growing up and I didn't really know much about politics, I knew that Senator Gallagher was um, a boss <laughs> uh, and I knew she was um, the kind of woman that would get things done and so I'm really pleased and proud that she is our Minister for Women and I know that she really cares about this issue. Um, I just wanted to you know, thank those, those women and thank the Chamber for this discussion today but I wanted to thank one other woman that's here and that's um, Helena Brunker who's in the Chamber today. She's an ANU intern and she's been working in my office uh, on some work around the operation and efficacy of Australian consent laws, uh, which is part of the discussion that we need to have um, around um, uh, ending uh, gender-based violence in this country. Um, it's really tough work and for such a young woman she's um, taken on this work um, with her uh, skill and um, you know without being daunted by the task ahead of her and I, I think in contributing to this debate today I just wanted to sort of speak to Helena and your friends uh, and your generation and really um, acknowledge that this is um, an opportunity for for us to talk about the work that we're doing and the work that we've done uh, but, but I'd like to think that when your generation gets the opportunity uh, to sit in these seats, we're not talking about this issue in the same way anymore. 
and we're not talking about these things from personal experience because we've put an end to domestic violence and to gender-based violence and to sexual assault that isn't um, uh, able to be rectified through any form of justice for victims. Um, that's a tall ask, but we take that on and we thank you and your generation for giving us something to work towards, giving us something to deliver. I want to thank, finally, um, my family and um, my mum, who doesn't talk very much about this issue and doesn't talk a lot about the past, but is very special to me. And I want to thank her. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Elimination of Violence, uh, International Elimination of Day Against Ending Violence Against Women is a very significant one. But I don't think we should confine that to talking about this issue for one day. And I think what we've heard in the chamber today uh, is about that prevalence that this issue touches every woman, but also every family and every community across Australia. Before I entered this place, I worked in the family and domestic violence sector for nearly two decades. And it's an issue uh, that I've spoken at length about, written about in research, worked in frontline services such as the police, in refuges. I've packed up Christmas gifts and put teddy bears on the beds of kids going into refuges who have been separated because of violence that's happened in their households. And it's a heartbreaking experience when you have to do that work. But last night I had the pleasure of attending the Our Watch event that was held here at Parliament House. And I want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Senator Waters, now leader here in the Senate, and her work in the Parliamentary Friends Group alongside Bridget Archer and, and Alicia Payne as well. Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. And I, I had a great time catching up with colleagues and reflecting on the time that I was on the Our Watch board. And I also worked um, before this uh, to the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in developing the blueprint to the first national plan in this country. And I was the only First Nations woman on that committee, lone voice, speaking to the Prime Minister. And, uh, I also want to acknowledge the work of the then Minister uh, Tanya Plibersek, who is part of the Labor Party, who was the Women's Minister at the time. And during that time, the Time for Action report was handed down um, or, or into this place. And I was honoured to be part of some of those key recommendations that recommended our watch and Anne Rose as Senator Payne uh, reflected as being developed during that time. And last night was a reflection of how far those organisations have come when I hear about their work that they've done in this space, but also how far we have to go. And when I think about the prevalence and I think about the stories and I think about all of the things that are still happening across Australia, I know that there is so much work for us to do collectively, and especially in regards to violence against First Nations women and their children. Um, I saw the recent announcement of the government's ambitious plan to end violence uh, against women in a generation, and a key part of that was the standalone plan. I've relentlessly advocated for this for more than a decade as a standalone plan. I'm, I'm glad to see this government taking it. Um, on board. It's a plan that's got to be created by mob for mob and it has to be designed to give communities support they need and to take into consideration some of those cultural factors that are unique and the solutions that are unique, um, in fact, across this country. In the 46th Parliament, uh, I co-signed a motion alongside Senator Thorpe to trigger an inquiry into missing and murdered First Nations women and children in this country. And tomorrow it will commemorate its one-year anniversary, and, and I'm, I'm really proud to say that um, Senator Green and Senator Scar, um, in their stewardship of the Senate committee, uh, have been very mindful of the issues and the stories that will be told in this committee. Um, you know, we know the unacceptable rates of First Nations women and compared to non-First Nations women um, they are up to 12 times more likely to be murdered. And I want to acknowledge also the other First Nations senators in this chamber and in this place and the other place who have those stories as well that reverberate across our families and our communities. Um, these are unacceptable and disproportional rates. And regardless of numbers, we know that far too many of our women are dying. 
and that enough, not enough is being done to stop this from happening. And it's no surprise to those who've worked in this area, who's been affected by it, that this hurt, this grief, this trauma is still reverberating across our communities. The truth is we still don't know the true extent of that, and that's because some of these cases are unreported, the data is inconsistent, and in fact, even today, the media didn't show up to talk about the inquiry. Now that's telling, that's why we're having this inquiry in the first place. We sent out a media alert, asked them to come, and they didn't turn up. So if we see the 60 minutes coverage, we see the vigils, the rallies, but we also hear the reverberating silence. The next 16 days, I want everyone to remember that as we move forward, it's about action. Your activism matters, and here in the federal parliament is Thank where you, it Senator starts. Cox. Your time has expired. Senator Payman. Thank you, Deputy Acting President. This Friday, the 25th November, marks the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. It starts the global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which concludes on the 10th December, which is International Human Rights Day. Around the world, there has been an explosion of activism responding to violence against women and girls. Since the hashtag MeToo movement gained international attention five years ago, the momentum has continued, and I want to acknowledge the ongoing grassroots activism from women defending their own human rights, whether it's here in Australia, uh, women such as the formidable Grace Tame, or elsewhere across the world, such as the women in Iran. It is important for us to acknowledge one of the most widespread human rights abuses in the world. I'm a member of the Subcommittee of Human Rights and in the light of recent inquiry into rights of women and children, yesterday I had the pleasure of meeting Emma Macy Storch, the director and producer of a documentary called Gita. This film set in the urban slums of Agra in India tells the story of Gita Mahor, a mother of three daughters whose husband tried to kill them in their sleep by maliciously throwing acid on them. The incident resulted in Gita being badly injured, two daughters were severely scarred, and the baby tragically passed away. The reason for this atrocious act of violence stemmed from the husband's frustration of having three daughters and no sons. But no reason will ever warrant or justify domestic and family violence. Despite permanent disfigurement caused by the burns, Gita and her daughters have become loud activists calling for an end to gender-based violence and criminalising acid attacks. Gita's story shows the power of everyday heroism that creates grassroots change, change we desperately need. Worldwide, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. In Australia, one woman dies every 10 days at the hands of her former or current partner. Family and domestic violence continues to be a scourge on our society, and we must do everything to end it. Family and domestic violence is ex experienced at disproportionately high rates uh, by First Nations women, as we've heard already today, culturally and linguistically diverse women and children, people with disability and people who identify as LGBTQI+. It is on every person to change this. We must do better. Family violence doesn't only have a human cost, but also an economic cost. This issue continues to drive gender inequality in the areas of employment, participation and financial security, and is the leading cause of homelessness in women and children. In WA, Taking inspiration from the global 16 days of activism, we have the 16 days in WA campaign. Western Australians are encouraged to create change, to educate, motivate and advocate in their own communities and stand up to stop violence against women. I want to acknowledge the tireless work of WA Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, Simone McGurk. She's an incredible leader for my home state on this issue but this work is not for any one minister or person. It is a shared mission. It is everybody's responsibility and everybody's business. 
At the federal level, we have a lot of work to do in this space, but we have started. I'm proud to be part of the Albanese Labor government as we have legislated to provide 10 days of paid family domestic violence leave. Economic security is a key factor determining whether a person can escape a violent relationship. So this will save lives. We all need to stand up and do our bit because ending violence against women is everybody's business. And I commend every senator and colleague in this chamber for their efforts and contributions today. On this International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, we need to work together to ensure a safer Australia for all. Thank you. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy Chair. Yes, Senator Hanson. Thank for the call as a party leader and also the fact that the Greens have ha already had um, a few speakers on this issue that I believe that One Nation should actually have the chance to have this, this um, discussion, considering that debate will shut down at 5.30. Thank you very much. Um, International Day for Domestic Violence Against Women, and we know it is horrific and what has happened, the death of women and uh, the impost that has had on children. But as I keep saying all the time, it is also about domestic violence against men. I've been listening to the speeches here in this chamber and I have not heard anyone refer to the domestic violence that is carried out against men. 25 per cent of domestic violence in this country is the, attributed to women. If you want to stamp out domestic violence, it must be stamped out truthfully to speak about it yeah. instead of being in here and beating your chest about it. You know, I've spoken about domestic violence. I've grown up with, um, I, I never grew up with the domestic violence in my own household. I was very, very fortunate. But I had a husband who was domestic violence, so I know what it's about. But the whole fact is that you, you women that have uh, stood Senator up here Hansen, today. Please direct your comments to the chair and do not refer to people as you across the chamber. The women in this chamber, the senators, you have, you have sons as well, you know, sons and, and husbands and brothers and uncles and these people who are not domestic violence perpetrators. This is not what you should be pushing. Push right across the board. Look at the problems that we have. If you look at our, our court system, um, in, families, in the family law courts, that's where a lot of problems is happening because men are absolutely frustrated, and some women, because they don't have the opportunity to have, spend time with the children. They're denied that right. If you go to the guts of the problem, you will solve a lot of the problems if you deal with the family law courts issues and then allow parents to see their children, you might stop half the problems that are going on. You know, it is a very important issue. I was, this was my time to actually debate my bill on the voice to parliament, but you actually then denied me that right to take away my time where a senator only has two, two, twice a year to debate this. So therefore you've taken away from that time. Why? Because you didn't want it to, to debate on the voice to parliament. But we're here discussing about, we are here now discussing about this because you didn't want it to go to the, go to the vote whatsoever. So you denied me the right to, to actually put that up. But domestic violence, and until you address it and acknowledge that it is also women that are murdering men, it is women that are 
responsible for um, a lot of the problems as well. So you need to actually address the problem. Is why why it is happening. Don't go around beating your chest here and say, well, how are you going to deal with it? I've just told you, the biggest problems coming from the family law courts. Start addressing those problems in the family law courts and let parents be parents to the children. You'll get a lot rid of a lot of the angst that is happening. You know, even fathers who go through it, who have thrown out their homes with their children, and the fact is there was nowhere for them to go. I've championed the fact and pushed for them. They must be looked after as well and have, and have refuge and can get, can get the assistance and help that they need. But it's all about women. Yes, women are, men are the main perpetrators, but they are not the sole perpetrators. What about the woman who threw cooking oil over her husband? What about the woman who stabbed her husband to death? Don't you care about that? What about the women that actually tried to, to um, run over their husbands? Don't you care about that? You know, they are still people that need representation fairly across the board mm. and to discuss it in a fair and honest way. You know, it's and another thing that needs to be addressed is parental alienation. That is not being addressed either. And until we address that, you're going to have domestic violence. And, you should, and, and I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you what happened. My husband was giving me a hard time. I cooked dinner for him. You know what? I said to him, "Your dinner's ready," and he never come up for his dinner. So I took it down after the third time, and he was standing across the the pool table, and I said, your dinner's ready. He said, oh, I'll come up when I'm ready. You know what? I said, you're ready now. And I threw that plate with full, full of a dinner across the table at him, and it smashed against the wall. So I actually, I admit, I admit to the fact that you can have your agreements and disagreements, and you can actually both um, get into arguments and debates in a household. Don't make out that it's just purely men that are responsible for this as well, because women can instigate it and cause problems in the household as well. The few, sheer fact is don't put up ads that say men should go to, to get counselling to do with the domestic violence. Women need to be told where to go to, because women are responsible and can instigate domestic violence in a household. But let's look at it fairly right across the board and let's treat everyone equally rather than what sex you are. Oh, it's all right to call a person a sex a woman now when you're talking on this topic any other time. You know, there's no male or female. It's like we don't have a sex or an identity. You use the sex when it suits you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. The time for statements has now expired and we uh, move back to government business. I call the clerk. Treasury laws amendment. Oh, government business order of the day number four, Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Dean Smith. Senator Davey. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I'm in continuance. Um, I was saying uh, earlier that uh, I can't support this bill because um, it is, again, the Albanese government rejecting uh, rural and regional Australia. And I was talking about what we did in government um, and our future for fuels and vehicles strategy. We also committed $2.1 billion to help increase the uptake of low and zero emissions vehicle technologies, and market movements were happening. There is an uptake of electric vehicles. And the range and choice of suitable cars is widening. Indeed, uh, just tomorrow, thanks to Senator David Pocock, I'm going to trial a, um, an electric ute, which uh, will be an experience indeed, because one of the things I hear from where I live is there are just no uh, commercially available electric utes or uh, decent farm vehicles yet. So, given that, and given Technology is advancing. The market is actually determining it. Why is the government deciding it needs to interfere in the market? And for what purpose? Indeed, the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office have reported that this bill will cost billions of dollars through the next decade. And to back that up, to back up that conclusion, Treasury isn't even able to articulate the long-term costs of the measure. 
billions of dollars in unnecessarily foregone revenue helping the elite when we face massive infrastructure rebuilds because of the floods that have gone on now. Massive ongoing and extensive natural disaster repairs to our roads network, of which these electric vehicles will contribute nothing to general revenue because they don't pay fuel excise. Billions of dollars in lost revenue, which could have alternatively been put towards hospitals, more regional doctors, more regional teachers, more support for small businesses. But no, the government is trying to convince Australians that they are strong fiscal managers. Well, this bill shows they are not. This bill is a typical example of their usual modus operandi. Their grab for votes, irrespective of the benefits or the consequences of their too little thought through policies. And it's not just the independent parliamentary budget office that thought it an unsound idea. Despite being called tax reform by the Treasurer, the Senate inquiry held into this legislation showed it to be high cost, low impact, and that it has been designed with no consultation with industry, government or civil society. A number of experts have actually raised serious questions about the equity and fiscal sustainability and price pressures this will place on the EV market. Professor Miranda Stewart, director of the tax group at the University of Melbourne Law School and fellow at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy, is quoted as saying, the policy will deliver sub subsidy to a rather narrow class of employee beneficiaries and provides the largest benefit to the highest income earners. And guess what? They don't live in regional Australia. The bill does not line up with the government's sensible economic policy and fiscal repair promises that they had prior to the election. And the Treasurer said in June, and I quote, the government must make the hard decisions necessary for responsible budget repair, making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes." End quote. So why are we buying votes? Through subsidising electric vehicles for those who can already afford them, those who are getting a salary sacrifice benefit. The government can't say what this bill will actually do for emissions reduction. As I said earlier, if you plug your car in overnight to recharge, chances are you're plugged into the grid and you're burning coal. They can't say what this bill will do to the EV market, and they can't even say how they would assess whether it is a success or not. The best thing the government could do is scrap this bill, take the revenue that they would achieve through, through the um, ongoing fringe benefit tax and invest in pra practical measures that would actually drive investment into EV infrastructure, which would, by its own measure, lead to market change and lead to behavioural change and see more people take up the opportunity to drive electronic vehicles. Because, as I said at the outset, we on this side, we're not anti-electronic vehicles. We are not electric, and we're not anti-low um, zero emissions transport. But we are pro investing into how to make it possible and not just delivering a benefit to those who actually don't need it. Market pressures and technology advances are and will continue to drive wider uptake of electric vehicles. We will soon see the day when we do get the long-distance trucks and cars and utes and farm vehicles and, indeed, even electric vehicles capable of towing trailers and caravans, as um, Senator O'Sullivan talked about in his earlier speech. And we will see vehicles that will be able to travel the hundreds of kilometres 
that I indeed do just to get to work here in Canberra uh, before being needed to recharge. But that is where we are moving to, making current electric vehicles cheaper for a narrow, privileged few will not make that happen. So I cannot support this bill. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment mm. Electric Car Discount Bill 2022. The history of climate change and related energy bills is replete with terrible governance, shoddy governance, deceitful governance. There have been genuine errors made. There have been decisions taken on greed and self-interest, contradicting the science. And now we have inappropriate market manipulation from a cynical, meddling government. This bill is designed to force the uptake of electric vehicles. What hubris, what deceit. And who pays, as always, the people, as always the people are paying. How can the government, the Albanese government, ignore the critical shortage of minerals essential to producing this many electric vehicles? Lithium has been a global arms race fought between electric vehicles and Labor's other loves, batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. There's not enough lithium on earth for one of these follies, let alone all five. Stuart Crow, chair of Lake Resources, said, and I quote, there simply isn't going to be enough lithium on the planet, regardless of who expands and who delivers. It won't be there. End of quote. So what's the government's plan to handle the lithium shortage in the electronics industry as net zero sucks up supply of cobalt, lithium and copper? Demand inflation will force these resources up in price over the next few years. How's the government going to explain to citizens why their phones, laptops and household goods have been made unafford unaffordable from so-called sustainable green technologies? By the way, have you noticed how United Nations World Economic Forum sustainability programs can exist only with subsidies, meaning they're not sustainable? Back to the point. The engineering boundaries are real, and wishy-washy responses about finding new solutions don't work when the best solution, lithium, is being wasted on the vanity of net zero. Labor's much-hyped goal of net zero for 2050 will run out of charge between 2025 and 2030 when lithium supplies are predicted to dry up. This shortage is already manifest in mineral prices. In 2020, lithium was $6,000 per tonne. Today, today, what is it? I'll tell you, it's sitting around $78,000 per tonne, 13 times higher. Everything this precious resource is being wasted on will be sitting in landfill before 2050. I'll say it again. Everything this precious resource is being wasted on will be sitting in landfill, buried before 2050. Every wind turbine, every solar panel, every big battery, every home battery, all of it rotting while the earth and its oceans are torn apart to feed the monstrous dream of net zero through the strip mining of the seabed for rare earth minerals that are necessary for the production of these follies. Even electric vehicle manufacturers admit to being in trouble. The World Economic Forum, whose policies seem to find their way into Australian legislation, thinks we need five billion electric vehicles to achieve net zero. That's not five billion through to 2050. That is five billion every five to 10 years, forever. No wonder you're looking startled. This is news to most people in this room. And the reason electric vehicles are so damn expensive is because in manufacturing electric vehicles, they're resource and energy hogs, resource guzzlers with a huge environmental footprint, far greater than petrol and diesel cars. These price hikes, which have already started, are set to push almost all purely electric vehicles beyond the luxury car threshold required to qualify for Labor's amendment to the Fringe Benefits Tax Assessment Act. After the Greens and Senator Pocock amendment goes through, in 2025, hybrids will no longer be included in the bill. Price inflation will ensure not much else will either. When President Biden gave a $7,000 subsidy, the first thing that happened, car manufacturers put up their price $7,000. Subsidies make things dearer, not cheaper. They shift the price label, but not the affordability. Perhaps some made in China cheaper EVs that may or may not still be working in 2030 might benefit. 
Labor could, of course, raise the threshold. But at what point do we say that big business is, given, is being given a subsidy from working Australians to buy luxury vehicles? Our European friends are a decade ahead of us in this madness. They've dismissed policies like this as expensive, wasteful and counterproductive. Their conclusion is that government interference benefits rich companies at the expense of natural market competition. It's why German Finance Minister Christian Lindner said, quote, we simply cannot afford misguided subsidies anymore. These cars have so far been subsidised over their lifetime with up to €20,000, even for top earners. That's too much. We can save billions there, which we can use more sensibly." End of quote. Germans saying this. This bill for luxury foreign vehicles, electric vehicles is designed to fix a number on Labor's spreadsheet of carbon dioxide output. It's not to assist a transition to electric vehicles for the general public. The fastest rise in product quality occurred when electric vehicles were forced to compete on merit against their oil and gas hydrocarbon fuel betters. It was only then, when the customer was king, that their price came down, their quality went up and the, their range increased slightly. When European governments handed the electric vehicle market billions in subsidies, car manufacturers grew fat and lazy. They took the money, slacked off development and raised their prices, knowing that public money would cover the difference. This is transfer from wealth from taxpayers to electric vehicle manufacturers. Labor's bill is more of the same failed economics that fundamentally misunderstands what drives success. Given the price dynamics at play, if anything, this bill penalises full electric vehicles and preferences hybrids. At the same time hybrids begin to win the consumer war, this government's net zero policies are pushing up the price of fuel, leaving every car owner worse off. We're quickly reaching a point where car ownership will become a rare privilege that won't impact anyone at all in this chamber, yet it will make the lives of everyday Australians an intolerable misery. As Norway, the world's premier electric vehicle buyer, has stated that they want to reduce individual car ownership and see their population walk or catch public transport. The United Nations World Economic Forum EV policy is not about having different cars, it's about no cars. No cars. Good luck telling Australian tradies that, but that's what will happen. These cars have no resale value, the EVs have no resale value because they tend to be sold when the batteries are cooked. If we're talking about sustainability, electric vehicles are on a swift path to the landfill, unlike conventional cars that have many lives and many owners. To get electricity consumption down in order to improve range, EVs are made of composite materials, aluminium and plastics. Most of the steel in the subframe needed to hold the extra weight of the battery. Recycling is of course possible, although with the price of electricity in Australia, thanks to weather-dependent solar and wind driving up power prices, our recycling industry is struggling. Think about this. Much like used plastics, glass, solar panels and wind turbines, EVs will not be recycled beyond the copper wires and the little steel that has been used. If electric vehicles are a less desirable product at a terrible price, heading towards extinction, what of their, what of their alleged climate virtue? Well, let's think, consider that. This virtue is not based on science. It's not a calculation of their cradle to grave life cycle. It's a self-declaration. Electric vehicles identify as net zero, and so this government treats them as such. No one is looking at the harm these electric vehicles cause out of sight in the third world, or asking why they still have a social license, given that most of them source raw materials on the back of child slave labor. Child slave labor. What is the environmental cost of the third world mining operations to build a car that sits in an Australian dealership with a green virtue sticker on the side? Completely irrelevant as far as this government is concerned. Why else would Labor throw good money after bad behind Congo cobalt? Labor are turning a blind eye to the 40,000 children in the Congo mining the cobalt for EVs. After this bill, 45,000. Leading electric vehicle manufacturers claim to be free of child slave labour, yet their supply contracts for cobalt are with companies with child slave labour in their supply chain. Deceit. We like to think that our civilization has advanced, yet these net zero technologies, more than any other, 
are indulging in the cheap, largely unregulated labour of poor neighbours and their children. And when it's not children down mines clawing at the ground with their hands, it's the toxic mining practices for rare earths that make coal mines look like an oasis. This is the truth behind the green sticker. Electric vehicles need mining, and the Greens hate mining, so they tell us. Greens and Teals demand coal stay in the ground. How can anyone make more EVs without using coal to smelt the steel, the aluminium, process the plastics from coal and oil, and make the glass? How can we make more electric vehicles without oil in the bearings? It seems the government and the Greens and Teals cheer squad are determined to find out. It's impossible. Add to the list of disasters waiting to happen is the effect of this many electric vehicles on the national electricity grid. Now we're talking about something that's hurting everyone. All it takes is three or so electric vehicles in an average suburban street to charge at the same time and the power lines melt down or shut off. Weather dependent power like solar and wind cannot charge this many electric vehicles. Full stop. That's it. I'm sure this bill will lead to government departments buying another off-market round of electric vehicles to zip around Canberra. What it will not do is save the planet. What it will not do is make electric vehicles more affordable. What it will not do is ease the cost of living. What it will not do is create a better, more competitive product. And who will pay? As always, the people will pay for this government's stupidity and deceit. And even if they are miraculously delivered in this fit of madness, as a product, electric vehicles have serious unresolved issues, like their tendency to spontaneously combust. Australia's firefighters have complained that they do not have the ability to put out lithium-ion battery fires in electric vehicles. So what happens when our underground car parks are packed full of these things and one starts off a chain reaction? What happens? What happens if they catch fire beneath apartment blocks? inside shopping centres, in tunnels. The ventilation of our buildings and car parks are not designed to handle the safety issue, the hazard and risk issue of these cars, and there will be serious accidents in tight residential areas. If there's a, water, a fire, the water used to fight that fire is 10 times the amount for a conventional car fire. Firefighters are terrified of this. Even worse, that water becomes toxic as a result of contact with the toxic battery fire and must be captured and treated. Allowing firefighting water to run off site is an environmental contamination. EV does not stand for electric vehicle. EV stands for environmental vandalism. This bill states that its purpose is, quote, to encourage a greater uptake of electric cars by Australian road users to reduce Australia's carbon dioxide carbon dioxide emissions from the transport sector by making cars more affordable." End of quote. Let me be straight. This is a big business perk to help the richest people in this country improve their environmental virtue signalling and their social credit status on paper. Nothing more. Nothing more. Labor is offering another incentive to the rich urban professional teal voters to come on over to Labor and to keep their buddies in government, the Greens, with them. Yet underneath it all, the Australian people are left to pick up the bill for Labor's empty virtue signalling and economic stupidity. This government needs to stop sucking up to the teals and start governing for Australia, replace policies from the United Nations and World Economic Forum Alliance that began in 2018 with policies instead that serve Australia. I want to mention a couple of points from Judith Sloan, the economist and journalist. At a time when United Nations World Economic Forum policies drive goals of converting our transport fleet to electric electricity and hugely increasing demand for electricity, our bureaucrats pushed United Nations World Economic Forum policies to kill reliable baseload coal power and replace it with expensive, intermittent, unreliable wind and solar. And here's what Judith Sloan said. It is surely ironic it was Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen who explicitly outlined the numerical challenge in front of transforming the national electricity market in such a short time frame. He has told us we will need 22,000 solar panels every day and 40 wind turbines every month, that's more than one a day, for the next eight years. There will also be a requirement for at least 10,000 kilometres of additional transmission lines. At the same time, we'll see 11,000 
11,000 megawatts of coal-fired generation coming off capacity. This is insane. And who will pay? It's the people who will pay. We need sensible government, honest governance. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we stand for affordable, clean, secure mobility for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Roberts. Senator Brockman. Thank you, President. I too rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment electric car discount bill. Um, and it probably comes as no blinding surprise to people that I'm going to speak about this from a regional perspective. Uh, but also a perspective of where I currently live. Now I do have to I live in Perth, obviously doing this job has some demands on it in terms of travelling to Canberra, travelling around the entirety of my home state of Western Australia, which means that being relatively close to an airport is pretty essential. So uh, I do live in a, uh, a, 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 I guess an inner suburb of Perth. Uh, and we have seen uh, in our area an absolute explosion of electric cars in the, in the, just this year. We have seen a significant number uh, of all models of electric car, but particularly Teslas, which are highly visible, so you notice them when they're on the road. Uh, and we've seen you know, a significant uptake in people deciding through their own purchasing decisions, looking at their own requirements for uh, uh, transport range uh, and the electrical system they have on their, uh, on their home in terms of being able to charge off their own solar cells, um, we've seen people deciding through their choice to take up an electric car. Uh, but one thing I can absolutely guarantee those listening to this debate and those in the chamber is that you don't see that same uptake in regional and rural Australia, and you don't see that same uptake for a pretty obvious reason. The capacity uh, to charge and the range is simply not there. People need to be able to drive long distances. As my good friend and colleague Senator O'Sullivan pointed out, people need to be able to tow heavy weights. They need to be able to have ranges that go beyond 50, 100, 200 kilometres. They need to be able to move around the vast state of Western Australia uh, uh, as they have been able to uh, with a, a petrol engine car, with an internal combustion engine car, and continue to do their business, lead their lives. And so we see in this bill a huge shift of wealth, effectively, from outer metro and regional areas to the inner city. As I said, I, I, I do live in a, in a relatively inner suburb, and we are seeing electric cars. So why? Why do we need to, through this bill, give a tax break to those inner city people who are, quite frankly, already buying electric cars? The uptake is pretty significant. And that is coming at a direct cost, at a direct burden, to those who live in outer metropolitan regions who have further to drive, and those who live in the regions, and those who have a requirement to tow heavy loads, particularly, obviously, uh, you know, of interest to me, the farming community, tradies, um, people who work in the mining industry, people who don't have it. They simply don't have a choice. And it is highly questionable, and I'm not going to go through the technical details again. Senator O'Sullivan did a great job of, of, of going through the technical detail. But it is highly unlikely that using current technology there will ever be a solution. There will ever be a solution to towing heavy weights and having vehicles that can travel long distance in rural and remote Western Australia. So there could be a technological breakthrough. I have no doubt about that. But why then, through this bill, are we effectively penalising those people in outer metropolitan and rural and regional Australia who simply cannot, simply cannot utilise electric vehicles as they currently stand and will stand for the foreseeable future, and providing a subsidy to the inner city. I mean, it, it really does beg a belief, particularly from a government that claims to be the defender of the working people of Australia. I mean, it, it, it absolutely beggars belief. Uh, obviously, um, 
certainly won't be supporting this bill. And there's so many reasons not to support this bill. As I said, it really just represents a transfer of wealth in our society from the regions to the inner city. But it's also bad economic policy. We've got inflationary pressures in the budget. And how does the government choose to respond with measures such as this? measures that potentially just lead to more inflation in our economy. Um, and will it have an impact on carbon emissions? No. Um, experts um, have said, um, and I quote, um, that it will have a negligent, neg uh, negligible impact on reducing Australia's carbon emissions for the transport sector. Government's assertions that this initiative makes the take-up of EVs more affordable is misleading. Private buyers and sole traders of EVs cannot access these savings. Um, there are other measures that uh, uh, would have a far greater short-term benefit for the environment than this measure. So it's not going to help the environment. It represents a transfer of wealth in our society from the regions to the inner city. Uh, and quite frankly, this looks like an ideological frolic. Uh, and it is a bill that really does show the true colours of this government, one that wants to go on ideological frolics to provide lip service to a particular issue. But when it comes to proper policy development, Senator Ayres, you, uh, you think you should be riding a horse, Senator Ayres? Is that what you're trying to get at? I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could provide a tax break to horses if it was of political advantage to the Labor Party, but you choose not to. You choose to provide tax breaks to the inner city elites. I'm sure there'd be plenty of people who'd take a tax break for horses, uh, Senator Ayres, but instead the Labor government provides tax breaks for the inner city elites. For those reasons and many more, I will not be supporting the bill. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Rennick. Ah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and I too rise to speak to this bill, and I'd just like to flag I'll be moving a second reading amendment uh, uh, to this bill uh, to do with recycling, which is very, very important, um, and make sure that we clean the mess that this bill will create. And of course, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, Senator Brockman's words there that this is nothing but a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. Just this week, the Australian Financial Review came out and said that this tax break could be worth up to $30,000. $30,000 for the rich people who can afford to buy an electric car, and that's going to come out of general revenue, which means that the, the, uh, the lower-income earners will have to pay more taxes just to balance the budget. Now, you know, I thought when we've been hearing here from Senator Wong, she's not here today, uh, this afternoon, which is a shame, that, that renewables are cheaper. So can somebody tell me this, that if renewables are cheaper, why do we need to be giving up to a $30,000 tax break for every new EV car that is bought? That is bought. I mean, that is absolutely absurd. And I can tell you something, if you want to look after the environment, the best way to do that is to have a strong growing economy. And there is nothing productive about giving a tax break on a cars that are going to be, dr be driven around the inner city that might have you know, a, a mileage of a couple of hundred kilometres if you're lucky. We're going to be having extension leads running out over footpaths, hanging up over trees. I mean, you know, the, the stupidity, we've seen this in Sydney already where people are trying to charge their cars uh, on the street. You know? with on-street parking. I mean, how dangerous is that? How dangerous is that? And for what? For what? Nothing but a pipe dream, because these people want you to believe that we're struggling under global warming. And we've been told that yesterday by the CSIRO, who've come out and said that the, the temperature has risen by 1.47 degrees since 1910. And uh, I must admit, when I first heard that figure quoted in question time yesterday, I nearly fell out of my chair, because just back in 2018, and I remember these numbers just like that, the CSIRO and BOM said that the temperature has risen by one degree 
in 2018. So in 108 years since 1910, these guys say the temperature has risen by one degree. Now they want, it, want us to believe that it's risen by another 0.47 of a degree in just the last four years. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure it isn't hotter this year. The last two years have been hot, uh, cooler and wetter than the prior years prior to 2020 and 2018. They were quite warm years, I'll accept. But the last couple of years, things have actually cooled off a bit here in Australia, certainly in the east coast, along the east coast, even up in Cairns. I was up in Cairns earlier this year and it was like down to seven degrees. They were complaining they had to put jumpers on for the first time in their lifetime. That's how cold it was at the Cairns show. You know, it never, never happened before. People were wearing jumpers at the Cairns show. Isn't that right, Senator Scar? You know, it just goes to show. And of course, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I, have to, I have to note here that Senator Wong isn't here because she called me a coward yesterday when I questioned these figures and that somehow who was I to question the bomb and the CSIRO? Well, I'll tell you who am I to question the CSIR CSIRO and the bomb. Uh, and uh, that is someone who has studied statistics both in senior, at university and in my postgraduate degree. Uh, so I'm very well versed with statistics and I'm very well versed with record keeping. And uh, it's very important to note that the record keeping that the bomb undertakes has nothing to do with science. It's purely record keeping. You take a measurement, you write the number down, and you store it away for posterity. You don't start creating multiple data sets, uh, change, well, not changing the initial data set, you create a new data set and then you report the whole new data set. And you don't have to take my word for it because back in 2011 there was an independent peer review done on the bomb's observation practices. Now you can look this up, it's a really important one. I haven't talked about this in years because I've you know, been distracted by a few other issues. The Australian Climate Observations Reference Network Surface Air Temperature ACORN Satellite um, Independent Peer Review. Okay? Uh, yeah, Re Report of Independent Peer Review Panel, 4th of September 2011. And I want to come to the key, uh, key paragraph in all of this because they do acknowledge that uh, the Bureau of Meteorology is very good at homogenisation. Now that is double speak for modelling, which is double speak for fudging, right? And I can talk about economists. I've had dealt with economists all my life, and there's a big rift between accountants and economists because we don't like modellers. We like people that measure real things. Right? So let me take to the key paragraph here. The World Meteorological Organisation Guide states that an acceptable range of error for thermometers, including those used for measuring maximum and minimum temperature, is plus or minus 2 degrees, 0.2 degrees. However, throughout the last 100 years, the Bureau guidance has allowed for a tolerance of plus or minus half a degree for field checks of either in-glass or resistance thermometers. This is the primary reason why the panel did not rate the observa observation practices amongst international best practices. So there you have it, Senator Wong. I know you're not in the chamber, but if you're listening, check it out, because this was the review that you uh, obviously commissioned, it was either yourself or Greg Combay, Combay back in 2011, uh, when you were the Environment Minister. Okay, so not my words, independent peer review, 2011. And one of the first questions I asked in estimates as a uh, young uh, whippersnapper back in 2019 was to the Bureau on whether or not they'd reduced that margin of error. And they hadn't. And they hadn't. Plus or minus half a degree is one degree, right? Half, uh, minus half a degree on the low side, plus half a degree on the top side, that is a degree. That is exactly what they're claiming up until about two years ago. So the so-called increase in temperature is purely within the margin of error. I could go on, but I just thought that needed to be said for the record after that insult that uh, 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 an imputation from Senator Wong yesterday about me being a coward. No, it's actually all written here. Now the other thing we need to talk about here is that somehow renewables are cheaper. And I'd really like to know on what basis the Labor Party and uh, Senator Wong, and I've heard uh, uh, the member for Sydney, is it, uh, Tanya Plibersek, say it earlier this week on TV as well, uh, that renewables are cheaper. Now, that's an interesting comment to make because when I was in estimates, I asked Senator McAllister how many kilometres of transmission lines are going to have to be built to reach the 43 per cent reduction in CO2 by 2030. And lo and behold, Senator McAllister had absolutely no idea. Here's the range we were given, somewhere between 5,000 kilometres and 28,000 kilometres. Okay? Can you believe that? That, that? that is a massive range. And I just want you to think about if we've done 28,000 kilometres of ripping out you know, scars across the beautiful countryside, it'll both be farmland and native, native forest, is that good for the environment? 
I don't think so. I don't think scarring the landscape with transmission lines will be good for the environment at all. But that's not all. We'll also be getting the death of uh, eagle hawks, you know, bats. Bats are, you know, with bees, one of the key pollinators of our native plants in this country. But no, 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 no. In the name of reducing carbon emissions, carbon, carbon dioxide, by the way, is recycled naturally, as I said the other day, every four years. That's all free. That's true. If you want free energy, come back to photosynthesis. But I digress. Let's get back to the batteries and talking about batteries. Because I can tell you, if you think transmission lines are going to be bad for the, uh, bad for the environment and solar panels and, and, and wind turbines, wait until you break down what, the cost, what goes into building a battery. Lithium is a 1 per cent ore body. That means you've got to mine 100 tonnes of the ore to get one tonne of uh, lithium. And that involves an intensive electrolysis process to actually get the metal out of the ore. But that's not all, because you can't just go down and get the ore body out of the ground. You've got to go round and around and around in those big uh, mining trucks and the big you know, uh, you know, caterpillars and everything else that picks up all the dirt and cart it out. So you can often have a stripping ratio of up to 10 to 1, which means to get one tonne of uh, lithium metal, you might have to shift 1,000 tonnes of dirt. And guess what? That's just one of the many metals that even goes into a battery. Okay, you've got other things like aluminium, you've got steel, you've got cobalt, and you know, cobalt, where's the world's biggest producer of cobalt? Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, how do they get their cobalt out of the ground? That's right, child labour. Child labour. Gee, that's going to be good for the environment. I mean, it's, it's bad enough that you know, all of these so-called renewables, which they're not, none of this stuff recycles naturally throughout the environment every four years like carbon dioxide does. It's also a human rights issue. It's also a human rights issue, okay, because it's going to be bad for the children in the Congo and who knows what other countries. Uh, and of course, it's obviously the human rights issue here because we're transferring $30,000 uh, every time a new car is bought from the poor to the rich, from the working class to the wealthy. And of course, that is what the Labor Party and the Greens are today. They are the party for the inner city, self loathing, virtue signalling, rent seeking elites. That is what they are. You know, I well remember a former Labor Prime Minister said, uh, you know, God save the Queen because nothing will save the Governor General. Well, let me say, God save the King because nothing will save the Labor Party from the working class when they have their you know, nose driven into the grindstone by the, the increase in taxes and the, and the economic pain that is going to come from higher energy prices and watching as the you know, urban elites drive around with their um, electric cars while you know, the working class is struggling in their uh, petrol cars. And, they're not, you know, and it's not just to hand out $30,000 uh, for a car. It's also going to be the fact the working class are going to have to pay the fuel excise. Okay, because these electric cars aren't going to have any fuel excise. So we're going to have a user toll on them. And then, and then on top of that, I mean, good luck to you trying to actually uh, get um, your car charged. I was actually reading an article on the weekend someone had sent to me where there's now uh, recharging rage in the UK because people have to wait so long to get their car charged that if someone accidentally bumps into the queue, they've been waiting here for three hours, uh, you know, they're starting fights at these recharging stations. It's not like you know, with an internal busting car, you just pull up, fill, fill up your tank and drive away. No, 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 no. no, no. And I'll tell you what, it won't be too long before there's another bill in here where we're suddenly going to have to start building the re recharging stations. I guarantee you that's what will be happening, right? No sooner had the ink dried on the 43 per cent reduction in, trans, uh, in carbon dioxide by 2030, and what have we got? We've got another handout here with the fringe benefits tax for uh, renewable cars. I mean, and it'll just keep on coming, keep on coming. Yeah, I'll, I'll guarantee you that rewiring Australia fund of $20 billion, that'll have to be increased because there was modelling showing the other day it was about $2 billion or a billion, a billion dollars per every, for every kilometre of transmission line or something, some astounding amount. It was estimated to rewire Australia to get the 43 per cent was going to cost something like $100 billion. So the $20 billion rewiring fund is not going to cover it. And if you think that the private sector is going to stump up $80 billion of their own money, forget it. Forget it. Unless, of course, it's superannuation money. It might be, they might get there that way, where they, you know, you know, if it's, it's bad enough that they're, you know, you've got to pay fuel excise, but now you know, you've been forced into paying 12 per cent super, right? You're never going to see our young people, don't think you're ever going to see your super, super again, because they are going to blow it, right? Because these super funds are driven by ideology, not productivity, ideology. 
right? This ESG stuff, right? So you know, and they're all bought. You know, we've got the Marxists in the boardroom now. You know, they're not driven by productivity; they're driven by ideology, and that is a sure recipe to send this country broke. But I just want to touch on one other thing. These electric cars are going to be up to 800 to 1,000 kilograms heavier. That is going to increase the braking speed. Right? So we're going to have more car accidents right? because the, your braking speed is going to be much heavier. The, the weight of these cars can increase by 20 to 30 per cent. We're going to have to use more energy just, just for the car to travel around because they're going to have massive batteries. And these things are solid bricks. Right? They're solid bricks. I mean, imagine the impact of getting uh, T-boned by um, cars, especially here in Australia. Actually, I was just uh, was talking to a, uh, a famous Queenslander, Queenslander of the year 1986, Russell Strong, who did Australia's first liver transplant. And I'll let you guess why we got in touch. Um, he's on my side, by the way, if you're wondering. Um, but yeah, Australia. The reason why we have, we have more um, liver transplants in Australia is because we drive on the left-hand side of the road. So the driver gets T-boned, uh, and obviously, you know, damages the uh, liver, and that's why. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so there's going to be more liver transplants, you know. But the other thing is, what about the uh, southern hairy-nosed wombat? When all these uh, inner-city elites from Sydney and that are driving down in an extra, you know, in their new EV cars and they're going down for their ski trip. I mean, the member for Warringah. I mean, she had a lovely career growing up, travelling the world, you know, competing in ski trips. Uh, what happens to these guys? Their little marsupial friends on the road with increased braking speed. Are we going to have more deaths? of southern hairy-nosed wombats because of these electric vehicles throughout the winter season, with all the elites driving these heavier cars with longer braking distance? And what about all the extra rubber pollution off the tyres and all the extra uh, brake wear? What about that? Have, have all these people looked into this? And then, of course, then there's the cost of recycling. And who can remember Larry Marshall's famous words and estimates when he says, and I didn't ask this, he actually proffered this himself, was that it's going to cost three times the amount to recycle a battery than it is to actually for the materials that actually go into it. Right? Now, what's the chances of that actually ever being economical when the cost of recycling something is three times more than the cost of building it? I tell you, it is not going to happen. This bill will not only destroy the environment, it will destroy the economy and it will destroy our country. And It is just another step on the path to destruction because of this useless Albanese Labor government. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Macdonald. Much, Acting Deputy President. Look, the coalition will not support this bill, and it's not because of electric vehicles. It is about bad policy. Uh, this legislation, uh, the government has failed to do a number of things. It's failed to establish clear criteria and metrics of success for the policy. It has failed to ensure the expenditure is temporary, proportionate, and linked to tangible productivity gains. It has failed to quantify any benefit of the policy to electric vehicle uptake, to emissions reduction or to the budget bottom line. It has failed to tangibly address the biggest constraint on electric vehicle uptake, which is supply and infrastructure. And it has failed to consult with business and civil society on policy design. Uh, this is at odds with the new government promising sensible economic policy and fiscal, fiscal repair prior to the election. In fact, the Treasurer said on 28 June 2022 that the government must make hard decisions necessary for responsible budget repair, making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes. Every household has to make tough decisions about what they can and cannot afford, and it shouldn't be any different from their government. And finally, the Treasurer said, because the budget should be about high-quality investments in the right priorities. And throughout the bill, this government has revealed this to be nothing more than pre-election posturing. This is about a Greens deal to deliver for inner city and not about practical measures that would allow people in Australia who are struggling under affordable cost of living uh, issues, who are struggling to meet uh, basic cost of living measures, and yet this government is introducing a bill that is going to bake in, bake in costs to the budget for years and years to come. This is very serious. It is incredibly serious 
because the independent parliamentary budget office has said this bill will cost billions of dollars. That's with a B, not an M. Billions of dollars through the next decade, and yet the government cannot say what it will deliver for emissions reductions. They cannot say what it will deliver to the electric vehicle market. They cannot even say what criteria would make it a success. Now, demand for electric vehicles is already high. It's growing, and figures from the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries show sales of pure battery electric vehicles last month represented the highest market share ever recorded. This bill, of course, is not just about pure electric vehicles. It also covers hybrid vehicles and variations. Now, my daughter, who lives uh, in Brisbane and is able to commute uh, around the city, has a hybrid vehicle. It's very cheap to run. It's terrific news. But she pays registration. And when she uses diesel or, or fuel, she pays a fuel tax. But this, this bill removes the FBT payable on vehicles up to $84,916. It provides a subsidy for people to receive on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, but not to people who do not have the luxury of a short commute. It does not provide the same advantage to people living in northern Australia. This is a, a bill that is incredibly poorly, poorly conceived, poorly budgeted, and despite being referred to as tax reform by the Treasurer, the Senate inquiry suggests this bill is high cost, low impact and has been designed with no consultation with industry, government or civil society. A number of experts have raised serious questions about equity, financial stability and price pressures on the electric vehicle market, and Treasury and the Department of Climate Change's evidence shows the impact of this policy on emissions reduction has not been quantified. Third-party evidence suggests it is negligible. Uh, I, am, I am perplexed because daily we hear the Treasurer talk about the difficult financial situation he's in. He talks about the $50 billion budget increase, uh, the additional income thanks to commodity prices, which he has spent, and he is once again spending more money than he is collecting with this budget measure because it provides a subsidy on FBT taxes to some people but does not make that same subsidy available to every Australian. It does not take into account that they are subsidising vehicles, who, some of which will not pay fuel taxes. It does not take into account the impact on road maintenance and the collections that the Treasury relies on in order to uh, fund the cost of roads maintenance, of safety concerns for, uh, for Australians travelling in our big distances. Instead, it subsidises people into uh, very short um, travel uh, commute places. Now, this is crazy, crazy policy when we know that there is not enough infrastructure available yet to charge your vehicle. Imagine living in a, a, a high-rise building um, in Sydney, in Melbourne, where there is not enough shareable power points to allow these vehicles to be charged. We see uh, images every day of, of uh, extension leads draped out windows and onto the street to support vehicles uh, that may not be paying the electricity cost to their high-rise building body corporate. And yet the government is going to subsidise a vehicle, a market share of a vehicle that is growing in popularity. Be clear, this is not the opposition is not opposed to this bill because we have any problems with electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. It is because of poor infrastructure planning. 
It is because of poor budget planning. This is poor policy. And when Peter Shergold reviewed uh, the uh, government's ability to make good decisions, I am almost positive that this would be a shining example to him of poor government policy and decision making. No consultation. No consultation. The number one thing uh, that was identified by Mr Shergold. Poor budget outcomes. Clear criteria and measurements of success. Uh, ensure the expenditure was temporary, proportionate and linked to tangible productivity gains. Uh, I could go back and repeat the list that I started with at the beginning of this contribution, but I shan't because there is nothing in this bill and this policy making that gives me any confidence in this government's ability to manage the budget, to make good decisions and certainly not to support people who are not as advantaged as those who have short commutes, who live uh, within places that have hopefully some sort of infrastructure to charge their vehicles. It is a government that has no plan to replace uh, diesel fuel and fuel taxes, and instead we are going to subsidise the FBT benefit for people who are buying uh, electric vehicle and hybrid vehicles. When you hear the Institute of Public Accountants, not a group who is uh, usually known for hyperbole or, ex or exotic statements, has stated that this policy will have a negligible impact on reducing Australia's carbon emissions from the transport sector. It said the government's assertion that this initiative makes the take-up of electric vehicles more affordable is misleading and that private buyers and sole tra traders of electric vehicles cannot access these significant savings. It went on. The Institute of Public Accountants went on to say that there are other measures which would have a far greater short-term benefit to the environment than this measure. And finally, given the cost of electric vehicles, their limited supply and the lack of infrastructure, it seems the cost of this initiative is not warranted particularly given the small number of vehicles that is anticipated to take advantage of this initiative over the three-year exemption period. I, mean, I have a range of quotes. Uh, I've quoted the Institute of, of Public Accountants, uh, the tax group at the University of Melbourne Law School, Uniting Care, Treasury. Even Treasury is not able to articulate the long-term costs of this measure. Treasury agrees with the Parliamentary Budget Office that the cost of this measure will grow over time, stating in response to a question on notice, that the costs of the measure are expected to increase over time as the measure matures, including into the medium term, and that the Treasury costing is sensitive to the uptake of electric vehicles, and this is something which could vary. Uh, I'm truly appalled to be a part of a, a, a forming uh, a, a part of this Senate, uh, forming a, a government that is led by Labor, that is making such poor policy decisions that the only people who support it are the Greens. The only people who support it are people who want to encourage electric vehicle rollouts in the face of overwhelming evidence that this is not a necessary budget measure. It is not going to increase the uptake of electric vehicles, which is already a growing, mature market. It is not going to increase the infrastructure that's available to support these vehicles. And worse for me, as a representative of regional and northern Australia, it will not provide any advantage at all to the people who are doing it the toughest, the people who have the highest cost of electricity the people who have the highest cost of insurance, the people who have the highest cost of food. Because this government, this Labor Albanese government, in partnership with the Greens, is delivering for the most entitled, the most, uh, the most supported group in Australia. But they're not supporting poor Australia. 
They're not supporting working Australia, and they're certainly not supporting regional Australia. It's shocking, and we should be ashamed. We should be ashamed to sit and pass this piece of legislation, because it is not, it is not by any measure good policy. Peter Shergold would tell us that. Blind Freddie on the street would tell us that that this is not a measure that is suitable for the outcomes that this government says it's trying to achieve. Budget restraint, emissions reduction and supporting Australians who are struggling with the cost of living. Ashamed we should be, because we have the opportunity in this place, uh, the opportunity that I'm taking right now, to point out shortcomings in policy development. We have this opportunity. We have the opportunity to get a decision right on this particular bill. I would encourage those opposite, those members of the government, to pull this bill, to say we're going to go back and think about it. We're going to have another look at how we can deliver on all of our stated objectives. Budgetary measures, emission measures, consultation with industry. Uh, delivering for Australians who are under increasing cost of living pressures, the lack of infrastructure that's available to support these vehicles. For all these reasons, this poor public policy should be stopped immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Senator Cadell. Thank you. Deputy President, I love cars. As someone who came in here and started their first speech describing the last third of a lap of Mount Panorama, you might get that. Now, I love everything about them. I love driving them. I like owning them. I like spattering on them. I like working on them. Don't love cleaning them, but that's a downside. And yet I stand here against this bill. I can't make a great argument because I will benefit from this, from this bill. I have in my folder my order dated the 26th of the 8th, 2021, yet to de be delivered of my Tesla. Proud to get out there because I want to drive that car. I bought it because I want to own it. I bought it because I want to have a crack. And it's not just that. I spoke to Toyota last year about a Toyota Murai, the hydrogen car. Great car. James May loves it. I love it. I'm on a list. But I can't refuel it. Can get it. Can't refuel it. So, what does this bill mean for me? This means, on top of my tax-funded salary, you're going to give me another 30 grand to buy a car. I don't deserve it, but that's what this is. That's what this is. And what we're doing is we're playing races, but not with cars, with technologies. We're going back to the gaslight versus the electric light, the beta versus the, the VHS, and we're trying to pick winners early. If you look at different cars, as I said, the hydrogen car, the Murai. Last week, Volkswagen, oh, sorry, last month, Volkswagen, in uh, cooperation with Kraftwerk, which I thought was a 1980s German techno band, but is now an automotive organisation, have lodged patents for a different kind of hydrogen engine using plastic instead of, oh, sorry, ceramic instead of plastic. They can get 2,000 kilometres range out of a hydrogen car. You've got the Hyundai N74 Vision coming out, another uh, hydrogen car looking good out there. We're watching this space. We all saw James Hammond's crash of the Rimac, one of the leading edge electric cars that took two weeks to put out after it caught on fire because each cell kept on burning. On, on this side, we have said we're not anti-electric car, but this is a waste of money and taxpayers. People who have had a windfall game like me or have been lucky or worked hard in life don't need taxpayers' funds to buy these cars. I have a company. I can do this. If we're going to spend this money, let's build the infrastructure that Senator Macdonald was talking about of refuelling for these things, to give them range, to give country and regional people the chance to have access to these same things, but we're not. We're giving people who were likely to buy these cars, and we're backdating it. People have already done this. We're going to say to people who already have bought cars, please you know, have some more money for making a decision that you've already made. That's a great thing for them 
It's not good for the country. So we sit here looking at a bill that will fund people who don't need it to buy things they've already bought, and we are not out there funding the infrastructure, the other things, making it easier for people in their cost of living, making it easier for people to get through what they have to get through. You know, I, this car won't be paying tax, uh, road tax. It won't be paying all these. It has a, I think um, Senator uh, O'Sullivan mentioned we were working out the battery. It has a 100 kilowatt battery, so it weighs 666 kilograms. It will be chewing roads, but I won't be paying fuel tax. It will be, you know, a Toyota Murai doesn't pay fuel tax, but we don't have the fuel infrastructure. There was uh, some fueling in Canberra. There is nothing in Newcastle. There is nothing in the Hunter that we can't do that. And what is this for? I was in my office and I heard Senator Rennick talking about what's going to happen to the hairy nosed wombat in one of these things with the weight. But what we are, it's like those on the other side are in the spotlights of a land cruiser, like a, a wombat in the spotlights of a land cruiser coming down the highway. Oh, energy, electric car, hydrogen car, clean hut, pirate, we must support it. And that's not good policy. Just because it's got some clear words and click words and we can share it and we can Twitter, we can do a TikTok little energy dance, doesn't make it good policy. Giving money to people who don't need it for decisions they've already made is the definition of waste. So, as we go forward and we're looking at this progress of what these cars do, how they go, get these people into it. Over at uh, COP, I think COP27 has just been, but last year we went to COP26, we met with Telstra and we met with the Climate Change Committee of the UK, Te sorry, Tesla, and their point was not that we need to subsidise cars. The market people are buying as they see fit. What they were talking about is the infrastructure that can f uh, charge these cars, fuel these cars, prevent the road rage that's happening. That is the single determinant of people take up is how usable they are. And this does nothing to make it usable. It takes fu funds from the government that could be going in to do that and puts it into the pockets of those that don't need it. So, <laughs> that's, and that's a good point. When we're looking at, you know, we haven't even got coverage of mobile technology in the regions. We can't even get, how are we going to have charging stations out there for people? How are we going to incentivise that when it takes you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour, an hour to charge cars. If they can't get on their mobile phone in the bush, how are they going to charge a car? That is what we're not looking at here. It is great that electric car pickup in Australia is going well. I think hydrogen, if this new technology of VW and Kraftwerk picks up, that could be a great thing. Let's not rush to outcomes for a media grab. Let's watch the market work. Let's let the technology evolve and let's make choices that make sense. I will be voting against this bill and I, I think it's going to pass and I will thank you for the 20 to 30 grand you give me if you pass this bill, but it shouldn't be like that. That's not what we are elected. That's not an energy policy that will reduce any emission. You know, this is the weekender car, this is the hobby car, this is the spare car. In the regions, it's not the main car. And the people that buy it in the regions will be treating it as such. I heard another car nut on this side, Senator O'Sullivan, talking about the towing capability of vehicles. And we watched uh, an episode uh, where they tra towing a, a boat across the United States to the point where they, used to ha they had to put a diesel generator in the boat to charge the car at the hundred stops it made across America. These things will get there, but let's not rush. It's like going back with Senator Smith again, we're going back to the UK. We're talking about offshore wind. We're in this rush for offshore wind. Let's get this offshore wind because the UK can do it. UK has depths in the channel of about 40 metres. We have depths on the shelf of about 400 metres or more. Floating wind technology will come but it is not commercially viable yet. Let's not rush. Someone else spoke about the cost of green energy and what we're doing and how we do. Because let's face it, most of this fuel for energy cars that comes at the moment from coal. Now, I was working on a project, prices would have changed, so I 
not breaching any confidentiality since I was there, on a hydrogen project at the port of Newcastle. If I wanted at the time, if we wanted at the time, to have green hydrogen produced, it was $9 a kilo from renewable clean energy. That's the market telling us that. If I wanted grey hydrogen, it was $2.90 to $3.30. It's not miracle land where we're having these unicorns fly around and have wonderful times in cloud cuckoo land where we can say something's cheaper, something's cheaper, when you have to buy it at the moment it is not. But we're rushing towards a goal without looking at the consequences. So even though this bill will benefit me, who is in this place, taking taxpayers' funds, earning a good wage, it should not be supported. I am the demonstration of why this bill is wrong and why we should not be supporting it. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Senator Canavan. President, uh, uh, and uh, this bill, we've got this um, you know, modern trend where we put in brackets the uh, sort of attributes of a bill, uh, uh, the, 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 the talking points, if you like, or the, the government's propaganda in a bill. This one's called the Treasury Laws Amendment, and in the brackets, electric car discount bill. I think you know, sometimes there'd be more accurate uh, par parenthetical descriptions of bills. And this one really should have, instead of electric car discount, it should have tax cuts for the rich uh, in the brackets. That's really what this bill is all about. Uh, nothing that the government has provided to this bill or Senate inquiry uh, provides any evidence that this bill will, will lower greenhouse gas emissions. None at all. No evidence at all. And I'll come to why uh, they haven't been able to provide uh, that evidence. Uh, as uh, Senator Cadell has outlined, uh, this bill will make it harder to fund our road uh, network in the decades uh, to come. And uh, by God, do we need uh, investment in our roads? Of uh, the last sitting period, driven down from Rockhampton uh, through uh, Senator Cadell's patch and the Hunter, went down the New England Highway to get here, and then had to drive all the way back. And uh, we need a lot of investment uh, in our, especially rural roads. This bill will make that harder. And as I say, primarily the primary benefits of this bill, the primary effects of it, will be to provide a massive big tax cut uh, to people on, on very high incomes without any real evidence that it's actually going to generate much. I think it's important to go through the figures here to, to, to let people know exactly what we're talking about, what size of tax cut uh, we are talking about to people who are of very good means. Uh, uh, if you go to the Australian Taxation Office website, they've got a fringe benefit tax calculator, and this bill effectively exempts purchases of electric cars from fringe benefit tax. Uh, so when you go and use that calculator, if you bought an electric car worth $50,000, that's a pretty cheap electric car. They start at about $40,000. Most of them would set you back uh, 60, 70, sometimes even more thousand dollars. But let's, let's be generous to the government and say a $50,000 uh, uh, electric car. That would provide an a annual fringe benefit of $9,972.60. That will come off, that will be deducted from your uh, taxable income under this bill. Uh, you don't get all that saving, that's what your, your taxable income will fall by. So then the benefit to you depends on your marginal tax rate. And of course, the more money you earn, the higher your marginal tax rate is, the greater that. Uh, that uh, exemption from fringe benefit will be to you. So if you're on $200,000 a year, that's a very, very good wage. Uh, not uncommon. There's, uh, we're all on about that amount of money here in this place. This will be a very good bill for politicians, uh, I should say, for those listening out there. Uh, uh, politicians will do very, very well at this bill. But if you're on $200,000 a year, as I say, that's a well above average wage, about double the average wage, full-time wage in Australia, you will you'll be on a 50 per cent marginal rate, roughly. So that 9,900 uh, deduction will actually help you out $5,000 a year. You'll be $5,000 a year better off thanks to a Labor government. So a rich person in this country, the Labor Party, is giving someone on that sort of money a $5,000 free kick a year. A year. Uh, amazing. If you're, on, if, you're on, if you're on the lowest tax bracket, if you're only earning 50 grand a year, out there, and, and well, not the lowest tax bracket, but the, the lower one um, above which you don't pay, to, above which you pay tax, your benefit will just be a thousand dollars a year. And and we hear lectures often from the Labor Party about how they try and represent the poor, and they accuse us of giving tax cuts 
uh, to the rich, of cutting services to the poor. And here we have a bill, one of the very first bills that this Labor government has introduced, which is all about giving massive tax cuts to the rich. Because you have to wonder how many extra electric cars will be bought thanks to this bill. We don't know. There's no evidence being provided by Treasury or the government uh, from this committee. I know people. I know people, some friends of mine, who do very, very well and very, very good wages. They are rubbing their hands, rubbing their hands with glee because they're going to get these multiple thousand dollars of tax deductions when they've already bought Teslas. Keep in mind this, this bill is backdated to July the 1st this year. So, so anyone who's bought, bought a Tesla in the last few months and they bought them regardless, they bought them even if they didn't know they were going to get the deduction. They just get a free kick. <laughs> they just get. Here you go. Thank you for electing a Labor government. Here's five thousand bucks a year to a rich person. That's that's a year over, over over the life of the car. It'll be it'll be tens of thousands of dollars. As Senator Rennick has pointed out, uh, this is this is a this bill. If nothing else, it'll go through this place because they've got partners in the Greens here, who's all who's average, the average income of Green voters is way higher than any other political party in this in this place. So they they have that constituency. They have an excuse, the Greens. Their voters are on $200,000 a year quite often. So, you know, we know they've got to look after their voters. The Labor Party, they, their voters are still about the average income. But I don't think many of them realise yet. They're going to find out. They're going to find out, especially in this term of government, that the Labor Party aren't really for the working class anymore. They are for the rich and well, 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 well educated, tertiary educated, professional classes in this country. Good luck to those people. So a lot of my friends are those people. But the Labor Party are out for to protect their interests, not the working class of this country, who cannot afford to buy a, even a $50,000 Tesla. Uh, oh, I don't think you get Teslas for that price, but a $50,000 electric car, let alone a $60,000, or $80,000 electric car. That's just beyond those people who are struggling right now uh, with higher living costs. They will get no benefit uh, from this particular bill. Now, as I foreshadowed earlier too, on top of all of that, on top of the regressive nature of this bill, it's not even clear that this bill will lower carbon emissions at all. As I mentioned, there's been no evidence provided by the government that this will actually encourage additional electric vehicles to be purchased. And, and actually, there are very large questions about how much electric cars themselves uh, will lower carbon emissions. Because the, problem, the basic problem here is that the manufacture of electric vehicles is extremely uh, energy intensive. And by being energy intensive, it's therefore carbon emissions intensive. In fact, a recent study by Volvo uh, said they, they, they did a study on one of their vehicles, one of, a Volvo vehicle, and on, on their XC40 vehicle, or the equivalent of the XC40 for, uh, for their electric uh, fleet, uh, that car uh, actually uh, needed or, or created. 70 per cent more carbon emissions in its manufacture than a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle. So you had, you, you, when, when they come off the lot, when a car comes off the lot, the, the internal combustion engine vehicle, the ICE as they call it, the ICE vehicle, it has 70 per cent lower emissions. I should put it the other way around. The, the electric car, sorry, has 70 per cent higher emissions when it comes off the lot uh, than the internal combustion engine car. So there's higher emissions. So from day one, the next few years in this bill, there is no doubt this bill will actually increase, if it does have additional electric cars to be purchased, it will actually increase carbon emissions if it, if it encourages the production of more electric cars, at least in the first few years of the bill's effect. Now, now of, course, of course, electric cars uh, don't use uh, 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 petrol and therefore potentially have lower carbon emissions in their use, but of course they do need electricity. Uh, to, to, to be charged. And so what is, it, what is crucial uh, to the carbon emissions calculation is what types of electricity do electric cars use uh, to charge. And this Volvo report had some very good analysis of that, showing that, that if, you had, if, you had, if the electricity you source for your electric vehicle uh, comes from uh, the global average, if you like, of different fuel types, and coal accounts for about 40 per cent, of, uh, of, uh, of electricity, gas about 15 odd, so you're, you're looking at close to half you're probably electricity coming from fossil fuels. Um, if, if, um, if that was your electricity grid that you were charging your car from, you'd have to drive the car 110,000 kilometres before it became carbon neutral, before it actually just, just it gave the same amount as the internal combustion engine. Not, not better, not better than the internal combustion engine, it just it would just break even with the internal combustion engine after you've driven it 110,000 
kilometres. Now, the average Australian drives 13,300 kilometres a year. So the average Australian would need to drive the car for eight years, <laughs> eight years, before this, where they provide even break even, not any savings, just break even. So this bill, the, the Labor Party has come to a government saying they're going to reduce carbon emissions by 43 per cent by 2030. By my math, that's in how many years? Eight years. <laughs> that's in eight years' time. So this bill will actually, it'll actually increase carbon emissions from now, at least global emissions. These cars will be built overseas, of course, but global emissions will increase over the next eight years, thanks to this bill, because they, all, these, all these cars, all these electric cars, will be carbon positive for the first eight years, on average, of their lives. Uh, so why are we doing this? What is the point of this? And I should say, I should add as a bit of a footnote to this, that that analysis is based on, as I said, the global uh, fuel electricity mix. In fact, Australia has a more carbon intensive electricity system than the globe. Uh, we get about 60 per cent of our electricity from coal and another 20 odd per cent from gas. So, so the, the, this, this particular break-even analysis, I, I can't and don't have access to the modelling to do my own figures on this, but you'd actually have to drive for longer. So I'm being generous to the government here. It would probably be 10, maybe 12 years of driving here in Australia before, before you got to carbon neutrality. Uh, I mean, really, really, you have to wonder what is all this about? Why, why you know, if, if we are serious about reducing carbon emissions, why are we spending so much money on, on cars that are much more carbon intensive. Uh, you've got to want to, you've got to come back to the money. That's what this is about. It's about the money. It's about giving people a tax break to buy a new car that can afford it. Good luck to them. They, well, I don't know if it's ideology, Jared, 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 Senator Reddick. I think it's just, it just comes down to money. It's just people want, want to be, have a subsidised vehicle. Good luck to them, but we've got to, we're approaching a trillion dollars in debt. We've got to get our house in order. And we're coming out of the coronavirus period. I don't think we have the money to provide very, very rich people in this country a subsidy for a new car. I don't think that should be the fundamental priority of this nation. And look, uh, and I did want to come back as well to Senator Cadell's excellent point about the fact that, that electric vehicles already are, in a sense, subsidised or, or, or at least uh, get favoured treatment in our overall tax system because. Uh, electric cars are not subject to any kind of fuel excise. Uh, now we don't hypothecate that, that fuel excise, but the, the, the almost 40 cents I think now that, that is on your petrol when you go and buy diesel or petrol to fill up your car, about 40 cents of that comes back to Canberra here. As I say, that doesn't directly go back to roads, but the basic system is that we we put that money on on uh, we put that tax on fuel so that we can have some funds. Uh, to invest back in these, these roads, the rural roads especially, that, that aren't doing so well. And we do spend about the, the amount of money that's raised from registration at the state level, uh, car registration and fuel excise, about that is about the money we spend on roads every year. Uh, that, of course, if, once electric cars continue uh, to, be, to be in demand, that revenue source will dry up. We won't get that fuel excise anymore. So there's a real question here about how, how we fund our roads. And, of course, those people buying electric cars already get that benefit. They already get that now. They don't have to pay uh, fuel excise to drive and run their car. Now, it's an open question how we will uh, tackle this issue going forward, but there actually already is an inbuilt subsidy to electric cars right now, and this bill just perpetuates that subsidy, and not in ways that seem to uh, progress any particular uh, public good. Now, uh, now I, I think uh, uh, we, we, we also hear need to understand the, how these electric cars are made. Uh, I said before that they're, they're very carbon intensive, but the other issue here uh, is that the, the minerals uh, and techniques that are used to create batteries have potentially other environmental downsides as well. And it's something that goes completely unremarked, especially by the renewable energy industry. But the production of cobalt, of nickel, of lithium in some countries uh, can be extremely environmentally hazardous. There are ways of doing this properly, uh, and I would argue our mining industry in this country does generally do things properly, uh, but that comes at a certain cost. And, and the production right now, especially of, of, uh, of uh, minerals like cobalt, uh, is done largely in developing countries, co and cobalt's cost largely in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there are terrible labour standards and, and also uh, shocking environmental outcomes. The reason for this is those minerals that go into batteries, unlike fossil fuels like petrol or like oil, sorry, gas, uh, coal, uh, those minerals aren't uh, 
easily obtained in the natural environment. Coal, oil, gas, generally speaking, are contained in large deposits and are quite easily extracted without having to do too much to them. Maybe a bit of washing with water in the case of coal. In, in the case of these other hard rock minerals like nickel uh, and cobalt, you have to engage in serious use of chemicals uh, to extract the somewhat uh, rare ores uh, of copper, say, within the overall rock that you've mined. A huge amount of waste, huge amount of energy, and yes, a huge amount of use of, of chemicals. As I say, if you do that properly, if you do that properly, you can protect the environment, but it's costly and it takes significant regulation. However, in countries like Congo, you don't have those regulations, and you have terrible environmental pollution of rivers and environmental wastelands, and this bill does nothing. We don't set any standards. When we're doing this, why don't we set standards? Why don't we say we'll subsidise only cars that have ethical standards for the, the source of cobalt or nickel? Again, it comes back to the money. That's what this is about. We won't set those standards because that would interrupt the money flows that are being made by people in the renewable energy industry, by the Greens and their voters, and of course the rich people get a massive big tax cut thanks to this so-called Labor bill. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, and I would like to begin by thanking uh, senators who have contributed to the debate. The bill implements the government's election commitments to provide a fringe benefits tax exemption for employer-provided eligible electric cars. The bill amends the Fringe Benefits Tax Assessment Act 1986 to exempt from fringe benefits tax the use or availability of eligible electric cars made available by employers to employees from 1 July 2022. The Senate Economics Legislation Committee has considered and reported on the bill. We thank the committee for its work and we also acknowledge and thank the individuals and organisations who provided submissions through that and the public hearings. Overwhelmingly, there was support for the measures. However, some thought it could go further and raised issues such as fuel efficiency standards and the need for a comprehensive national electric vehicle strategy. The government is putting in place the next steps to establish Australia's first national electric vehicle strategy. At the heart of the strategy will be a plan to improve uptake of electric vehicles and further improve affordability and choice by growing the Australian electric vehicle market. The government welcomes um, the committee's recommendation that the bill be passed. The Australian Greens support a, a fringe benefits exemption for electric cars but are re recommending that a plug-in hybrid vehicles be excluded on the basis that such vehicles are not zero emissions vehicles. While the government appreciates this view, it also recognises our current low take-up of any electric vehicles and the important role that plug-in hybrids can play in facilitating Australia's transition to zero emissions vehicles, particularly in rural and regional areas. The Greens have also recommended the inclusion of personal electric uh, vehicle charging infrastructure. The government is looking at more direct support for EV charging through our Powering Australia plan, and the Minister for Climate Change and Energy recently announced funding for a street-side EV charger trial. Uh, we acknowledge that the opposition provided a dissenting report recommending that the bill not be supported and that the funds be redeployed to other methods of increasing EV uptake, including infrastructure. The government is supporting EV uh, infrastructure through the Powering Australia plan and exploring further options to increase electric vehicle uptake through the National Electric Vehicle Strategy. The amendments contained in this bill will incentivise uh, greater electric car uptake in Australia and contribute to reducing our emissions. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. We have a number of uh, second reading amendments. So I'll deal with the first one, uh, as moved by Senator Dean Smith on sheet 1683. So the question is uh, that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I believe the noes have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells.
Second reading. Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Dean Smith to the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill of 2022, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 23 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. And I believe Senator Rennick uh, is moving a second reading amendment. Senator Rennick. Yeah. Hi. I'd like to move a second reading amendment circulated in my name. Thank you. I'm assuming that has been circulated in the chamber. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Rennick to the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill of 2022 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, the noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Rennick, Rennick to the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. Order. The noes for the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 24 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is, I'll just give uh, senators a chance to sit down. So the question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Is there a committee stage required? I believe there is. Um, I'll just ask if the deputy president can take the chair. I'm just going to ask for the bill to be read a second time. Change benefits tax assessment act 1986 to exempt benefits relating to cars that are zero or low emissions vehicles and for other purposes.
Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill standard is printed. Minister D oh. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. Um, yes, look, there are two amendments that uh, um, we are going to be debating tonight, both of which have been put forward by the Greens and by Senator David Pocock. Um, I'm going to be moving the first one, um, which is item one on sheet 1746 revised, which is an amendment to review the operations of how successful this measure is actually going to be at um, increasing the use of electric vehicles. We've had a lot of debate um, during the debate of this bill about the eff effectiveness and whether this is the appropriate measure to be and the most effective measure to be um, increasing the use of electric vehicles. As I said in my second reading contribution, the Greens are supporting this bill. It's a small step forward. We actually think there are some very much more significant measures that need to be taken to really kickstart the use of electric vehicles, but that this is an important measure. And it's an important measure to be getting electric vehicles into fleets, and it's an important measure to then be able to have electric vehicles flowing through as second-hand vehicles. Um, so, but we thought very appropriate, given there are a whole raft of different ways that we could be um, supporting the use of electric vehicles. We actually think getting decent fuel efficiency standards and carbon dioxide standards is probably the most important thing to do, and we are hoping that the government will introduce something along those lines. But in the meantime, we, need to, we thought that it was appropriate to have a review in place to determine whether this is being effective. So, basically, that review would occur after, th after three years from the commencement, and it would include consideration of whether the, the operation of all, some or all of these provisions should continue and what types of vehicles should be covered by the provisions. Of course, what types of vehicle goes to the point as to sort of whether um, the issue of zero emission vehicles versus low emission vehicles, which is what the other amendment um, that Senator Pocock is going to be moving is going to go to, and that's that um, th that amendment would phase out after three years the, um, the, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles being eligible for this discount. But we think that after three years it would be very appropriate to do that review um, to make sure that this measure is being effective. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, the Coalition will be supporting the amendment that has been proposed by Senators Green and David Pocock. Uh, given the substantial cost of the measure to the budget over the medium term, it is essential that this proposal be rigorously, rigorous, rigorously reviewed. During the Senate inquiry into the legislation, the government could not outline any criteria that the policy's success or failure would be measured against. Given the alarming lack of policy analysis underpinning the legislation, it's important that it be subject to thorough and wide-ranging review. While the coalition opposes the broader bill, we will support amendments to ensure that, if it does pass, appropriate safeguards are placed around the substantial costs of this measure. Minister. Uh, thank you. The um, government will be supporting the, this amendment. It was our intention to review the legislation at about the three-year uh, mark anyway, and so this simply puts that into the legislation, and we're happy to agree with it. Are there any other contributions on this amendment? Because, because it's my intention to put the question. I put the question that the amendment be agreed to, as moved by the Australian Greens and mm -hmm. Senator Pocock on sheet 1746 as revised. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. We now come to the second amendment. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I, I seek leave to move amendment numbers one and two on sheet 1745 revised together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move you, the amendments. You have the call. I welcome this bill and the function it serves to create a second-hand uh, EV market in Australia. This is much needed. Most Australians are currently priced out of the EV market, and incentivising EVs in this way for fleets will have flow-on effects uh, to create that affordable EV market, uh, which will allow 
a number of people to get in and unlock the cost savings that electric vehicles provide, both in terms of not having to fill them up with um, petrol at the, at the servo, uh, but also reduce maintenance costs. While it's a great thing to incentivise EVs in this way, uh, there is a concern with plug-in hybrid vehicles over the long term. The reality is that uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in fleets uh, are not um, often plugged in and end up being used on the engine, which is a smaller engine with, as has been pointed out many times, a, a heavier vehicle, uh, drastically increasing the amount of fuel that it uses. This amendment will li limit the problems with um, plug-in hybrids and have a uh, sunset clause which provides certainty for uh, fleets and people who are, who are looking to get their, their vehicle, uh, but ensures that we are moving to the uh, the more, more efficient, uh, newer technology of battery electric vehicles. Uh, I thank the government and the Greens for the way um, that uh, they've approached this issue and to reach this, this outcome. Senator Rice. Thank you. So I also want to speak in support of this amendment. Um, obviously, the whole aim of this legislation is to be reducing the emissions from our vehicles and to be shifting to zero carbon vehicles, which, as I said in my second reading speech, is what we need to be doing so that our carbon pollution from transport can be reduced as much as it can be um, in as quick a time as possible. By including plug-in electric vehicles in this um, scheme, it was just going to be continuing and not just continuing, subsidising um, vehicles which are, going to, which are ongoing having substantial use of fossil fuels. There was a report that's just been done this year on, by the International Council on Clean Transportation that shows that the use of um, petrol or diesel in plug-in hybrids is actually much greater than what the manufacturers claim, and that rather than a claimed fuel consumption of around 1.6 litres per 100 kilometres, the real world experience across Europe was that as these cars are being driven, they're actually um, being driven on their petrol motor a lot more and ending up with fuel consumption of around 4 litres per 100, per 100 kilometres. So, in fact, are a fossil fuel vehicle and certainly are not deserving of subsidies. And essentially, if we included plug-in hybrids in this legislation, it would be just yet another ongoing subsidy for fossil fuels, which is the last thing we need when we need to be doing everything we can to be tackling our climate crisis. So, um, we coming to the position of phasing out plug-in hybrid um, vehicles out of this scheme over three years, we thought was a reasonable compromise. Clearly, we do have an issue at the moment of a lack of supply of electric vehicles, and it's because the previous government was so recalcitrant, did nothing to encourage the uptake of electric vehicles, that the vehicle manufacturers just have said, why would we bring electric vehicles to Australia? It just has not been a good market for them. And so we know that for anybody wanting to buy an electric vehicle new at the moment, the wait time is, is you know, six to 12 months. Um, and so we do have an issue with supply. So at least by, by allowing plug-in hybrids to be included in the scheme to encourage their uptake for the next three years, at least they in general are lower emissions, but it's not something you'd want to continue for any longer than that three years. Because we really need to be shifting to zero carbon vehicles as quickly as possible. We know that the world is facing climate catastrophe. We know that we have to reduce our carbon pollution by at least 75 per cent by 2030. Um, otherwise, you know, the consequences are pretty extremely dire. And if we think we've got problems with floods, if we think we've got problems with fires at the moment, you look, and that's only after you know, just over one degree of global warming. We are headed for three degrees of global warming. We need to be reducing our carbon emissions absolutely drastically as quickly as possible. So as soon as possible, we need to be shifting to getting a zero carbon fleet. And we know that you know, cars that are purchased today have got a lifetime of 10, 15, 20 years. 
So it is important to be getting the, all the support for 100 per cent completely renewable, completely zero carbon vehicles as soon as possible and not prolonging the use of fossil fuel vehicles in any way um, for any longer or at, at all for any longer than is necessary. Uh, Senator Smith, and then I'll go to Senator Cadell, and then I'll come to the Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Coalition will not be supporting the amendment proposed by Senators David Pocock and Senator Rice. Hybrids play an important role in bridging the gap between internal combustion engine vehicles and electric vehicles. They are more affordable, have wider range and produce lower emissions than conventional internal combustion uh, engine vehicles. Importantly, they are also very popular choices with consumers. There is substantial stakeholder support for retaining hybrids in the bill in the event that it does pass. Senator, I'll go to Senator Cadell because I gave him the call. I'll give the option to the minister after that. But Senator O'Sullivan, I've, se I've seen that you want the call. So, Senator Cadell. Question to the minister on this um, effective date. This is backdated to 1 July for transaction on this. Just want to know: is that order dates, invoice dates, or registration dates? Getting some Minister. advice on that, if people can provide that. Um, but you're right; it is backdated to that date. Um, and in terms of, I should just flag here that we will be supporting the amendment that's before um, the chair in relation to um, the phase out. I think it is the uh, hybrid uh, plug-in hybrid um, by. Oh, sorry, I've lost my bit of paper I was looking for. Well, we support the amendment. Um, thank you. And I might have an answer. First held and used, 1st of July 2022. Uh, Senator Sullivan gets the call, and then Senator Smith, I'll give you the call. Senator Sullivan? Oh, Senator Smith. Minister, can you detail for the Senate uh, what is the expected uptake of this initiative over the next three financial years in terms of number of vehicles? Um, I'm just looking through my. I'm going to be assisted by my advisers at this time of. The night and week. Can someone just tell me? Mm. Yeah. I think um, Senator Smith, were you on the committee that looked into this? Okay. Yes. Well, I think you were advised, or the information provided to that committee was that there hadn't, there wasn't an overall figure that could be provided, but that um, reducing um, the cost of electric vehicles uh, in the way that this and the charges on them would increase the overall um, number of electric vehicles on the road. It is an incentive, essentially, to increase the number of electric vehicles. Senator Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to the amendment, uh, I'm just wondering, given that the top-selling vehicles are Hilux, Toyota Hilux, Ford Ranger, uh, the um, uh, Isuzu D-Max, you know, these are the dual-cab utes, uh, as well as uh, I think it's the in the top four is the, um, the RAV4, Toyota RAV4. Um, uh, has the government received any advice that there will be uh, pure electric vehicles available in that class of vehicle in the next three years that could be, uh, yeah, in, the, in the following years after that, would be actually be able to be purchased? Has the government sought any advice from manufacturers as to whether or not those vehicles will be available? Uh, my understanding is that they do have some. Uh, uh, hybrids uh, earmarked, but they're still some years away. So, uh, what what advice have you received as to whether or not they'll actually be uh, those vehicles? Given that that's what uh, Australians are choosing to buy right now. I think 
The, um, the best answer I can provide you there is that the government will continue to talk with manufacturers. Um, I think what you're seeing around the world is where there are um, you know, supportive arrangements in legislation or regulation that manufacturers respond to that. And we are seeing um, you know, the effort in terms of manufacturing output going into the design and delivery of electric vehicles over uh, standard petrol vehicles. That's just the reality of what's happening. I mean, that's where the R&D is going. It's where the manufacturing effort is going. So, uh, I think part of what we're doing with this legislation is sending a message that there is a government that's supportive of electric vehicles and the development of electric vehicles. Um, and uh, certainly, from the bit I'm responsible for in the APS is ensuring that we're purchasing electric vehicles so that we can actually start and generate the second-hand car market as well, which is really important. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, yes, just in relation to the Commonwealth fleet, uh, just wanting to understand uh, um, what, the, what the government's intending to do, in, in particular with regards to the private plated vehicles that, uh, that parliamentarians uh, will be driving. I'll come back to you on whether there's anything I can provide about um, essentially the, pro the vehicles you get for being a parliamentarian. Is, yeah. is, is that what you're talking about? Um, because I know there are MPs with electric vehicles and there are MPs and senators with hybrids as well. Um, you only have to look in the car park in the basement to see that. Um, uh, in terms of um, Comcar, uh, we would be wanting to move towards electric vehicles through that and certainly through the APS through our fleet uh, where we are able to to replace uh, with electric vehicles obviously there will be some vehicles including in you know special purpose vehicles and um, you know in defense for example where that is not possible so we'll take a sensible and responsible approach uh, but we do want to generate um, uh, an affordable second-hand car market as well, and we're a big purchaser of vehicles, and it's it's, it's responsible and um, shows a bit of leadership for the government in doing that. Senator Smith, can the minister uh, reconfirm for the Senate what is the total cost of this measure over the Ford estimates? Um, FBT exemption, as amended, is expected to decrease or cost $195 million over the four years, over the Ford estimates. Senator Smith. And just to reconfirm that the government is not able to detail for the Senate what is the actual number of electric, extra electric vehicles that will be on the road for each of the years over the Ford estimates as a result of this $195 million initiative. Minister. Well, I think it would be very, very difficult to predict, um, uh, to be honest. But uh, what we can say is we are we are putting these arrangements in place to incentivise the uptake and remove a disincentive to purchase electric cars over other sta more standard vehicles. Senator Smith, has the government been able to um, uh, model what the expected uh, reduction in emissions will be as a result of this $195 million initiative. Well, we see it as a component of supporting our progress to our 43 um, per cent emissions reduction target. We know that transport emissions are Something that we have to reduce, and so you know, having an electric national electric vehicle strategy, incentivising the purchase of electric vehicles, looking, making sure we're putting in the infrastructure to support those um, vehicles, uh, is uh, a clear commitment we've made through our net zero and our emissions reductions target. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, recent research shows that after price, uh, the second major barrier to adoption of EVs is a lack of charging infrastructure and range anxiety. Uh, I understand that the government has committed to building uh, more charging infrastructure. Uh, could the minister uh, detail that commitment and how this bill supports an increase in charging infrastructure? Minister. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, the bill itself um, doesn't do this, um, but since coming to government, we have doubled the Commonwealth's investment in electric vehicle charging and re refuelling infrastructure and fleets, and the new Driving the Nation Fund will provide $275.4 million over six years from 2022-23 to help meet some of these costs. Um, the fund will support electric vehicle charges across Australia. It will also support electric fleets and vehicles to grid technology. Um, initial investments under the fund will be $39.8 million over four, for four years for a national EV charging network to be delivered by the NRMA and $89.5 million over four years for a national expansion of hydrogen highways. The remaining, the remaining of the fund will be delivered by ARENA, but initial investments are expected to target charging infrastructure for regional and remote areas and household managed charging. Senator Smith, does the then government, I'll go Senator, then I'll, Senator Smith, does Senator the government, Rice and then Senator Pocock. Sorry, thank you, you Chair. Wish. Does the government um, believe that supply chain issues are currently constraining the availability of electric vehicles in the Australian market? Minister. I think supply chain issues are affecting the availability of a lot of things, um, of cars in general, uh, but yes, they would be having an impact on electric vehicles. Anyone who's trying to purchase a new car at the moment or even a used car and the price of used car would realise that the, the car um, industry is being a significantly affected by supply chain issues. Given that supply chain issues exist in the market, isn't this the wrong time to be increasing demand because that would put upward pressure on prices? No. Uh, Senator Rice, it's the last question, but we're going to have to report, I'm going to have to report progress yeah. in a moment. I just wanted the minister to also um, respond to it. C connected with this bill was the commitment, I understand, the commitment of the government to have procurement of Commonwealth vehicles to be 100% um, electric, um, except in exceptional circumstances. Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Um, yes, that is the intention under the um, APS Net Zero strategy. Um, our fleet is an important part of that. It won't be for all of the vehicles. Uh, as, as I think we've made clear, there are some vehicles where that's not possible. But yes, the government sees its role as being a leader in purchasing vehicles uh, electric vehicles, particularly not only um, to reduce our own emissions and um, transport emissions being um, something that we all want to reduce, but also in generate because of the turnover of our vehicles that we are generating a second-hand electric vehicle market in this country. Uh, Senator, so, uh, my apologies, Senator Pocock. The appointed hour has come, uh, and I no longer have authority of the Senate to continue this committee stage. Uh, so it being 7.30 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. Honourable Senators, the committee reports progress. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Friday the 25th of November at 9 a.m.